In this program, I shall be introducing one of the most controversial of all subjects. Astrotheology is the parent subject of common astronomy and astrology, and is an archive of knowledge which dates back many millennia. The term astrotheology means the religion of the stars. Throughout history, the esoteric study of the movement of celestial bodies and their relationship to consciousness has also been known as astromancy, sidereism, Sabianism, and uranography. All high civilizations became high by being founded on the gnosis, which literally descended from heaven to earth, from the celestial to the terrestrial spheres. This transmission was likened by the ancients to a marriage between the sky goddess and her consort, the earth. The reason why you may not have previously heard of this fascinating subject has largely to do with the fact that astrotheology, when studied deeply, serves to uncover the dark origins of religion, politics, and big business. Those at the helms of these leviathans are not in the habit of allowing the ordinary member of the underclass to become privy to their machinations of control. Astrotheology is not commonly known because the power brokers know full well the consequences to their hegemony should the ordinary, intelligent, and well-meaning individual be made privy to the apparatus of mind and libido control, which works relentlessly to maintain groupthink, conformity, apathy, and ignorance. Their infernal machinery never sleeps, and therefore neither must its investigators. Those on the trail of this beast of deceit and despoilation cannot afford to neglect their charge, their solemn duty to bring forth true enlightenment to the people of the earth, their quest to give humanity its overdue rebirth. Humanity, as it stands now, is a compelling word rather than a reality. Regrettably, we have to be realists and understand that humanity is, as yet, nothing more than a concept, a word in a dictionary, a mere fine-sounding sociological term. It has the word human in it. But are our actions truly human in this world at this time? As we proceed with this program, I'm going to establish the controversial fact that the scriptures of all major religions, together with their pantheons, practices, customs, rituals, and rhetoric, are based on and are replications of astro-theological leitmotifs. The very existence and magnitude of both the minor and major cultures and religions lies in their penchant of their leaders to download, in modern parlance, data from the heavens. It is star lore which leads to the majority of the idioms, customs, and superstitions around us. It is star lore which inspired the composers of the great legends and fairy tales, and which inspires the modern-day filmmakers and writers, in the sci-fi genre particularly. Like the gods after which they are named, the celestial bodies have never ceased whispering and singing to mankind, in inspiring and transmitting their ethereal light and sublime wisdom. Though the mysterious ordinances of the heavens have been the template for every major civilization, no culture on earth is more firmly founded on the gospel of the stars than Christianity. The foundation of this religion is the Bible, a tome which can be regarded either as the greatest story ever told or the most abstract book of philosophy ever written. It can be taken either as a masterpiece of revelation or as a travesty of deception. It has been regarded as a biography a book of fanciful poesy, austere ethics as a manual for moral rectitude, a great history of great peoples, and even as a science fiction classic. Every practicing Christian owns at least one, every skeptic probably has one also, and every critic has a well-thumbed one somewhere within reach. Pseudo-evangelical salesmen will deliver collector editions to your door, and you probably will never visit a hotel or a motel which does not have one within easy reach. It has been and continues to be blessed, kissed, and sworn upon, and is, usually on a Sunday, proudly and reverently carried and or driven to the local church service. It has ridden in the glove compartments of limousines and jalopies, on the ships which founded the New World, and on board those which traveled to the moon. It has been quoted by everyone anyone can think of, by saints and serial killers and written and rewritten by kings, popes, and paupers alike. But though this book, which once was the only book that most families would ever have possessed or read, is so widely available and cherished, 
it remains one of the most inexplicable tomes in mankind's long history and few there are or have been who can accurately unravel its secrets or coherently explain what its contents are really meant to be about. The Bible's secrets have been preserved because our perception of its meaning has too often been compromised by our emotional proximity and attitude. Emotionally speaking, we are often standing either too close or too far off for a true unbiased perspective. The Bible's history and aura, so to speak, travel before it and it does not come into a hand which will not tremble slightly with some emotion, be it of awe, veneration or contempt. The great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche wrote that if we think that the stars are merely something above the head, we will lack the eye of knowledge and never know wisdom. The Athenian philosopher Plato wrote, astronomy compels the soul to look upwards and leads us from this world to another. And elsewhere he wrote, perhaps there is a pattern set up in the heavens for one who desires to see it, and having seen it, to find one in himself. Throughout the ages prior to the Industrial Revolution, there was hardly a scholar in any field who was oblivious to the mystique of the heavens and the gospel of the stars. Moreover, it is not from the days of Pythagoras, Pacioli, Fibonacci, Paracelsus, Agrippa and Avicenna, nor from those of Newton, Copernicus, Einstein and Heisenberg that the truth of the connection between consciousness and matter comes. Thousands upon thousands of years before the ravings of Descartes and Hobbes and before the unsustainable fallacies of Darwin and Pavlov, there were sublime cosmologies and theologies and philosophies and social ethics. Though we have focused the limelight of history mostly on those sages who provided mechanistic and pragmatic postulations and theorems, the time has come in our age to make a deeper exploration of the shadowy wings of the historical stage and to call forth into the limelight those whose wisdom dwarfs that of the fashionable and reason-friendly Keplers, Galileos and Newtons, etc. Those are the ones who stand commonly accoladed, but for every actor taking bows at center stage there stands another in the shadow whose name is either less known or all but forgotten. For every Hegel there's a Soren Kierkegaard. For every Kepler, a Tycho de Brahe. For every Fibonacci, there's a Pythagoras. And for every Reynolds, a William Blake. For every Einstein, there's a Wilhelm Reich. And for every Edison, there's a Nikola Tesla. The latter named may be relatively unknown to the public, their works ignored and their graves untended. Nevertheless, their spirits remain luminous and continue to ignite the flame of inspiration and imagination for those not content to remain within the prisons of hand-me-down belief and second-hand knowledge. It is time in this age not only for familiarization with the works of maligned and subversive geniuses but also for a reappraisal of ancient mystery school gnosis. By considering such to be irrelevant, post-industrial man has condemned himself in his search for answers to being perpetually enticed down many a false and unproductive path. Our present age bears the scars, so to speak, of our mental and emotional detours, our genuflection before wrong altars and wrong lecterns. In our utter hubris, we believe that the ancients were rabidly superstitious and otherworldly. Yet it is our world that is infested with idol worship and materialism, the likes of which would deeply grieve our ancient forebears, who would question our sanity while observing our prostration before possessions, flags, governments, and all the other worthless objects of worship that command our allegiance. They would see that we are suffering from a coma of souls and would be shocked to find how their precious bequeathments to posterity have suffered under our hands. It is said that civilizations rise and fall, but civilizations are not born or made or formed from bricks and mortar, but from minds and hearts, aspiration and ardor, vision and moral vigilance. It is when these are lacking that a civilization begins to crumble, as ours appears now to be crumbling. The truth is that the ancients were more existentially present in this world than we are, and were certainly more aligned with nature. Human consciousness was an extension of the Merkaba of the planet and of the vital and omniscient universe. 
The ancients communed with the flora and the fauna as easily and directly as we do with one another. The very word pharaoh comes from the Greek words pharos nous, meaning enlightened mind or mind on fire. The dynastic leaders of ancient Egypt were enlightened or semi-enlightened beings. They ruled over a people who in 25,000 years remained where they were on the Nile Valley without seeking to conquer the territories inhabited by their neighbors. The Celtic and Gaelic Druids would not permit themselves the luxury of cutting any living thing with a sharpened edge. Dare we indulge in comparing this kind of leadership and ethics with those prevalent in today's ecocidal climate? The ancient astrologers were not those who indulged in mere fortune-telling, but in delineating and explicating the connections between the noumenal and phenomenal dimensions, between matter and mind. This relationship is what we commonly call life. And only when we know what the true connections are can it be said that we are actually living. Now the later prohibitions against astrology came from a need to dislocate our symbolic and symbiotic connections with the organic and the natural. Their prohibition against idol worship was meant to create psychic imbalance, to compel man to use his frontal lobes and left brain and suppress the use of his emotional body, his imagination and holotropic right brain. Factually, the scientists are now coming to reluctantly understand what the ancients had been saying for millennia. Materialism is now becoming a thing of the past in science and due to the discovery of the quantum universe even the men of science have to accept the unsustainability of the paradigms that they've coveted for so long and by which they have tyrannized humanity. Thought has been found to be non-localized. The brain has been found to be a veritable hologram. Non-linear thinking does make for a heavier brain and more synapses. Intelligence has been found to be somatic and emotional as well as intellectual. Junk DNA has been found to be not junk and the dead space between atoms has been found to be very much alive. The quantum universe operates by the same laws as consciousness. Fractal mathematics reveals that there is an intelligence behind the apparent chaos of the universe after all. And we have it proven that thought is indeed fate and that one's character is their destiny. So it only remains a matter of when and not if it will be rediscovered that the story of our lives is indeed written in the heavens and that what is above is also below. This fact was academic to the ancients, understanding that the dynamics within the psyche could be made manifest and read by a horoscope of celestial relationships and alignments was no more bizarre to our mystic forebearers than it is for us to nowadays accept that the behavior and character of a person is based on their DNA within their microscopic cells and no more preposterous than having one's finger move at the end of a hand without wires, batteries, or direct electrical current. Astrologically, our sun is slowly moving backwards through the zodiac in a cycle that takes 25,520 years to complete. The sun is now heading towards the sign of Aquarius and will arrive there in about 600 years. When it enters this sign, the so-called age of Aquarius will begin. One of the main deities assigned to Aquarius was Janus. Janus gives us the word January. He was the god with two faces, one looking to the future and one looking to the past. The message of Janus, the patron of prophets, is that the future is always in our hands. But we cannot afford to forget or be negligent towards the bequeathments of our ancestors. They did not learn by trial and error. Their minds were connected to the living matrix of the universe. They were in contact with the living oracle, and therefore, they did things right the first time around. The present millennium is the time when we come full circle, and in endings, we will find a chance for new beginnings. There can be no new world without the destruction of the old world, though. And those days will soon be upon us. Some say they've already begun. The time has come for us to find within us the strength and wisdom that is our legacy from ancient times. This program is a humble attempt to assist in that glorious reawakening.
I have said many times during the course of this series that uh, the 21st century is not only a time for solution think, but also a time when a great many of the great mysteries of old are going to be revealed to the human race. These are the mysteries of religion, of government, and of culture in general. Now the authors of the book Templar Revelation have a passage in that book which is very enlightening and encapsulates the theme of this particular program. In that book they say, our whole culture is unquestionably understood to be Judeo-Christian. But what would it mean if it should in fact be Egypto-Christian instead? What indeed would that mean? What would it mean for the Vatican? What would it mean for the followers of all the world's Western religions? What would it mean for the leaders of all the denominations? And what would it mean also for us if we really did understand the origins of some of the philosophical, religious, and theocratic um, principles and idioms that we accept and also take for granted? What would happen if we find out that there is an earlier origin, an earlier Semitic root to the great religious and philosophical ideas that we have accepted almost blindly in this world? Now, the heart of the um, Judeo-Christian paradigm is, of course, the Bible which we understand emanated from the Torah. And the Torah, as I've shown in other programs, originated from the tarot and the old divination arts of previous ages, previous high races, like the Phoenician and the Sumerian, and perhaps even before them. So the unraveling of the mystery of Judeo-Christianity can't happen without an appraisal of its main uh, manifesto, its main testament, the Bible. And of course, many there are, many scholars all over the world, for thousands of years have been trying to unravel the mystery of the Bible, because it is, after all, filled with mystery. And just when you think you've got a handle on one of its great mysteries, another one appears to confound your understanding. The thing is labyrinthine. It, we never seem to be able to get to the bottom of it. And perhaps it's because we've been looking in the wrong direction or holding the telescope, looking through the telescope, you know, from the wrong, the wrong angle, from the wrong side. Perhaps there's a reason why we never can seem to get a handle on what this incredible book actually is about and what it actually means. We don't know, is it a biography, is it a book of art? It's so cryptic, it's so labyrinthine. And of course now we have uh, a great many scholars working on this problem. Brilliant researchers who are finding out all manner of mysteries now that the human race is more literate than it was ages ago. And of course we have the uncovery of late of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Library and the apocryphal works. Now the apocryphal works have always been around, but the wholesale revelation coming out of the Dead Sea area in Syria and the Middle East of the so-called Gnostic tradition, that has really impacted orthodox fundamentalistic paradigms in a very, very strong way. And the Vatican, knowing that, has responded in kind. They've not only prevented the publication and translation of those Gnostic scriptures, but they have also stooped the assassination of some of the writers and scholars who sought to explain to us what was being hidden from us in the orthodox package that we've been handed. Now, everyone has heard of astrology. A lot of people, of course, have heard of astronomy. But very few people in this world have ever heard of astrotheology. In fact, after watching this program, should you mention it to anyone that you know, chances are they'll never have heard of that term. And we advocate that that is not by chance. And when we go to study the ancient cultures of Europe and the ancient world, we certainly do understand that there was a great deal of emphasis not only on astrology but on omens and superstitions in general. The culture is replete with it. So as the statement in uh, Pickett and Prince's book emphasizes, what happens if our culture is Egyptian based? Well the one thing that we know, to cut a long story short, the one thing we know about the Egyptians is their fascination and love with the stars and the heavens. Now the word astrotheology means exactly what it says, the religion of the heavens or the religion of the stars. Astrotheology is basically considered the theology in total that was practiced in the ancient lands of Egypt. But we can look around even our own milieu, our own society, and notice the prevalence of stars 
moons, suns, and other astromantic symbols. We find them in all the seats of learning. We even give uh, children stars for matriculation. We even refer to our children as pupils, uh, emphasizing that they're now pupils of the sun, like the sun is the pupil of the sky, the eye of Ra, the old Egyptian god of the sun. We find almost all the flags of the world covered in stars. We find it on money, on heraldry. We find that there's hardly a movie corporation or a newspaper that doesn't make reference to the star or the sun. They are cover uh, state and government centers and the civic centers and the military and the police will find it emblazoned on their buildings and in their um, uniforms and, co and costumes. We also understand that many games that we play, things we again take for granted, represent the movement of the zodiac. For instance, when you go to circus and you ride the Big Dipper, how many realize that this is a motif that harkens back in its own way to the zodiac and the turning of the celestial sphere? How many realize that when you're playing the game roulette and many other games in a casino, that the spinning of the roulette wheel with its little uh, demarcations like the zodiac and then the little white ball that you throw into it you know, the white ball representing the sun of course and, of, and the idea that it's a game of chance well the zodiac the idea of um, fortune lady fortune and fate the idea of your fates and the whole idea of divination being able to read your destiny and read your fate this is picked up in another way in the game of roulette when you're chancing your luck when we have a birthday, how many people realize to this day where that particular idiom came from? What do we have? We have a round cake which we cut into geometrical segments and then put a little candle with a light on it like the stars for each day of your life. And the zodiac is exactly that, a round template or table with geometrical compartments which represent all the days of your life. We are trapped, as it were, inside the circle of the zodiac. And we commemorate this. The ancients knew how to commemorate this. The rolling of dice is connected to the squaring of the circle. And in fact, uh, we may not be aware of this, but in all the ancient temples all of the world, including the Christian temples, divination was used in the rolling of dice. They called those dice the Urim and the Thummim. And the high priest would go into the holy place to roll the dice in order to divine what the gods had in store or what the gods wanted to happen. There's many facts that have been hidden from us. The idea of playing drafts or playing the game of chess and the black and white um, squares. The black and the white was known to always represent diurnal time, the turning of night and day. White for day and night, uh, is for the black is for the night because the movement of the planets have this infinite and eternal movement in, like when you blink your eyes, night and dark, light and dark happening incessantly with the movement of the sun and the planets. We have this strange phenomenon that the ancients thought was miraculous, incredible. We just don't even notice it today. And they tried to commemorate this in the game of chess, in the 64 squares and the various pieces that represented the constellations. Freemasons understand the mysteries of these. Secret societies often um, have been the ones who have been the great archivists. Religions have not been the people who have archived anything. They've been responsible only for confusing all of this gnosis. But the secret societies and the mystery cults were the ones who preserved a lot of this knowledge. And the Freemasons understand also that um, within the playing cards, that's the regular 52 playing cards, the secret of the Great Pyramid, the building of the pyramid, the geometry and the numerology and the uh, architectural principles are actually encoded in the, playing, the 52 playing cards. That's the mystery of those incredible cards. Because the Egyptians weren't left brain uh, people. They didn't write things down in stacks and stacks of books in order to explain to us in that kind of way. They had other ways of communicating to us that we think are just simpleton now because we have become so dependent on left brain thought and left brain cognition and masculine modes of thought. And the Egyptians weren't like that. They used a whole brain. And there's a whole different kind of communication that comes with that. So in a little child's game, like rolling the dice um, or playing cards, incredible mysteries can be actually contained. And what has always interested me, of course, is not only the playing cards 
have descended from these ancient times, but the mystery of the tarot. The tarot, which is a very ancient document used for divination, has its ancestry in Egypt. Dominoes, chess, drafts, all board games, if you study them correctly, are not only there to teach us how to unify consciousness. That's what the ultimate idea was. Of course, we've reduced it to mere fun and games and uh, competitiveness. The whole agenda is very different now. But even uh, hopscotch, the idea of jumping with one foot and then two feet along this uh, numbered path is connected to the old uh, concept of the tree of life. It's connected to what is known as the Kabbalistic tree of life. But again, toned down in a way which would preserve it through the ages. Because whoever created these understood that ages would change and there would be a time that would come in which uh, ordinary people would not care about any of these uh, devices and not want to preserve the ancient Gnosis and would fall into a sort of a Newtonian sleep. So the miracle was, knowing that, they were able to preserve their cultural idioms in, in a cryptic way that we would preserve, perhaps not even understanding what we're doing. And so many of the idioms that we uh, perform today, the jumping of the bull's head that you see in Latin types of countries and uh, the ceremonies of the maypole and the carousels and playing cards, even nursery rhymes. It's well known that nursery rhymes are filled with astrotheological sidereal motifs. And Jack, be nimble, Jack, be quick. Jack, jump over the candlestick. For aeons, the candlestick was understood to be the axis of the earth, and Jack is the name of the sun. So right there, the sun passing over the polar axis was encapsulated in a little rhyme that doesn't seem to mean much in any other way. The fact that we have fountains in the squares of the world, gushing water, will come to understand that a lot of this has... Uh, very ancient history. The fact that we light fireworks at, uh, at times of ceremony. The fireworks display, the fireworks ritual goes back a long, long way. It has to do with the male impregnating the female. Here we have the phallic fire, which is shot off into the womb of the, of the body of the night goddess Nuth. Why? So that there would be a promising tomorrow. The stars and the planets were always seen as embryonic life forms in the great womb, the great night womb of the, of the night goddess, Nuth. And so at times of great ceremony, when people were looking uh, forward to prosperity and abundance, they had the ceremony of firing this phallic, ithy phallic um, light, uh, the little analogous sperms into the ovum or into the womb of the night goddess for a promising tomorrow. Even the money that we use and the fact that it's in three basic colors, silver, gold, and bronze, those represent the sun, the moon, and the earth. When people are given medals of honor, they also not only have stellar symbols on them, but they come in those three colors in order to commemorate that matriculation descends to us from the stars, the sun being the greatest achiever, the moon being the next, and the bronze representing the earth, the three great levels of matriculation. And even when we're given medals, often we're standing on what looks like an Egyptian pyramid. Not only uh, are we given medals that are circular, but we're often given, one, given medals, and we see medals that are in the shape of a star. It's also uh, known that if you study this, you might discover that most of the dances of the world, and very specifically the waltz and the minuet, but even more in particular, the age-old dances that come out of the Celtic countries, coming out of Brittany and Cornwall and Scotland, the very geometrical, precise geometrical jigs and reels and the dances of old are very particular. And you'll often see in Scotland where they actually lay the swords and raise the swords to represent different geometrical shapes like the Star of David. And the movement of the feet and the legs is precise. A lot of the dancers don't realize, unfortunately, though some do, that these dances are based on, uh, come out of an ancient tradition of the past in which uh, they represent geometrical and astrological aspects and ratios and also conjunctions in the sky. Of course, in the African continent and in the Far East and in India and in China, we wouldn't have to tell the dancers that. They'd be absolutely aware of that. And though we don't have time to go into it in one short presentation, 
Let it be known also that this has a very modern context. This is not just some old uh, relic hunting uh, nonsense of, of bygone ages. Our modern movies are also replete with um, astrological and archetypal motifs. One example is The Magnificent Seven. If you watch that movie with educated eyes, you will find that the uh, writers uh, consciously encoded in and scripted into that film very precise astrological motifs. And in my classes I've taught this to bring it out because of course if you say this to people they're going to think it's crazy until one demonstrates that each of the characters, even in their script, even in the words that they're given, not, and even in the costumes that they wear, and even in the traits that they personify in that movie, embody specific um, astrological signs of the zodiac and planetary symbols. Now, of course, in good drama, you have composite characters. They're not just going to be cut out of cardboard where it's one symbol or one set of uh, performances. They're composite archetypal characters. And this needs to be understood because if we want to encode this kind of symbolism in our creations, uh, if, if we're into movies or art or design, we need to understand this because there's a whole archive, a whole um, repository of archetypal information and symbolic richness that we need to understand. And some of the top filmmakers in the world, along with their other prodigious talents, are aware of this more secretive uh, canon. And as we pointed out in the other show in this uh, series, Subversive sim uh, the subversive use of sacred symbolism. The, the uh, advertisers and ad men on Madison Avenue and elsewhere, they are very conversant with it. Now, Joseph A. Seiss, a uh, author who had studied all these matters in his book, The Gospel of the Stars, he says, in treating of these starry groups and pictures, we are dealing with something very different from the inventions of paganism and mythology, with something as sacred in origin as venerable in age and as edifying in import as anything known to man. Corrupt religion and classic fable have interfered to obscure and pervert their meaning, and scientific self-will has crowded them with impertinent and unmeaning additions, but in reality they constitute the primeval Bible. So here's a scholar who's done his homework, who has been comparing and contrasting the ancient mythologies, the ancient cultures of the prehistoric era, with the modern ones that we have today. And he's convinced that these are not just fable. This is not something to just be put aside. It undergirds all of the philosophical and theocratic idioms that we take for granted today. Now, for those of you who are interested in this particular paradigm of uh, how games and how words and how uh, phrases and even certain passages have astrotheological motifs, you're welcome to go onto my website because there's a whole page there a great deal of work has gone into etymology and showing how many of our words uh, originate and the real meaning of these terms and phrases is also a very handy way to get a hook into this vast subject. There are certain um, easier routes into the center of this incredible uh, study. So personal names, for instance, and the names of cities, for instance, and just in the language that we use from day to day, we can use that particular um, motif to uncover the astrotheological origins of our world. But yes, indeed, the Holy Bible, the mystery of the Bible, this is what we seek in this program to help to reveal. And we find that in the Bible, in books like Genesis, if we read very carefully, we will find that this old tradition is very much alive. Just because it hasn't been taught to us from the pulpit doesn't mean that the Bible itself does not contain evidences of this ancient tradition. I've said many times that what we get from the pulpit is far from theology. It has very little to do with theology. You can't expect the uh, tradition of Judeo-Christianity and those uh, patriarchs who set about to slaughter and murder whole cultures, who put whole nations to the sword, who burned the witches, who massacred the Gnostics, who set about colonizing the entire world and erasing all of these individuals from the face of the earth, you'd hardly then imagine that they're going to want it, that that gnosis, that the very things that they were teaching, to also remain intact. There was going to be an act of suppression involving the knowledge, since after all, that was what they were trying to suppress in the first place. And yet, even with that, if you're careful and studious, and if you know where to look, you will even find within the Bible that which they could not hide, or that which they... Uh, 
allowed in. For instance, in Genesis 1 we read, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. There is one that your local uh, pastor is going to skip over pretty easily. Let the signs in the heavens be used for signs and for the seasons. Let there be a zodiac. In Job 38, God asks the prophet Job, Canst you bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou lead Arcturus and his sons? Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Knowest thou the ordinance of heaven? He's literally saying, do you know how your way around the stars and the heavens and all the things that they mean? Are you aware of how to chart that? And he's not speaking in some astronomical sense. This is astrology that is being referred to here. And yet the, the, the prophet, in order to be a prophet, is questioned. He's assumed to have this great knowledge. Well, wait a minute. We've been told something very different today, right? In Hebrew 9, we have the pattern of things in the heavens. Patterns of things in the heavens. What patterns? Now, Timothy Freak and Peter Gandhi, they write, the traditional history of Christianity is hopelessly inadequate to the facts. From our research into ancient spirituality, it has become obvious that we must fundamentally revise our understanding of Christian origins in the most shocking of ways. Our conclusion, supported by a considerable body of evidence in our book, The Jesus Mysteries, is that Christianity was not a new religion. It was a continuation of paganism by another name. The gospel story of Jesus is not the biography of a historical messiah. It is a Jewish reworking of ancient pagan myths of the dying and resurrecting God-man, Osiris Dionysus, which had been popular for centuries throughout the ancient Mediterranean. There you have it. So let it be known again. In order to have ancient mysteries revealed, in order to make sense of our world, it's going to be something of a painful experience. Revelatory and, above all, healthy. But it's the, as all nurses know, when you want to rip a plaster off a wound, the quickest way is the short, sharp, shriek method. But we're going to need that in order to extrapolate some of the incredible mysteries by which we have been dumbed down for years. And to come to sanity is a two-fold path. You can't get to the light without first noticing the darkness. You have to do your house cleaning first. You can't just say to the garbage in your backyard, garbage be gone. You can't just uh, have a room aired by screaming from the window to let the air come in. You have to do some homework. You've got to get into the garden, get onto your knees, and weed out that garden before new flowers will grow and the birds and bees will come in to create a new and beautiful uh, garden. But the, what we're talking about here is the intellectual uh, homework that needs to now be done so that we can have sanity back on its throne. Of course, this was uh, not wanted by the Judeo-Christian paradigm who were setting about the manipulation and the um, subversion of the ancient tradition. In Exodus 20, you shall not make for yourself a graven image. That prohibition, by the way, comes before the prohibition that says thou shalt not kill. Now, why would that be? Because it was important to those who were funding, uh, creating this anthrocentric, patriarchal, hegemonic religion that we have to get rid of this need for ancient people to portray in cards and in stone and in hieroglyphics the mysteries of cosmos, the mysteries of being, and the mysteries of life. They were fascinated by it and they knew how to portray it. But that right brain approach, that symbolic communication had to go in order for the new one to come in. So let us just understand at this point that what we call Judeo-Christianity has antiquity. It dates, it originates from far in distant times than from the dates that we are officially given. Now President John Adams, President of the United States, John Adams said that the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. The doctrine of the divinity of Jesus is made a convenient cover for absurdity. President James Madison said, What influence, in fact, have Christian ecclesiastical establishments had on civil society? In many instances, they have been upholding the thrones of political tyranny. 
In no instance have they been seen as the guardians of the liberties of the people. Rulers who wish to subvert the public liberty have found in the clergy convenient auxiliaries. A just government instituted to secure and perpetuate liberty does not need the clergy. Well, wait a minute, that's a heavy piece of information. Here we are still to this day laboring over whether state and church and church and state should be united or whether they should be apart. And yet the founding fathers of the United States of America were under no doubt about it whatsoever. How come we haven't been hearing about this? We're, we're hearing that this is not only the worst of theological tyrannies, but the worst of political tyrannies. And, and that the religious uh, principles coming out of Christianity would only be used by the most uh, violent and criminalistic of political tyrannies. Thomas Jefferson said, I have examined all the known superstitions of the world and I do not find in our particular superstition of Christianity one redeeming feature. They are all alike founded on fables and mythology. Millions of innocent men, women and children since the introduction of Christianity have been burned, tortured, fined and imprisoned. What has been the effect of this coercion? To make one half of the world fools and the other half hypocrites. To support roguery and error all over the earth. The clergy converted the simple teachings of Jesus into an engine for enslaving the world and adulterated by artificial constructions into a contrivance to filch wealth and power to themselves. These clergy, in fact, constitute the real Antichrist. In his letter to John Adams um, in 1823, Jefferson said, The day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus, by the supreme being, as his father in the womb of a virgin will be classified with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. So he's saying, fine, have it. Worship it if you want. But one of these days, at least we'll acknowledge that it will be a fable like the Greek fables are considered. We love the Greek fables. We understand the beauty of those stories. We understand that there's a tremendous, tremendous uh, moral story also written there. But we don't take it as being the end all and be all. We understand that it is a story, a fable. How come we don't understand that with our own predominant religion? Because we don't want to, because it serves a certain purpose. Uh, one of the greatest uh, philosophers and humanitarians the world has ever known, Thomas Paine, he said it this way, I do not believe in the creed professed by the Jewish church, by the Roman church, by the Greek church, by the Turkish church, by the Protestant church, nor by any church that I know of. Each of those churches accuse the other of unbelief, and for my own part, I disbelieve them all. Dean Millman, in his book, The History of Christianity, said, By the invincible power of traditional subservience, the inertia of the general mind, enhanced by the gullibility of ignorance, the masses have slipped under the force of a victimization that is both pitiable and tragic. The forces of religion have thus exerted their rulership over a vast segment of humanity, and virtually provided the masses with their conventional ideas and concepts as to the meaning of the world ordeal. The historian Strabo in ancient times wrote, It is impossible to govern a mob of women or the whole mixed multitude by philosophical reason and to exhort them to piety, holiness and faith. We must also employ superstition with its fables and prodigies from the thunder, the abyss, the trident, the torches, the serpents, the thrissy of the gods, are fables, as is all ancient theology. But the legislator introduces these things as bugbears to those who are children in understanding. That's my whole point. Children in understanding. Okay, let's accept it. Let's admit it. We are infantile in our understanding, psychologically, theocratically, mystically, spiritually. Let's accept that. A child can grow. It's not the end of the world. A child can grow up and mature. But in order to mature, we have to put away the childish things. Now, collectively speaking, this is imminent. This absolutely must happen. There are no two ways. If we are to inherit any kind of future that is worth the living. One of America's greatest scholars in any sense of the word, and particularly in uh, astrotheological studies, was the mighty uh, researcher and writer Alvin Board. Elvin Boyd Kuhn, and he wrote that the supreme charge against Christianity is that it has caused the obsession of untold millions of minds with a series of fatuous beliefs which have motivated centuries of human actions perpetrating a body of follies, fanaticisms, cruelties, and inhumanities unmatched in all history. 
And the instructive difference between Christianity and, let's say, Greek philosophy is now seen in startling clarity as the difference between surrender of the mind in Christianity to a series of wild and chimerical fancies in no wise based on any correspondence with truth and reality. While Greek philosophy was a system of intellectual propositions based on a complete harmonization with the known realities, the forces and elements of man's constitution and the laws of the cosmos. So Kuhn is saying, look, we're not against the fact that you have um, mythologies, fables and legends. Let's have them. But can they at least be rooted in the real? Can they at least be articulated as some kind of sanity? In a book called Revelations of the Antichrist, we read, Those initiated into the sacred mysteries knew the gospel stories were false, but considered it necessary to keep up the imposition for the purposes of propagandism. But while this transition of faith was going on, some of the more conscientious teachers began to tell the people that the Jesus Christ they were worshipping was not a historical personage. This was regarded by the conservative priests as a dangerous disclosure, and so John denounces the innovators as liars and antichrists, knowing that he himself and his fellow priests were the pious liars, and that the antichrists were telling the truth. Error prevailed, and the mythical Christ became the historical Jesus. Elmer H. Gruber, in a book called The Original Jesus, says that during the early period of the Christian movement, the multitude of often contradictory texts was so great that the young church saw only one way of preserving the faith from splitting it into numerous sects, assembling a canon of writings and destroying rejected or apocryphal, that is, the hidden texts. So we have editing now on a massive scale. The idea in order to consolidate, because that's the idea. We want world government. We want world religion. We don't want independent, segregated tribes and nations all believing whatever they want. No, we can't have that. We have one God now, and we want everyone to worship one God. So we'll just try to homogenize the whole problem. And anything that remains uh, discordant, we'll just ban it and throw it away and burn it. And then we'll create a PR process to sell the uh, creation that we make out of all of that. Now Burton L. Mack, in his book Who Wrote the New Testament, says the writings in the New Testament were not written by eyewitnesses of an overpowering divine presence in the midst of human history. The Christian Bible turns out to be a masterpiece of invention. To be quite frank about it, the Bible is the product of a very energetic and successful myth-making on the part of those early Christians. And Tony Bushby in his Bible Fraud he says, it is important to remember that the words authorized and original as applied to the Bible do not mean genuine, authentic, or true. T.W. Doan, in his book Bible Myths and Their Parallels in Other Religions, says the canon of the New Testament is nothing more or less than a copy of the mythological histories of the Hindu savior Krishna and the Buddhist savior Buddha, with a mixture of mythology borrowed from the Persians and other nations. Tony Bushby goes on to say, It was the wisest fool in Christendom who authorized the translation and publication of the first Protestant version of the Bible into English. He came to the English throne in 1603 and quickly became unpopular because of his disgusting personal habits and his unsavory character. He pretended to be a scholar in theology and philosophy, but his learning was shallow and superficial. He wallowed in filth, moral and physical, but was endowed with a share of cunning that his associates called him called a kind of crooked wisdom. For his new edition of the Bible, he issued a set of personal rules that translators were to follow and ordered revisions to proceed, although he never contributed a farthing to its cost. Work began in 1607. The translators handed over the revisers' manuscripts of what is now called the King James Bible to King James for his final personal approval. It was evident that James was not competent to check their work and edit it, so he passed the manuscripts to a higher genius, to the greatest genius of all time, Sir Francis Bacon. I want to add this particular um, passage because those who have uh, checked out my book on Atlantis and who've seen Atlantis, Alien Visitation, Genetic Manipulation, uh, the program in this series will know what I'm implying there by Sir Francis Bacon and even will note this particular era, this particular date, the 1607s with the rise of the Tudors and their need to uh, not only mind control uh, the, 
the people under them, but also to create an empire. And we'll remember how many idioms that we associate with England come out of this particular era and how it is that uh, so many changes, so many changes happened around the 15th, 16th century, the Renaissance with the coming of the Tudors and how it was that just 50, 100 years prior the kings are shivering in windowless castles, shivering to death and then all of a sudden uh, enormous empires rise. Now we have um, an important document, an important um, period in Christianity at the time of Emperor Constantine. We have a thing called the Donation of Constantine which was the stamp of approval on Christianity. Now Emperor Constantine lived between 208 to 337 AD. After his vision he had a vision and after that he went on to issue the Edict of Milan in 313 AD which legalized Christianity throughout the empire. Okay, so you gotta legalize it. Shortly thereafter it, came, it became the fastest spreading religion. Arthur Kemp, the historian, says that Constantine's conversion to Christianity is still shrouded in mystery and led to the most famous forgery in European history, that which became known as the Donation of Constantine. This document purports to be a signed document by Constantine and its principal feature is to grant the Bishop of Rome, that's the Pope, temporal authority over the city of Rome and the entire Roman Empire. Not only is this important for this particular show, this particular program, but again I want to note, look at this from the uh, thesis that we were um, relating in Atlantis Alien Visitation and Genetic Manipulation we see an, another important tie-in here, that the Pope, that's the religious authority, gets his power originally from the monarch, from the king. Now, who were the kings? Where did their bloodline originate? That then, in the uh, earliest part of this millennium, this early part of the last millennium, in the first centuries AD, we should have the king, the monarch authority, giving the rights to the Pope to create this official religion. That's a very important uh, anecdote. Kemp goes on to say, although there are many glaring factual errors in the text of the document, which by themselves show the document to be a forgery, the donation of Constantine was accepted as genuine until the 15th century and was used by the Catholic Church to claim political power in not only the Roman Empire but also ultimately in all nominally Christian lands. Eventually the donation of Constantine was rejected as false, but by then the Church had established itself in almost all of Europe. Its power is founded on a forgery. Kemp goes on to say, the books now contained in the Old Testament were largely oral before 300 BC, although some had been written down by the Jewish rabbis. Through contact with the Jews in Ptolemaic Egypt, King Ptolemy II Philadelphus is credited with the ordering the translation of the Jewish religious books into Greek. The Christian version of the Old Testament was only established as a comprehensive work by the scribe Origen around 250 AD and up until that time only loose translations of the Ptolemaic Greek work formed the basis of Christian teaching. Kemp goes on to say uh, that in 768 AD Charlemagne started a 32 year long campaign of what can only be described as genocidal evangelism against the Saxons under his control in western Germany. The campaign started with the cutting down of the Saxons' most sacred tree, literally their version of the world tree. In 1772, at Quiz Quirzi, he issued a proclamation that he would kill every Saxon who refused to accept Jesus Christ, and from that time on he kept a special detachment of Christian priests who doubled as executioners. And in every Saxon village in which they stopped, these priests could execute anybody who refused to be baptized. Then in 782 at Verdun, Charlemagne carried out the act for which he is the most notoriously associated. He ordered the beheading of 4,500 Saxons in one day who had made the error of being caught practicing paganism after they had agreed to be Christians. His on-site biographer, the monk Einhard, records that after these beheading, the king went into winter camp and there celebrated mass as usual. So there's your um, paragons of Christianity. There's your paragons of the world religion. Uh, this has very little, as you can see, to do with enlightenment or the spiritual uplift of anyone. It has to do with exactly what it says, massacre, murder and mayhem and mind control. 
Arthur Kemp in his March of the Titans says, the only significant group left in Europe who were not Christians by the year 1000 AD were to be found in the Baltic and Eastern European regions. To destroy this last bastion of paganism, the church employed the service of some of the most fanatic Christians of all, the Teutonic Knights. Originally a religious military order founded during the Crusades, being first established in Palestine in 1190, the Teutonic Knights jumped at the chance and by using violence and mass murder soon became known as effective Christianizers. This genocidal evangelism soon became the sole obsession of the Teutonic Knights. By 1226 the order had set up permanent settlements in northeastern Europe. In 1525 the order's Grand Master Albrecht of Ho Hohenzollern became a Protestant and dissolved the order. Tony Bushby's Bible fraud, he said, there was never any recorded form of ordination from a supernatural Jesus Christ or Simon of Petra uh, to the presbyters. They appointed themselves and continually restructured their own writings to further appeal to the rabble without understanding the meaning of what they were compiling. In fact, the term father was used by the priests in the cult of Mithras. Okay, this is an ancient cult, an ancient solar cult, the cult of Mithras. The term was originally forbidden to Christians. The, Decem the birthday of Mithras was December solstice, the time that was later given to the birth of Jesus Christ. Now one of the most important um, revealers of this kind of information that I'd like to introduce to you at this time and to whom this program is uh, definitely dedicated, as are others in this series of Origins and Oracles, is Jordan Maxwell, who spent his whole life researching and uncovering this kind of information so that humanity might again see the true light of reason and might win in this intellectual, spiritual war against the adversaries that uh, seek our ruination. I've often said that if we were to build statues in bronze uh, to Jordan throughout the world, that would only be going a small way to honoring the service to humanity of this uh, remarkable uh, Magi, this true Magi of our times, uh, those who are familiar with Jordan's work know absolutely that he alone deserves the term the most controversial speaker in the world. One of the most important things that he has brought out in his work is that um, there are connections, there are occult secrets, there is an occult origin of religion, business and government. He says in his own words that religion and politics are but two hands serving the same brain. And Jordan Maxwell has been one of the most uh, courageous individuals to show you how the workings of that brain and exactly what plan that brain has for the future. Now, Tony Bushby, in his Secret in the Bible, says that in the fourth century, leading advocates of the Christian church developed a secret worship from which a major portion of the public was excluded and the custom of communicating only a portion of the community uh, became known as the Disciplinae Arcanae, or the Discipline of the Secret. The privacy of these sacred rites performed was guarded with the utmost care from the obtrusive eyes of all who were not qualified to be present. So like Jordan Maxwell has uncovered, like other scholars are researching and finding out, there was a secret tradition within Christianity. And that Christianity itself, I mean, you only have to watch any even Cecil B. DeMille uh, movie coming out of the 50s in America to realize that in relationship to all the other cults and powers and nations, for instance, the Romans, Christianity is clearly a uh, conspiratorial organization, a um, secret organization with great many mysteries. They had to use symbols to communicate with each other. They were being suppressed. Uh, they had to meet in secret and they were um, having to uh, disguise their original intentions. And yet today, anyone else who happens to, in our modern age, anybody who else who tends to be like that, are considered to be negative or evil. Yet Christianity in its inception was nothing but a secret society. Now Dr. Lawrence Buck in Mystic Masonry he also talks about Christianity's hidden traditions. He says, there was always an exoteric portion given out to the world, to the uninitiated, and an esoteric portion reserved for initiates that was revealed only in degrees. Accordingly, as the candidate demonstrated his fitness to receive, 
conceal and rightly use the knowledge so imparted. Few professed Christians are aware, perhaps, that such was the case with Christianity during the earliest centuries. And St. Gregory, that's the Bishop of Constantinople in 540 to 604 AD, said, You have heard as much of the mystery as we are allowed to speak openly in the ears of all. The rest will be communicated to you in private and that you must retain within yourself. Our mysteries are not to be made known to strangers. One of the greatest personalities within the um, Jewish culture and tradition and religion is Rabbi Moses Maimonides, and he says, every time that you find in our books a tale, the reality of which seems impossible, a story that is repugnant to both reason and common sense, then be sure that the tale contains a profound allegory veiling a deep mysterious truth, and the greater the absurdity of the letter, the deeper the wisdom of spirit. Whoever shall find out the true sense of the book of Genesis ought to take care not to divulge it. If a person should discover the true meaning of it by himself or by the aid of another, then he ought to be silent. For if he speaks, he ought to speak of it only obscurely, in an enigmatical manner, as I do myself. So just know at this stage that if you're a well-meaning Christian who has been uh, following this particular paradigm, understand that there is a hierarchy involved here and that you, it's not an egalitarian process, this game of religion. You're being told only what you need to know. From their own words, from the horse's mouth, you have it, that there is an esoteric and an exoteric tradition here. And you may not be privy to that. You may not have earned that right. So be very careful then when you say that what you know here is the whole truth. Because those who are telling you to say that and those who are giving you this information, they may know something more, something that you don't know. The whole thing is based on mystery. Now, what um, Jordan Maxwell has brought out in his incredible researches and work is the fact that there are, were in the ancient world not one power structure, but many. And Jordan speaks specifically of the four great cults of power. And those are known as the Stellar Cult, the Lunar Cult, the Solar Cult, and the Saturnian Cult. And absolutely, fundamentally, no knowledge whatsoever of our times now can be had without an understanding of the role and the origin and the power of these cults. Now you won't be finding that information in most of the textbooks. There are books from previous centuries that do contain it, but those books and those writers have been sequestered and persecuted. We hope to bring that gnosis to you today so that you have an insight into where all of this comes from, so you can make sense of all this malarkey. But the cults of power are very, very important. Now Dr. Lawrence Buck in Mystic Masonry he also talks about Christianity's hidden traditions. He says, there was always an exoteric portion given out to the world, to the uninitiated, and an esoteric portion reserved for initiates that was revealed only in degrees. Accordingly, as the candidate demonstrated his fitness to receive, conceal, and rightly use the knowledge so imparted, few professed Christians are aware, perhaps, that such was the case with Christianity during the earliest centuries. And St. Gregory, that's the Bishop of Constantinople in 540 to 604 AD, said, You have heard as much of the mystery as we are allowed to speak openly in the ears of all. The rest will be communicated to you in private, and that you must retain within yourself. Our mysteries are not to be made known to strangers. One of the greatest personalities within the um, Jewish culture and tradition and religion is Rabbi Moses Maimonides, and he says, Every time that you find in our books a tale, the reality of which seems impossible, a story that is repugnant to both reason and common sense, then be sure that the tale contains a profound allegory veiling a deep mysterious truth, and the greater the absurdity of the letter, the deeper the wisdom of spirit. Whoever shall find out the true sense of the book of Genesis ought to take care not to divulge it. If a person should discover the true meaning of it by himself or by the aid of another, then he ought to be silent. For if he speaks, he ought to speak of it only obscurely, in an enigmatical manner, as I do myself. So just know at this stage that if you're a well-meaning Christian who has been uh, following this particular paradigm, understand that there is a hierarchy involved here, and that you, it's not an egalitarian process, this game of religion. You're being told only what you need to know. From their own words, from the horse's mouth, you have it, that there is an esoteric and an exoteric tradition here. And you may not be privy to that. You may not have earned that right. So be very careful then when you say that what you know here is the whole truth. 
Because those who are telling you to say that and those who are giving you this information, they may know something more, something that you don't know. The whole thing is based on mystery. Now what um, Jordan Maxwell has brought out in his incredible researches and work is the fact that there are, were in the ancient world not one power structure, but many. And Jordan speaks specifically of the four great cults of power. And those are known as the Stellar Cult, the Lunar Cult, the Solar Cult, and the Saturnian Cult. And absolutely, fundamentally, no knowledge whatsoever of our times now can be had without an understanding of the role and the origin and the power of these cults. Now you won't be finding that information in most of the textbooks. There are books from previous centuries that do contain it, but those books and those writers have been sequestered and persecuted. We hope to bring that gnosis to you today so that you have an insight into where all of this comes from, so you can make sense of all this malarkey. But the cults of power are very, very important. But of course we do find mention of them in other areas. If we know where to look, for instance in the tarot cards, if you take out the cards of the major arcana and you look at them in order, you will find that the first four cards represent the four cults. The most early cult was called the stellar cult and that is ruled by the first card, the magician, actually showing one of the stellar cult magi. And those who are familiar with the tarot have always wondered at the, some of the meanings of these incredible symbols. The second card is, uh, shows the high priestess with her crescent moon, and that relates to the lunar cult. The uh, fifth card, if you go a little bit further on, a few down, you'll find that the hierophant, or the pope there, is a reference to the um, Saturnian cult, the, number, the card number five. And card number four, the one before that, is a reference to the emperor or the solar cult. So we have the creators of the tarot, we have the creators of one of these most powerful divination tools actually commemorating the cults of antiquity. The first cult was the one that lasted the longest and some people estimate that it lasted for almost 25,000 years. It's a very ancient cult and it's known as the Stellar Cult. As I said, the uh, next one down the line, and of course a lot of these uh, existed contemporaneously, but the next cult of great importance was the Lunar Cult. And the Lunar Cult, uh, the females, both in the Stellar and the Lunar Cult, the women, had uh, kept high office. And we'll be talking about that cult a little bit later. Then we have what is known as the Saturnian Cult. This is where Judeo-Christianity actually arises, the origins of the whole Jewish philosophy arise out of the Saturnian cult, the worship of the planet Saturn. It's one of the reasons why they worship on Saturn's day, Satur Saturday, Saturn's day. And the solar cult, which um, is now in hegemony, and which came out of the ancient world, worshiped the sun, the solar cult. And we still commemorate that cult by worshiping on the sun day. Again, if we turn to the Bible, we see the connections there. In Revelation 22, Jesus is saying in his own words, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. I'm the bright and morning star. You can't worship it. You can't mention it. You can't practice astrology. That's all meant to be you know, taboo and evil and satanic. But it's okay for Jesus to say, I'm, the, I'm, a, I'm identifying myself with the heavens, with the stars. Everyone knows the morning star is Venus or the sun. So three important things to remember at this stage about Christianity is that it originally was an occult theology, clandestine and suppressed. It was a consolidation of numerous Asian and Oriental pagan doctrines, or what we might want to call cults, in the true sense of the word, not the, the way it's being used today, that word. And outside of normal fanaticism, most of its founders and adherents had no intention of it becoming any kind of universal religion. Jordan Maxwell, in his uh, Secret Societies and Toxic Religion, gives us a presse of the whole issue of the cults. He says that the leaders of the seven great cults, because of course there was four great cults of power, but there was about seven cults in all, and we'll be dealing with that a little bit later also. Four great cults, but altogether um, seven cults were the um, origin of the modern the theocratic and religious ideas. Now he says that the leaders of these seven great cults of power 
that's the seven churches, decided that rather than fighting amongst themselves for supremacy over the ancient world, that they should combine forces. In fact, each cult feared that they could be deposed if the others conspired in concert against it. This conjunction of cults did not happen immediately or quickly. It took several centuries. The Old Testament contains the story of this coming together. The elite dynasties of these cults operate through their descendants in this world today and are extremely powerful. Alvin Boyd Kuhn refers to this coming together. He says, at the precise time at which Christianity was being formulated, okay, that's about 0 AD, we're told. I mean, we have a very specific date here. At that precise time at which Christianity was being formulated, powerful currents of economic, social, and religious forces had come into play, the operation of which precipitated a swift and drastic shifting of the center of gravity, so to say, in religious values and motivations. And what Jordan Maxwell is talking about is actually accurate in the same way as any syndicate or any corporation, any merger uh, uh, takes place, it could be through fear. It's not done for the love of humanity, it's done out of saving one's own hide. The idea that if, you, if the, your rivals all gang up together, you'll be out of business. So indignantly, but out of necessity, you congregate. You create what is known as the first conglomerate in the world. And most interesting, one of the most fascinating anecdotes brought to light is, that the, is the place of this coming together. The place of the coming together of these great cults we know today to be Israel. Israel is made up of names that derive connotatively from those cults. Israel literally comes from the words Isis, Ra, and El. And Isis was the moon goddess, Ra the sun, and El was the name of the god of the Saturnian cult, El. So Isis, Ra, and El, and their coming together, was at Israel. It's not that it was so much topographically at a certain place. What we know as Israel, that word, uh, Jacob, the concept of Israel in all of its permutations, not just a geographical location, represents this movement of coming together of some power cults. So when you say Israel, we need to stop thinking it's just about a certain place or what we've been given. It's the understanding of the coming together of great cults of power in order that they can control the trade routes, in the order to be able to control the minds of men. And they thought they could do that a lot better working in concert. Because let it be known that this kind of power that we're under today did not come about overnight. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great German philosopher and also historian, he said that the Christian church is an encyclopedia of his prehistoric cults. Tony Bushby says that the empire, Rome, gradually absorbed and adapted to its own ends the multitude of cults derived from all its parts and over the ensuing centuries coupled them together as one, the Roman Universal Church. Today it is called the Roman Catholic Church. Henceforth, much of the literature then written was aimed at propagating a fabricated faith to the world and ensuring Roman emperors were given places as heads of church and state. So you can see from that that, uh, yes, you may come together as cults, but of course one uh, potentate would just love to rule the lot. You may have a coming together of a whole um, different schools, but any kind of coming together means that one individual would love to be the head, the top dog. And of course they don't mind fighting for that position amongst themselves. Jerry Mander in his book The Four Arguments, for the elimination of television says something very interesting. He says the Hebrews emerging between 3000 and 2000 BC won an important political victory by not denouncing what they called the worship of graven images. By destroying the power of the sculptures of the Sumerians and others who preceded them, they effectively destroyed nature-based religion and the veracity of images. This made possible the substitution of an abstract single male human all-powerful God because it was a sin to create any sculpture of it, it maintained its abstract nature. Although they absorbed God, the Christians somewhat overcame this problem. They created the images of Jesus, a step backwards, or forwards, whatever way you want to look at it, towards paganism. So the Christians later decided, ah, this whole um, deb debarring of imagery, of iconography, that's not working. We need to kind of bring that in uh, to some extent. So we have the figure that modeled the image of Jesus. 
Of course, they didn't bring it in as a truth. They realized you can bring it in, but you can also manipulate that image. So even the image coming down to us out of the Bible of Jesus might also be part of this contrivance. It might not be accurate. Um, in Jeremiah 18, we have what I believe is a passage that refers to this coming together. I believe that the Bible uh, covertly talks about this unification of the cults. Let's just study this passage, for instance, and see if there is a connection, a correspondence. Jeremiah 18 says, Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter so that he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. Now, Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, one of the world's finest and most literary beings, writers, and a major occultist, the creator of the Theosophical Society, in her uh, volume, The Secret Doctrine, Volume 3, she says that sir, every scholar must be aware that there are two distinct styles, two schools, so to speak, plainly traceable in the Hebrew scriptures, the Eloistic and the Je Jehovistic. The portions belonging to these respectively are so blended together, so completely mixed up by later hands, that often all external characteristics are lost. Yet it is known that the two schools were antagonistic. Tony Bushby says, everything supernatural the presbyters wrote about their developing God could be traced to earlier religious beliefs. And Jordan Maxwell reminds us that there are 20, at least 26 translations of the Bible itself in modern days. One can get an annotated Bible with footnotes featuring 26 different translations of each passage and verse. Today you can go and get it. You can go and get a companion Bible in which each passage can be translated in 26 different ways. Jordan Maxwell says in his uh, presentation, The Dark Side of Jordan Maxwell, he says the authorized version of the Bible was called so because it was the only one that the people were allowed to read. He says it's authorized all right because you better not be caught reading any other one. King James has written it, he's published it, you better read it. It's authorized under pain of death. Now the story of the cults is again featured in the, in the uh, New Testament also, especially in the Nativity. In the Nativity, we hear the story about the birth of Jesus Christ. We find that he's visited by three wise men who bring with him three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What we have to understand is that this is a propaganda story relating to the cults. Jesus Christ, that is now worshipped on Sun's Day, was the Sun King, the Solar King, that was being worshipped by the three members of the previous cults. He's been born in Bethlehem, but he's visited by three individuals, three kings. These, this is a story representing the homage being paid to him by the three cults who've been ruling before. And as a point of homage, they bring with them the symbols of the sun, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is obvious, it's gold, like the sun, but frankincense and myrrh were the incense and the resin that was born, burned in all the uh, solar temples of the ancient world. The ancients used to love them because they were resinous and they were golden and amber-like so much so that they were even referred to as the tears of the sun. So these gifts that were being brought was a tribute to say we acknowledge that there's a new game in town here. The solar king is rising and it's going to be the new paradigm. Now the mythographers of the four cults decided to pacify each other by dividing the cycle of the year in a manner which would commemorate the deities and theocracies of each cult. Okay, so they're all getting together but they know that in order to create harmony, they're going to have to make certain allowances. So since they're all worshippers of the heavens, they're all worshippers of the stars, this is where their great original testament is, they decide to take the annual rotation of the sun and divide it and break it down into a way that would honor and commemorate each of the cults. So the year itself, that's the biggest rotation, was assigned to the solar cult, 
whose king is the sun. The next division of time, which was the month, just like the word shows you, month, mon, was assigned to the moon to uh, appease the lunar cult and, and their deity. Then the next division of time was the week. And the week, of course, is made up of seven days for the seven planets because the stellar cult worshipped the planets and the seven great gods that were the seven planets. So they get the week. That's why a week isn't just three days, ten days, fifteen days, fourteen days, six days. It's seven days. Now each cult would have additional feast days assigned to them, of course, some which would closely coincide, others which were more specific. In fact, the hands of a clock also represent these cults and their division of time. That's right. Not only on a wristwatch do you have the twelve demarcated uh, zones, but you have three hands on a clock. The hour hand for Horus, the sun, the min hand for minute, which was the ancient name of the moon, min, and the quick ticking hand, which is either for Mercury, the fastest god, or for the earth, for terrestrial time. The three hands of time. I want to emphasize again at this point that there was another little division on a timeline. It's very important to realize that if we create a timeline from, say, 25,000 years BC up until the period of the Ptolemies in Egypt, that's Alexandrian period, uh, the last of the dynasties, what we call Egypt lasted that long. It starts 25,000 years ago and comes up to the time of the invasion of the Greeks. Something incredible must have been happening in that time because we have to realize that that's a very long expanse of time. In fact, if you take every other age that came later, and I'm talking about the Alexandrian period, I'm talking about the uh, Christian period, or, or let's, uh, the Grecian period, the Hellenistic period, the Romanesque period, the Renaissance, the Christian period that came then. Uh, we move into the uh, neoclassical period, and then we have the modern age. Take it all. Multiply it by three, and still the period that we know of Egypt was longer. But just for this uh, moment in time, realize that there was another important division between these four great cults of power. As I said earlier, the stellar and the lunar cult had women as equals, and often women were the dominant uh, rulers of the, of, the, of the clans and the nations, and were in senior positions mystically, religiously, and also politically. Whereas in the Saturnian and solar cult, and this is a key point to remember, the role of women was substantially diminished. We're going to see a little bit more of that later. Now the male gods of Egypt and the pharaoh himself were ambassadors of the feminine goddess Numenon. Okay, Numenon just means presence or spiritual energy, something rare and otherworldly. So the male, the male gods, and even the pharaoh himself were merely ambassadors of that presence. The goddess was called by various names, by different cults, of course. But Hermes, Thoth, Anubis, Horus, they were all agents of balance and justice. And that was a principle known as mayat, always symbolized by a feather or, or by the great scales of justice. The Egyptian uh, historian and revisionist Mustafa Gadala, in his uh, masterpiece, Historical Deception, says that the Egyptian women were entrusted with the civilization. The woman or princess, and not the male, was the legal heir to the throne. And the man she chose to marry would become the ruling pharaoh. Now, again, I want to point out that the word pharaoh uh, means pharos nous. It comes from two Greek words. There's many, many meanings of this word, but it originated from the Greek pharos, meaning fire, and nous, meaning intelligence or mind. So it means fiery mind or enlightened mind, mind on fire. These were semi-enlightened or fully enlightened beings that were ruling their states. Unlike the stellar and lunar cults, which were ecocentric, egalitarian, and inclusive, the solar and Saturnian cults were anthrocentric, hierarchical, and exclusive. Due to their rescripting of the cosmological canon, the omnipresent goddess was made subservient to the all-powerful male god. The goddess figure was relegated to the role of consort or emanation. In many cases, the goddess was denigrated entirely into the temptress, the femme fatale, la belle dans sans merci, as they say in French, um, the seducer and waylayer of the male heroes. I mean, it goes to such an extreme that we have in the Bible uh, that Adam is the father of all mankind. Eve, the female, 
if we can get our minds around this concept, of course, which is saying something. But the idea is that Eve comes from the male, Adam, not the other way around. So twisted and convoluted this story is. Well, then, equally radical must be the act of revision. Equally dramatic and courageous must we be in order to countermand this level of uh, debauchery of an old and ancient and sacred canon. The master magician from the Victorian era, Alistair Crowley, in his book uh, Lieber 777, says that for some reason best known to themselves, the translators of the Bible have carefully crowded out of existence and smothered up every reference to the fact that deity is both masculine and feminine. They have translated the feminine plural by masculine singular, singular in the case of the word Elohim. That's right, the word God originally, Elohim, one of the earliest names for God was plural. It meant both male and female in Hebrew. But that's all right. We can flaunt that rule as well. You bring in a new game and, and that one can be destroyed also. Now this changeover, this paradigm shift between the, from the stellar to the solar has more meaning and significance than just a mere historical anecdote. It also has consequences for the psychology of human beings. We don't have time to elaborate in detail, but certain scholars are discovering that this movement, this changeover from the ecocentric matrifocal uh, paradigm into the anthrocentric one, the hegemonic one, changed the way human beings thought. Literally, we moved from a right brain type of cognition into a left brain mode of cognition. We became more rational. We became more aggressive and acquisitive in our thinking. We started to think of ourselves as being separate from nature. It had a a schizoid effect on our own consciousness. And this also needs to be taken into consideration in this study. Eric Newman, in his book on the moon and matriarchal consciousness says, the comparative passivity of matriarchal consciousness is not due to any incapacity for action, but rather to an awareness of subjection to a process in which it can do nothing, but can only let happen. It is an inner possession, realized and assimilated by the personality, but not easily discussed, for the inner experience behind it is scarcely capable of adequate verbal expression. For this reason, a plain and simple masculine consciousness finds the knowledge of matriarchal consciousness unverifiable, willful, and par excellence mystic. It isn't mystic. It's very practical. It's the most practical thing on earth. But to the viewing objective mind, that which appears to be passive, that which appears to be rooted in the being as opposed to the doing, is considered incomprehensible. Because this whole acquisitive um, mind think, this new way of uh, approaching life and approaching reality as being separate from the, the, the natural order, cannot understand the feminine approach. If you suppress the feminine in yourself, you leave yourself open to being controlled. As D. Hollander, in his book Tarot for Beginners, writes, the high priestess uses her wisdom and understanding to enable others to find their own true path. The high priest uses his power to increase his authority over others. So there you have it in a nutshell. And that pretty much also sums up the whole Gnostic idea. The Gnostics did not convert sinners. They awoke in the ready. When you're ready, you'll awaken, and it's perfectly natural. There was no idea that you were some sinner, that after you had uh, matriculated, then you know, you'd be ready to be, conver to be converted. This carried no currency whatsoever in the ancient world. And the Gnostics, uh, who are even surviving today, always let you know that man is his own priest, his own priestess. And of course, he doesn't need an outward authority. But the uh, Yahwistic side, the solar cult and Saturnian cults had a very different agenda. In Isaiah 1, we read God saying, Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with them. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. Come now and let us reason together saith the Lord. Perhaps one of the greatest scholars that mankind has ever played host to 
was the Egyptologist from Scotland, Gerald Massey. In his uh, volumes on the subject of astrotheology and the origin of all religions, he says, the retouching by the Greeks, like that of the Semites, tended to efface the figures or falsity or falsify the meaning of the mythos. And the astronomical facts are of a thousandfold more important than all the petty embellishments of irresponsible fancy. Perhaps the worst perversion of the true mythos made by the Greeks was their treatment of the polar dragon. Now that's a loaded statement and it means an awful lot. But right now just let us remember that the stellar cult and the lunar cult had as one of their great symbols the dragon or the serpent. And that one of the reasons why later animals and creatures became demonic was also part of this process of um, conversion. Now, we said that there were seven cults, four that were very powerful, but that leaves at least three other ones. And we don't have time to touch on all the cults and their history. We can only give an overview. But in brief, the other cults were the volcano cult or cult of fire. It was a very important cult of the ancient world. When you're studying the ancient mysteries, especially coming out of Africa and the Far East, you're going to see great reverence to Vulcan, to Hephaestus, to the fire god and the cult of the mountain on which this fire god is meant to be enthroned and worshipped from. And then we have a cult known as the, loosely as the mushroom cult. Um, more specifically, it's the cult of Dionysus. And then we have the cult of Venus, which involved uh, the cult of ecstasy. One of the most important of the other cults and researchers are often led to believe, rightly so, that this cult is extremely powerful in the ancient world, was the cult of Dionysus, or that the Greeks called Dionysus. Then we have uh, the mushroom cult, and the story of the mushroom cult was brought out by one of the translators of the Dead Sea Scrolls, who actually met his death, possibly because of what he found out. The great uh, Christian scholar, translator, and antiquarian John Allegro. He discovered that there was mention, much mention in the ancient Dead Sea Scrolls of this mushroom cult and its significance in the world. He discovered that uh, little traditions that we have, like wearing the little beret on our heads as a hat, comes from the time of the mushroom cult. And even the fact that in the ancient world turbans are worn and lots of different hats are to commemorate this uh, very, very powerful religious theocracy of the ancient world. And now there's a few books on this subject. But even the fact that churches have these strange domes on the top comes from a specific time and the worship of the, of the mushroom. And of course, where there's mushrooms, there's herbs. And where there's herbs, there's herbology. And the whole study of healing and uh, homeopathy and what have you in a positive and also in a negative way. And it might come as a shock to most of you to realize that the modern day pharmaceutical monopolies actually originate out of this cult of the mushroom. This mushroom cult and its understanding of pharmacology and mind altering drugs, as Jordan Maxwell and others have brought out, a lot of the pharmaceutical mendicants of the modern world, as by their symbolism they will betray to you, come out of this very powerful cult. Now the cult of Dionysus are in fact, or the, the descendants of this cult of Dionysus, are the main controllers of the modern media and of the modern rock and roll business and the music business in general. So let me be clear about what I'm saying here. The music business, especially the rock and roll business, and a lot of the media, that's the magazine design, uh, the great media conglomerates of the world, the television companies, and also the film companies, have their uh, hierarchy. They're organized in a hierarchical way, and they're controlled at the top by an elite group who are bloodline linked to a very ancient and powerful cult. Once we understand this and begin studying this particular concept, we will understand what we're seeing when we watch a lot of the symbolism and imagery and the corporate logos that these individuals use. It's not by chance that they use what they do. If you've seen the program in this series, the subversive use of sacred symbolism, 
you'll know what I mean by all of this. Now Dionysus and the cult of Dionysus are expert at being able to choose and put before us certain icons who embody, whether they realize it or not, the powers of the god of Dionysus. This cult is very adept at being able to select certain individuals who personify and allow us to worship them in the same way. And those individuals will help us awaken certain chakras. Those individuals will personify excessiveness and sexual licentiousness and liberation. And we will follow them. And this is an old cult going back to Roman times and even before. In the case of Elvis Presley, for instance, if we study his date of birth astrologically, and even if you want more proof, just go to some of the uh, autobiographies and biographies, the biographies that are on uh, the king of rock and roll, the Solar King, you will find out just how much um, control from secret societies was being used in this man's life, unbeknownst to him. But he's certainly not the only example. And unfortunately also what we have to understand is that the cult of Dionysus are wont to sacrifice their solar king. Sacrifice is a very important aspect to all rituals and all ancient religions. All religions of the ancient world, including the Christian, involve the principle of sacrifice. The sun rises uh, in the morning from the horizon, rises to its peak, and then descends into the underworld where it has to face the shadows that it inherited while it uh, was blazing. The stronger a light shines, the deeper and darker the shadow that it casts. And in this great cycle is understood by these cults. The sun must go into the underworld in order to face uh, its own demons and to traverse the underworld. These are all occult principles. And therefore, that also means that uh, the sun king might be sacrificed. And if we study the dates of a lot of assassinations in this world and get into that whole theory, we're going to find an incredible story unfolding there. It's very important for us to be able to decode some of the symbolism that uh, certain bands, certain groups, and certain media cartels are using. This is a whole subject in itself, and of course we go into that in a different program. But safe it is to say that there is an origin to the symbolism and to the, the words and the titles and the meanings. And the cult of Dionysus, who is who are behind the World Psychedelic Institute. Now the World Psychedelic Institute, in point of fact, was created in London in 1965 by Michael Hollings Head, who was also an associate of Timothy Leary and Aldous Huxley. One might be interested to read The Saucer Full of Secrets, which is the biography of the band Pink Floyd and how that band had to resist this kind of takeover, but that they were approached, and a lot of these bands are sequestered or approached uh, after the point of their creation, or some bands and some uh, figures within the musical business are promoted from day one. They literally are bloodline created to the unofficial families of these cults. And they're put out on the world stage for a reason. Many of the pop icons are born to elites, but are raised in unofficial families, and then when the time is right, they are put before the world via the media. And we're given the rags to riches, girl or boy next door story. However, they may have blood ties to royal dynasties. Some know this, and some do not. So some of the people who may be bloodline connected to these royal dynasties or these old ancient cults may not be aware of it. Some are privy to it, others may not be privy to it. Depends on the individual. And I'm not saying that every single figure out there is a member of this cult. It's of course a whole issue that's quite problematic to be able to discern. It's a study, like any other study, one must decode and in order to decode it, you must have familiarity with these cults and how they work. You must know what their code words are, their catchphrases, their symbols. They will tell you who they are, but you have to be able to decode the symbolism. Why is it that Madonna's first video is made in Venice? Why are so many videos and films set in Venice? Why does she wear the crucifix? What do some of the lyrics mean? One of the other important cults was the cult of Venus. Uh, the, the ancient cults worship Venus a lot. Uh, the names of the place Venice and Vienna, certain cities of the world are actually named after Venus. On the prow of the old navigator ships in the ancient world, the great navigators of the high seas used to have the Stella Maris, or the ladies, the, the head, the prow. They would have the figure of the female, 
because navigators worshipped the stars and thought of Venus as their guiding star. And ships were always referred to as her or she. And they're shaped in the, in the form of the vesica Pisces, which relates to the female. And they float on the waters, which also represent the female. There's a lot of symbolism involved in shipping and navigation. And the tutelary deity that uh, all seamen of the ancient world worshipped was the star Venus. And there's a cult of Venus operating in the world. Uh, the James Bond films, for instance, uh, as I was mentioning in Atlantis, Alien Visitation and Genetic Manipulation, the 007s go back to the Tudor dynasty. It's not just a work of fiction here. In fact, in the uh, James Bond movies, one of the most important motifs in that is the use of code words like M and Q. And you'll notice that when the protagonist, the James Bond figure, comes in to get his orders, he very specifically comes from a hall into a small chamber where the female sits behind the desk. And then from that small chamber, he goes into another larger chamber through a secret door or passage that leads to a bigger chamber with a male sitting behind the door. This replicates the interior of the Great Pyramid. And the pyramid, of course, is very sacred to Freemasons and Illuminati. There's a message in these films, secret codes that are being given to us to replicate something from the ancient world that we are not educated to be able to see. But there's a method involved in, that, in those series of movies and in many, many others. The, a lot of the uh, pornographic magazines contain symbolism that shows their origins, relating back to the cult of Venus and this incredible um, favoritism towards the blonde, down from the earliest times of Hollywood right up to the present day, the cult of the blonde. And of course, let it, those who've done their homework in this fascinating subject understand that the cult of Venus and the cult of Dionysus are involved in the, uh, not only the dissemination of pornography but also involved very heavily in white slave trafficking and opium dealing and uh, satanic ritual abuse and child prostitution and what have you. This is slowly coming to light but this is an old story going back many thousands of years. It's also very important to realize that none of this is covert. Uh, these individuals will always put the symbols in front of you if you know how to track it. Even certain movies are made to reveal the agenda, and to let you know who's making what and who's doing what. Movies like The Eye of the Devil and The Green Door and Eyes Wide Shut and many, many other movies from different genres contain uh, motifs that if you know how to decode them are very significant. And the patron, these individuals that we're talking about, a lot of these uh, cults, are also patronized. They have to have finances. They have to have an agenda. And one of the most powerful dynasties that uh, make up these cults and also patronize these cults are what we know as the Venetians coming out of Italy. The Venetians were originally the Phoenicians, the worshippers of Venus. And in Atlantis, Alien Visitation and Genetic Manipulation, we show the ancestry of the Phoenicians and how they go back to pre-Diluvian times, even to the time of Atlantis and the high cultures of the ancient, ancient world. But the Phoenicians becomes the Venetians of Italy, the Longhi and the Guelphs and other very wealthy families. Are, their descendants are still occupying the world today. But of course the Venetians after their conflict with the powers of uh, the Roman Catholic Church made a move from Venice and settled in Holland and eventually came to England. Upon their move to Holland the black Venetians, and this is the name that they go by, the black Venetians created the great Amsterdam bank, the financial hinge of the 17th century and they created the Dutch in East India Company. They also control the finances of many royal dynasties like the Stuarts. They are actually the promoters of Martin Luther, of Protestantism, Puritanism, the Jesuits, the Club of Rome, the later Freemasons and most secret societies. Through the House of Hanover, that's the House of Orange, they came to England and have been dominating there. They've been the dominating power since William III of Orange. This is William III of Orange, known in, in Ireland as King Billy, uh, the, des the destroyer of the Stuart dynasties. And after him came uh, George Ludwig I, all of the House of Hanover. But the House of Hanover originates from the Venetian line, through the Habsburgs, through the Hohenzollerns, all the way back to Venice and beyond. Queen Victoria, in her time, was the head of the Black Guelphs, called black because their deeds were so black. Literally the queen, the empress of the world. And the Windsor family of today, the, the, the modern royals ruling out of England. The Windsors is a name concocted for them today primarily because King George, the, the father, 
of the Queen of England couldn't barely speak a word of English and yet here they are declaring war on Germany and they're a German family reigning from London. So as part of the propaganda, the name Windsor was concocted for them. But just realize that their actual names are Saxe Coburg, Battenberg, later changed to Mount Batten, Bourse Lyon and Guelph, with Guelph being the most important name. If you're into studying this, please note the name Guelph, G-U-E-L-P-H. That's the connection back to Venice. There's two great students of this, um, along with Jordan Maxwell. One is uh, the statesman from America, Lyndon LaRouche, who's done some fine work on this in his book, Dope Incorporated. This is uh, the book that uh, uh, put him two years in the federal stockade for what he knew. And also the works of Dr. John Coleman, who wrote The Committee of 300 uh, and uh, Diplomacy by Deception and also One World Order. Dr. John Coleman, an insider who reveals the origin of these cults. If we go back to the symbolism of the stellar cult, we find that these were the original magi, the original architects, the original astrologers, the original navigators. In my work on this subject, I have pointed out many times that these are the original originators of the high geometry, the high, all of the great buildings, monuments, temple structures uh, of the world. They're also the creators of our um, divination arts, principally, and also a lot of the folk tales and fairy stories, and also the idea of teaching great mysteries in, uh, in the way of a parable or an allegory is also part of their legacy. They are those who watch their flocks by night. In the Bible, we hear that term, watching the flocks by night. Well, the shepherds who watch their flocks by night are nothing but the magi, who, astrologers who watch their flocks by night, the heavenly flocks, the stars. In the tarot, as I said, the first card of the tarot, which shows a magician, is a throwback to the stellar cult, that little symbol that you see above the head of the magician and that you also see in card number eight, represents the zodiac. It's called the Lemnascate. In Celtic tradition, one of the earliest poets of Ireland, the precusor to Merlin, was called Avergahane, or in English you pronounce it Amergan. And he says, who but I knows the ages of the moon, the resting place of the sun. Again, clearly demonstrating that they were stellar cult. Now the primary symbol of the stellar cult, as I said a little earlier, was the serpent, which you see being worn by the pharaohs. It's often called the Uraeus or the Agatho diamond. Agatha diamond just meaning the winged serpent or the uh, guardian angel. This is where we get the word Holy Spirit from, Agatho diamond or Agatho daemon. And of course, the ancient antagonism in the Christian um, hegemony of the evil serpent and that the, the solar king has to come out and defeat the dragon or the serpent. I mean, where did these motifs come from? Do we ever stop and think, uh, why, what on earth is that all about? And where did that symbol come from? And of the many symbols and motifs that you can have, what is this whole thing about having to slay a dragon? Well, it's propaganda again. It's pulpit propaganda. One cult supplanting another. One cult taking the power from another cult appropriating the wisdom and the uh, technologies and the methodologies of a previous cult. We have the old rivalries between, in, even in Egypt, in the latter days of Egypt, the old stellar king Set becomes the antagonist of the later sun god Horus. In order to, in order to show you the conflict, they say that they're twins. They're all born in the same family, but they're antagonists. We have to read between the lines and, and see what's being said here. In Irish mythology, we hear about St. Patrick going up to the high mountain and then coming down and saying, Behold, I've cast out the serpents from the land. And of course, the reference here, as we clearly demonstrated in Atlantis, alien visitation and genetic manipulation, is again that the serpents is not a physical snakes. This is a, another piece of propaganda. St. Patrick represents the solar cult who is coming to take over, and the serpents being the previous Celtic races there who worship the stars and the earth and the waters, they are now history. They're being suppressed, so they're being cast out. The serpent race is being cast out. But we have mentioned in the Bible to the serpents and the wisdom of the serpents when Jesus remonstrates with his own disciples and says, be ye as wise as serpents. Yes, that's right. Be as wise as the serpents. 
What serpents? Well, he's referring to the fact that if only you were as wise as those great astrologers, navigators, and geomancers of old, the serpent race. If only you, twelve, were as wise as they, then I, I'd be happy. Because the Christ is aware of the power and wisdom of the stellar cult, the original Magi. In Celtic Ireland, we have tremendous emphasis on the serpent motif, even in Christian era. On many flags, we still see the dragon of the stellar cult being commemorated. They're all throwbacks. In Tara, the very capital city, Tara, in Gaelic means, it comes from the word drum cane, meaning the hill of the serpents, because the kings were serpent race, and they sat on the hill of the serpents. We find that there's a Judaic tribe called the Nashon, for which King David was a member. But we find that this word means serpent. The word Nashon means serpent. And that's where we get the modern word nation. N-A-T-I-O-N means serpent. So we'll just remember that when you hear people talking about the great nation states. Understand that that is a word that has a very ancient history. Thousands of years old, going back to the original Nashons. From the earliest days of Akkadia and Sumeria and Babylon, we see the serpent and the serpent gods. In Egypt, the winged serpents. In Greece, we find that uh, Pythagoras, the keeper of the mysteries, one of the wisest men of all times. The word Pythagoras is, means I am the python. I am the python. I am the serpent. And H.P. Blavatsky says in her Isis Unveiled, she says, Pythagoras never allowed his neophytes to see him during the years of probation, but instructed them from behind a curtain in his cave. We have a Scottish regiment known as the Dragoons. We have the dragon court of the Plantagenets. These uh, fine standing stones and the ancient megaliths are known colloquially and locally as the dragon's teeth because it was understood by the locals that they were built by the serpent cult. In the United States at the Ohio Mound, it betrays the same illusion that uh, the ancients were a stellar cult who worshipped the constellations and who were responsible for the great earthworks. The Avebury Serpent, practically eight miles long. In Christianity, we often hear about the cherubim and the seraphim. But what we don't hear about is the meaning of those two words. If you decode and go back to an old concordance and look up the words seraphim and cherubim, it will mean fiery serpent or blazing serpent. So the angels are serpents. And many words again. In etymology, a fascinating subject we find that the earliest name for the serpent was Cain, or Canaan. So, the land of Canaan, that's right, the land of the Akkadians, the land where it all began, the Holy Land, is known before the Hebrews get there as the land of Canaan, the Canaanites, the Canaanites who were murdered and suppressed. The evil ones who worshipped uh, idols. No, just the serpent cult, whose time is to be murdered and massacred now because the solar cult has arrived, or the Saturnian cult is in town. And the word Cohen, Ask any Jewish person what the word Kohen means, and they will tell you that it means serpent priest. The word Cain, or the word Khan, like in James Khan. In the Far East we have Chan, but Chan means serpent. In the Middle East we have Khan, K-H-A-N, like we would say mister, it's a title for a male, Khan. The word Khan refers to the serpent. In Ireland you have the boy's name, Kieran. You have the female, or the girl's name, Karen. And Karn, the word for death, but actually really means the serpent. So in Egypt, every time you see a god with the stars about their head or with a headdress of stars, just realize what is being mentioned here. This is a member of the stellar cult. They're implying that there is a cult of power and gods to be worshipped. We don't have to look very far for this motif. The Statue of Liberty is a stellar cult icon that goes back to Seshet, uh, the old Egyptian goddess. It was just shown exactly like that. With star in her, uh, star, seven rays in her crown. The uh, subject of astrology comes down to us from the stellar cult. They are the ones who brought us the study of astronomy and astrology. They understood that the sun rose at the vernal equinox, rose to its highest position at the summer solstice, and then 
fell into winter at the autumn equinox and that particular arch was revered and it was called the Northern Arch and to commemorate it and because the stellar cult were great builders they would build arches in all the cities of the world and still today when we build an arch or we create an arch that comes from the commemoration of an astrological motif the Northern Arch the Sun passing over the zodiac and that's why in the middle of arches you have the keystone which usually has a date on it because the date has to do with zodiological degrees that the Sun passes through and the stellar cults um, main deity or one of the earliest deities was Nuth the heavenly mother the goddess of the night sky the primordial Madonna they were fixated on this idea of the earth being the terrestrial father the red king that you see in chess but the stellar mother or white queen you have Guinevere and you have Arthur Guinevere literally means white queen that's all it means and it's a reference to Isis but Isis is a reference to the moon the white queen up there in the heavens and the red king is guess who the sun so thrones were put beside each other red and white uh, male and female Leo and Cancer they were fixated on the idea of bringing heaven to earth they didn't see a separation between the terrestrial and the celestial and so when they would build their monuments their castles their temples their universities their cities it was absolutely fundamental that none of that building could ever begin without honoring the stars and then even encoding into these structures symbols of the stars which is why if you go to the Arc of Triumph or you go to uh, most of the universities of the world and study them actually look at the walls and the stained glass windows and the floors and the mosaics of even quite modern buildings and not to mention the city layouts you will see stars and emblems of the heavens this is an old practice we, uh, we know from just looking and studying the ancients that they were fascinated with the stars and the heavens they were fascinated with geometry the measurement of the earth and the measurement of the stars in fact the word geometry means that the measurement of the goddess Gaia or the earth so they understood that in order to honor their gods they should pay attention to them that there was movements in the heavens that there was a math mathematical forms of communication and that you weren't a proper disciple of your God unless you paid attention to the nuances and subtleties that were happening around you in the heavens this is where astrology was born the meter the Greek God literally means the same thing the earth measuring the earth we get words like matter and matrix and mother and mathematics and marriage and mate all coming out of the word mayat which was the most ancient of the goddesses the goddess of balance and the goddess of measurement of the Egyptians as I said Freemasons and secret societies keep these mysteries the very Freemasonic symbol is a mere simulacra the symbol of the compass and the rule is a geometric version of the Egyptian Nuth and Jeb the earth god Jeb copulating merging with the sky goddess Nuth Freemasonry originates from the stellar cult they are the present keepers of the mysteries of the stellar cult the stellar cult's philosophy can be summed up very simply no difference between psychic energy and physical energy incomprehensible yes they knew what two was if you put down two stones they'd understand there's two things there but they had no understanding of what we know as duality there was no word for duality there was only one thing to be studied there was a, no separation between macrocosm and microcosm everything was unified everything was a holarchy they tried to show this in the way they lived they tried to commemorate this in the building of Stonehenge and in the villages that were circular and of course we all know about the intense and, uh, and detailed geometry that went into some of these uh, monuments and cyclopean ruins that's a whole study in itself but even again in modern context cities are based on the zodiac here's the center of Paris with 12 radiating streets and Paris is not the only example though we may have the solar cult attempting it at later stages the solar cult in their buildings are borrowing or appropriating this the geometrical standards and skills of an earlier cult yes we do have those skills today but where did they come from the seven wonders of the world and many more wonders besides are, the, are, are originate in a certain cult of ancient times not just centered in Egypt 
Every culture, including even the Viking and the Celtic and the Maya, and even in Africa, you have the stellar representatives of the, of the stellar cult. When we hear the simple term city hall, do we realize that that comes from somewhere? The word city comes from cetus, which is the word in Latin for the female vagina or the female opening. And the word hall is a derivation of the, of the Latin phallus, which is the male member, the phallic. So city hall literally is again the coming together of the male and the female. Remember we were talking about terrestrial and celestial. These um, cities were made like a circle and then you would have a obelisk in the center or a fountain in the center or a clock tower in order to transmit terrestrial events and symbolism to earth. And then the city hall, which was the center of all civic society, would be called the cetus and the hall, the phallic and the, the male and the female coming together. City Hall. Jerusalem lies at the center of all medieval maps. The most sacred place is this most holy city and was the supposed site of Jesus' own burial, the church of, holy, of the Holy Sepulcher. So again, all holy places, whether they're of the ancient world or the new one, embody certain motifs. And I have to emphasize that this is not something of the ancient past. Cities of the modern world uh, are done this way. In Ireland, we have uh, the oldest temple site in the world. So thousands of years before the pyramid, we have a place in Ireland called Brookneboyne, or in English, it's New Grange. And it sits on the river known as the Boan. That's why it's called the Brookneboyne. Boan was the cow goddess, and the river Boan was her river. So there's the whole idea of the, the female again, that near the river is this most ancient of tombs. But what's remarkable about this tomb is its geometry. It was built and fashioned by the stellar cult. It's a complete enigma. It was built uh, without cement. And what's more astounding is that on the 21st, 22nd and 23rd of December, that's the, the winter solstice, the sun rises on the horizon and then like something out of Indiana Jones literally creeps across and touches a very small window in New Grange above the door of this immense tomb. There's a little portal, a window, seven feet high, and the sun, a beam of light, will pass into this uh, window and then go into the inner chamber and fall on the back wall. America, uh, many American scholars like Arthur C. Clarke have gone and, and looked at this and checked this out. And even though the heavens have shifted in many thousands of years, this event still takes place mysteriously. They can't understand how this building was designed. The light pierces the inner chamber on those three days and on the, on the same night, the solstice nights, the moonlight will do exactly the same thing. And our, this is not the only example of this. There are many uh, tombs in Ireland and in Celtic countries where this uh, anomaly takes place. Or they might do it in a different way. You might have the phallic tower, representing the male phallic, on the mound or the hill. Let's not forget we have a, in Christianity the Mount of Olives. We have the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, we've got the male sun god, the phallic, ithyphallic male, standing there giving a sermon, but let's not forget where he's doing it. Don't we understand there's paganism involved here? That by, he's not doing a uh, sermon in the throne, he's not a sermon in the city center, a uh, sermon, sermon um, at the top of a castle turret, a uh, sermon on a horseback. It's sermon on the mount. Another feature that harkens back to the stellar cult specifically is the idea that the interior of churches have the dome, the celestial dome or the domos representing the night sky and the heavens. But again, the idea that not just in city centers but uh, different parts of the famous cities, we always have uh, the clock tower. Now this uh, clock dial is usually so far up in the sky that you can't even see it to tell what time it is. So it's an archi architectural motif alone. And that is to represent the same idea we've been talking about. And that's why the dome, the spires are like this. They're shaped like that because it's transmitting celestial energy down to the terrestrial. Because the ancient creators of cities understood this, that there is a symbiosis between the heavenly and the earth. Just as in a human being's life, his fate is connected to some zodiac out there, so the whole of the fate of mankind, the fate of those 
who live on earth in the communities of the world also is written in the heavens. We see these uh, architectural masterpieces and we know subconsciously we're attracted to it, we know it's beautiful, but we have consciously forgot why. And as I said, this is again to be understood as not something of remote history. This is something of the modern age today. David Ovison, an American writer in his book The Secret Architecture of Our Nation's Capital, has discovered that in Washington, D.C., for instance, there are 23 complete zodiacs in Washington in the, in the architecture, secreted into the architecture there. And there's over a thousand other zodiacal and planetary symbols. And there's four zodiacs in London. London is also divided into 28 boroughs representing the lunations of the moon. There's not a single building in uh, England of any importance that's not built over some Celtic site of the previous stellar and lunar cult. Those who've studied this subject know that. But Ovison and other researchers are now discovering that the secret societies like the Freemasons, for whatever purposes, have designed the cities meticulously to not only uh, align with certain constellations, but to commemorate certain stars like the star Sirius and Draco and Alpha Draconis and the Pole Star and the Bear, Ursa Major, so on. However, we've got to realize that uh, there was mistakes were also made in this transposition. Cyril Fagan, in his book Astrological Origins, says that in their desire to appear highly intellectual, scientific and mathematical, the Greeks probably about the time of Alexander the Great adopted the solar nomenclature, thereby turning ancient zodiacal symbolism topsy-turvy and making it sheer nonsense. This must be borne in mind uh, very deeply that when we're even researching and studying this subject and when we come upon things that don't quite make sense, this can help you to realize that, yes, you're studying this here, but we have the Greeks and the Romans and the you know, medieval period, we've got the Christians, and all of these individuals take the ancient gnosis, but they twist it and contort it and subvert it. And therefore it's a process. This is what this program is dedicated to, is trying to help you in this decoding process so that you may get back to the original theology. Theology is very important for our lives. Mythology is very important for our lives. Spirituality is, but not the one that's been handed down to us, uh, sanitized and homogenized and corrupted and subverted, this package that we just you know, buy, uh, buy and install. There's a much more ancient one, and we need to get back to that as we come full circle in today's world. Now, I've already made mention uh, in the early part of this program about the fact that the Bible still does contain many enigmatic phrases and passages that uh, allude to what we are talking about in terms of the ancient cults. Now, in John 14, we also read one of these most enigmatic passages. It says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, Jordan Maxwell has pointed out in his uh, work that this term like many passages in the Bible, have just blatantly misinterpreted. I mean, obviously, we should realize that it's impossible to have many mansions in a house. But you could have many rooms in a house. You could have many uh, compartments of a house. You could have many houses in the sky, like in the zodiac. Could the mansion be the heavens, the dome of the heavens, the great theater of the mysteries? And within that theater, that great mansion, there could be many houses. Well, that's, in our belief, what that passage actually refers to. It refers to the zodiac and the houses there. It refers to the girdle of Isis, the, gir the girdle of the goddess Nuth. We understand that the 12 tribes of Israel, there's the number 12, is another um, allusion to the zodiac. And, and the Hebrews had a wall, great and high, and had 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels, and names were written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And anyone who knows anything about Hebrew astrology or the tribes of Israel know that all the symbols of the tribes of Israel were the astrological signs. Rabbis admit this. There's books on Hebrew astrology showing you that you not only have 12 tribes, but the symbols of each of the tribes of Israel are astrological symbols. 
and they were great worshippers of uh, certain feast days throughout the year. And well, when it comes to the number 12, we're in a whole uh, incredible subject there. We got not only the 12 signs of the zodiac, the 12 hours, the 12 months. At Catholic confirmation is at age 12, the ceremony to represent full circle of the zodiac. You have a confirmation ceremony. We've got jury members with the judge, the magistrate being the 13th member representing the occult 13th sign of the Zodiac. We've got the 12 patriarchs of Israel, the 12 brothers of Joseph, the 12 stages of the underworld process in Egypt. We've got 12 stages of the mummification process. A very rigorous idea there in mummification that you should have 12 stages. Egypt itself was divided into 12 provinces, one for each of the signs of the Zodiac. In the primal conflict between Set and Osiris, when Osiris is finally killed, we find that he's cut up into 12 pieces the body of the hero. Twelve stones is what Moses erects for the tribes. Arthur had twelve knights. Balder in Scandinavian mythology had twelve judges. Odysseus had twelve companions. Romulus, twelve shepherds. Roland in French, a troubadour tradition, had twelve peers. Jacob had twelve sons. Hrolf in, Dan in the Danish myths had twelve berserkers. There's twelve Aesir, that's the god of the high Teutons. In the octave we have twelve notes. And in the brain, we have 12 cranial nerves. We'll come back to that later on. But Jesus and his 12 helpers is the most common one to people, the apostles. But again, we have a message here. Um, if you actually look at the symbolic way that this was communicated to us by the artists, like Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the other medieval and mannerist painters, we'll notice something very interesting. In Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, for instance, we understand that we have Jesus at the Last Supper, and we understand that Jesus is the Son. But if you actually examine this uh, remarkable painting closely, you'll find something enigmatic. The Twelve are not just loosely grouped around the Son, around Jesus Christ. There's a pattern to them. They're in groups of three. And those groups of three represent the seasons. They represent the zodiological signs, but the zodiological signs are, of course, aligned with the months. So the group on the far left, and each group is only speaking to itself. They're all communicating only to themselves. So let's say that summer, autumn, winter, uh, and spring, spring, autumn, summer, winter, whatever way you want to look at it, that's what we're seeing as the real theme in uh, this fine painting. The 12, but the actual divisions of the seasons because we understand that in the center is the Christ, the enlightened one, the Son, who will come again. That means he'll go round and round and round, right? Only to come again every day in the diurnal cycle and also in the zodiacal cycle of the year. When you see the great temples and cathedrals, churches of the world, you'll always notice the 12 panes of the rose windows. Again, a commemoration to the stellar cult. The idea of the round table of ancient times they sat at a round table to emphasize that the real round table was up above your head, was literally the zodiac. And we turn to the Celtic calendar, we find the heart of the stellar and lunar paradigm. Not only do you find the 12 or occasionally 13 signs, but we also find that these um, signs were related to Earth. Each of the signs of the zodiac were not so much given an animal. Um, motif as they are today, they were assigned to the 12 trees. So the idea of the tree of life being a very important motif and also connecting to the earth. The worship of the trees was an original zodiac. When we study the Celtic uh, seasonal cycle, we find the, the great feast days, which were later uh, transfigured or transposed into some of the modern holidays. If you've read any of the fine books on this subject or researched this subject, uh, Robert Graves and uh, Caitlin Matthews, lots of books out there on the subject, you'll start to understand a couple of things, and that is that the calendar was changed, it was altered from a stellar to a solar-centric one. Uh, that uh, We have different stories going on. The calendar year's opening date was artificially also changed that the saints' days were merely superimposed upon more ancient sidereal festivals. And the most important one is that there was a supplantation 
of the feminine principle. There was the masculinization of the deities and the iconic symbols. That, that last one there is an entire subject in itself that I deal with uh, more elaborately in the other program in the series called Divination and the Goddess Tradition. This whole idea of the masculinization and slow subversion of the feminine principle, which in turn has uh, horrific ramifications for human consciousness and for gender uh, relations and so on. Now David Duncan in his book The Calendar says that from the beginning the Roman calendar was a powerful political tool that governed religious holidays, festivals, market days and constantly changing schedules of days when it was legal to conduct judicial and official business in the courts and governments. The inaccurate calendar played havoc not only with the farmers and sailors but also with the population becoming more dependent than ever on trade, commerce, law and civil administration in a rapidly growing empire that desperately needed a standard system of measuring time. So what uh, David Duncan is telling us is that we were not just given a, a set of time, a calendar, which is of course needed, we were given this hybrid, this concoction that was so off the wall that the ancient people found it very confusing. Um, scholars like Joseph Campbell have always mentioned anyway that the very language of the Bible is a mercantile language. He brought that out. Many have noticed this because yes, there was a paradigm shift when the Saturnian and the solar cult are becoming dominant. It's less and less and less to do about your empowerment and uh, religion and true worship of God. No, it's got more to do with subjugation. Of course the calendar had to be changed because we're not meant to be worshipping nature. We're not meant to be worshipping and believing in the real. We were meant to be dumbed down and in total servitude. And one of the best ways to do that was to subvert time and to subvert the calendar. But evidences of the stellar cult are to be found on all the flags of the world. Children always remark, uh, why are these stars on these flags? The, even from childhood you notice that. Yes, well, why indeed? Why would the flags of nations have this motif so prevalent all over the world, the stars, even the European Union's flag has 12 stars representing the zodiac. We've got rising suns, we've got crescent moons, we've got stars. Well, the reason is what we're telling you here, that the whole idea is that when you realize that all the modern establishments and institutes and paradigms come out of the stellar and solar and lunar cult, now we can understand why we see these motifs. The California flag of America. Everyone thinks it shows the grizzly bear and, and uh, the red star, and yet it does not. This is yet another cryptic device. What it refers to is the bear, yes, but it's the bear up there. The red star is the pole star around which moves Ursa Major, the bear. What you're actually seeing on the California flag is nothing less than an astro-theological motif disguised to look like something else. Now the Egyptians, unlike us today, did not open their year at uh, December 21st or January 1st or even where astrologers are wont to think of the beginning of the zodiac, which is Aries. No, their year opened in the sign of Virgo, which in those days, because of processional movement of the heavens, was around July 20th, 25th. is when the Nile started to rise and the flood waters began to rise. That was around about the period uh, when Sirius, the star, was high in the sky around the July 20th and 25th. Uh, the season, and that was the, s the sun would rise into the constellation or sign of Virgo. And a Virgo is of course the sign of the Virgin, which has always been depicted for ancient, ancient times as the female, the female goddess or the female queen, the beautiful Virgin, Virgo. Well, of course, naturally, if the year for the Egyptians opened in Virgo, then like ours, we have 12 seasons, 12 months to go through until the year closes. And the year will close, logically, in the sign before Virgo. And the sign before uh, Virgo, just pick up a coffee table book on astrology or log, log on to the internet and look up, and you'll see that the sign that comes before Virgo is Leo the Lion. Leo the Lion was then the closing of the year. So that is why you have a sphinx, because it is the head of the Virgin and the tail of a lion, meaning in one symbol. And this is the way the ancients did things, so beautifully, so figuratively. The idea is that the head of the female looks out to the horizon, her gaze follows the whole earth, which is circular, and comes back to the body of the lion. It is simply a symbol of the zodiac. It's a symbol of the zodiac in sandstone standing 66 feet high. And all it is to tell you is that we were astrologers. We were the Magi. So the first sign of the zodiac, Virgo. 
the sign of the Virgin. The last sign of the zodiac, Leo. Put them together and you've got the Sphinx. Virgo was the female, the Virgin, holding the sheaf of wheat. Now the sun entered the sign of Virgo around July 25th. Upon entering this female sign, the ancient cosmologist said that the sun, that's the son of God, the heavens, was born again, born of a virgin. That's where that term comes from. The Christian idea of being born of a virgin, one of the meanings of it, there are many, but in the stellar cult, it was the idea that the son of God was now being born in the sign of the virgin or of a virgin. When the Sphinx was constructed, its visage even faced that part of the horizon where the constellations of Leo and Virgo rose at nightfall. So this face, the eyes were looking to the horizon, but at night, Virgo and Leo would rise right in front of the eyes of the Sphinx. Now because the beginning of this zodiacal belt was in Virgo, the zodiac was called the Girdle of Isis, the virgin goddess. She was the prototype of Mary. The son of Isis was Horus. Mary's son was Jesus. Horus was the basis of the Christ myth. His name meant light or sun. And that's where we get the word horizon or the zone of Horus. And we also get hours from his name. And that's right. Horus's zone, that's the zone of the sun. When the sun rises on the horizon, it's the zone of Horus, the sun god. The horizon. The old word for prayers in the Shakespearean era was horizons. And we all know that we turn to the east Cultures still do this. You turn to the east to say your prayers, your horizons. Why do you turn to the east? Because the sun is going to rise there. You worship the sun. It's a solar cult. And Horus, you just have to turn two of the letters around and you get ours, H-O-U-R-S. Because they used to say, to take the time, where is Horus now? Where is the golden falcon now? Meaning, what hour of the day is it? What Horus of the day is it? We even tell our children to be as good as gold meaning be as good as the golden one, Horus. You are our youngster. A child is known as a young star. Like Horus was the youngster of Isis and Osiris. So just remember, when you hear that term, born of a virgin, think astrology. But again, we're being told this. You only have to look at the symbolism. Once you've opened your right brain, you're using your whole mind, you've learned some pattern recognition, you'll find that nothing's being concealed from you. Mother Mary with a sun above her head and the crescent moon under her feet. We have it in the corporate logos of today, Columbia Pictures. The Virgin with the sun gleaming behind her back or the, holding the great uh, torch. Literally, the sun in Virgo. What you're seeing in that logo is nothing more than an astrological motif. And if you've seen subversive, the subversive use of sacred symbolism, we go into this very much and show how so many corporate logos um, date from this or come from this idea of the movement of the sun through the constellations. The original Madonna, born of a virgin. The solar cult get hold of this and they move things around. Uh, Horus suddenly becomes more aligned with the sun, yes, but more aligned with, say, Aries. And Jesus holding the Lamb of God. Everyone knows the Lamb or the Ram is the, sun, the sign of Aries. So they move the Son of God away from Virgo and move it to a new place, a new identification. And that can be okay to do in some respects, but it's what the mythographers do every age. They change the symbolism. Once upon a time, the bull was worshipped and the cow goddess. That represents Taurus, the bull. Later on, the ram. Egypt's filled with the ram symbols because that's Aries. As the sun moves, the mythologies change. So the pyramid and the sphinx and many of the other tombs and temples, structures, are patently astronomical and astrological. And even when you render or see the Sphinx rendered, you'll notice that it also has wings or it might have claws or it might have scales. It has the head of a woman, it has the tail of a dragon or a lion. Again, that just represents the four corners, the, the four coming together, the wings and the claws and the body of a lion, the cardinal points of the zodiac. Now to make astronomy and astrology possible, that is to have a science or an art of astrology or astronomy, there are three basic celestial cycles or movements that must be taken into account. The first is the rotation of the Earth around the Sun. Okay, so that's a rotation we're talking about. There's three different kinds of rotation that make the science of astrology possible. There's the movement of the Earth around the Sun. Then we have the rotation of the Earth on its own axis. Okay, that's another 
movement of circular movement on its own axis, the Earth will revolve. Then we have the slow wobble of the axis of the Earth as it turns. So we've got the movement of the Earth as it turns, but it doesn't just turn perfectly tholeiform, perfectly straight. It wobbles, and you'll notice this if you have a spinning top or a gyroscope, you'll notice that it has a wobble effect on the axis. Now these three celestial motions were known in the ancient world and are absolutely central. And they were commemorated in many logos and symbols, especially those you see on churches and ancient motifs. Now due to the wobble of the axis of the earth, the sun, moon, planets and constellations appear to move backwards through the twelve signs. The sun takes 2,160 years to traverse one sign of 30 degrees, moving one degree every 72 years. The entire cycle lasts 25,920 years. This round is known by astrologers and astronomers as the precession of the equinoxes. So this is, a, this is getting a little deeper into the subject of astrology. There are 12 signs of the zodiac and the sun moves backwards through them. Of course, when it moves backwards, we, we see from our Earth as if the constellations are moving the other direction, okay? So it's just a matter of uh, parallax view and perspective. But the sun, every day, in fact, every morning that you go out and the sun rises, same thing every year. Every year at the vernal equinox when the sun rises in the spring, the ancients realized that it's moving slightly eastern, eastward every time. Just a few degrees or minutes of arc. It does not rise every morning or every year in the same place on the um, horizon. Charted over time, they realized that to go through a sign of 30 degrees, right? all signs of the zodiac are 30 degrees, for the sun to rise at the different spots in just one sign takes 2,160 years. That's 72 years to move one degree. So it moves one degree in the average lifespan of a man. This is very important to occultists, the idea that lifespan of the human is connected to this uh, movement of the sun. But to go through all the 12 signs of the zodiac takes 25,920 years. That's called the Great Cycle or the Platonic Cycle. There's different names for it. And generally, uh, astrologers and astronomers know this, and they call it the precession of the equinoxes. But we want to show you how important that is to the un, uh, unveiling of the mysteries of religion. Now, we have a thing called the horoscope of the Earth. I'm sure a lot of you have gone and had your astrology chart done. It's a fascinating thing to have happen. Now, we look at our chart and the astrologer will tell us, oh, this is your rising sign and this is your sun sign and so on. Well, the, the Earth itself has a chart. You couldn't have astrology without the Earth. I mean, we're all in the Earth. But how many have ever thought of the fact that the Earth itself has a chart? It has a rising sign. Now, in your chart, what the astrologers who are more um, exoteric may not have told you is that there is a descendant. If you have an ascendant, that's a rising sign, you also have a descendant, which is equally, if not more important, than your ascendant sign. So just bear this in mind. But when you go to the bigger level and you think of the Earth, we have the rising sign of the Earth, and we also have the descending sign. Now, the astrological ascendant is presently in the last few degrees of the sign of Pisces. Okay, so the Earth sign is Pisces. Therefore, the descendant is in exactly the opposite sign of Virgo. That's because the ascendant and the descendant are on a straight line. They face each other perfectly in an opposite uh, situation. So, the position of the descendant is as important for the chart of the Earth as the ascendant is. We cannot understand the times we are living in or those to come unless we, un we are familiar with the permutations of these astrological oppositions. And these oppositions are very important to the ancient world. If you even look at the symbol for Lady Justice in the tarot or the magician in that strange pose that he's in with up and below, and the Pythagoreans and the Sophics said, as above, so below. They were trying to emphasize this idea that if you're looking there, make sure that you look to what's in the polar opposite. All things are connected. All things are in balance. We can't have Aries without the opposite sign of Libra. All signs are perfectly uh, polarized. It's very interesting to notice these uh, oppositions in astrology. In the tarot cards, we have card three and four, Venus and, the, and Mars, the goddess and, and the god, the male and the female. And so it is on the astrological level. And as I said, as the sun moves uh, eastward, backwards through the sign, it appears that the constellations are moving in the other direction. 
Now the tarot, one of the great secrets, we don't have time to get into it in this presentation, but I do in other presentations and in other talks and on the website and in various books and so on. I have always pointed to the fascination of the tarot, one of its most remarkable uh, mysteries that's connected with the tarot is that the 22 major arcana are literally demarcations of that movement, that processional movement we've just been talking about. Each of the cards actually represent little Polaroids, if you will, or photographs of each of those ages. It must be some incredible uh, cult that can encapsulate in one card all the happenings of 2,160 years. But that's exactly what was done. So all the way back from the age of Vir Virgo, Libra, in fact, all the way around, each of the cards represents an age of procession, a processional age. Now again, we are in the age of Pisces, or we're at the very end of Pisces. The sun right now is at the very last degrees of Pisces, ready to move into the sign of Aquarius. That's where we are historically. In the age of Virgo, the pyramid was constructed. This is why in the present age of Pisces, its mirror opposite, antiquarian scholars and speculative laymen have been so interested in uncovering its secrets. Just giving you another anecdote here to show you how important this is in our daily life. It's not just a humble little personal chart that you get. Astrology has many other permutations. In the age of Virgo, that's why the Sphinx is there, by the way, representing Virgo. But what's a few hundred yards away from it is this pyramid. The pyramid and the Sphinx were constructed in what we know as the age of Libra and Virgo. That's many thousands of years ago. If each sign is 2,160 years, then you just count back six or seven signs and you'll find that you're in the age of Virgo and Libra. And it was ordered to commemorate this that they put a sphinx there saying, here we are, the age of Virgo. But Virgo, as we've just seen, is the opposite of the sign of Pisces in which we're now living. That is why many people like Edgar Cayce and other philosophers have said that it would be in the age of Pisces that there would be this re-fascination with all mysteries Egyptian. I completely uh, confer, confer with that because programs like this and the revival through Jordan Maxwell and myself of the subject of astrotheology are part of this process. There's a certain etheric connection in time. Time is not a linear thing. It is a very spiralic uh, thing. And there's a symbiosis between these ages. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, Edgar Cayce, they said that the mysteries of the pyramid, the mysteries of all things Egyptian would come to light in the age of Pisces. So again, the hermit for Virgo, the moon for Pisces. Now in the age of Pisces, when the sun moved many thousands of years ago now, that's over 2,000 years ago, the sun moved into the age of Pisces. Well, the symbol for Pisces is the fish and the fish god. And we have in the age of Pisces the coming of the solar cult and the rise of Judeo-Christianity. That's why the headdress of the uh, Pope is the fish's head and why he wears the, the fisherman's ring, the ring of the fisherman. It's the age of Pisces. Now, competent astrologers know that the negative traits associated with the sign of Pisces, okay? So there's positive traits of every sign, every symbol. No uh, symbol is inherently negative. There's po positive and negative. But competent astrologers know that the negative traits associated with the sign of Pisces concern deception, vice, hidden agendas, mass delusion, and the misuse of spiritual virtue and power. So, in the age of Pisces, it was to be expected that the world would experience its share of these negatives on a macrocosmic level. And boy, has it done that. As the age of Pisces comes to a close, though, the deceivers know that the paradigm shift which will occur, which does not favor their machinations, this understanding has led them to make many subtle alterations in their age-old stratagems. The study of tracking, the study and tracking of these expedient accommodations prompted by astromantic and cosmological phase shifts amounts to an entire subject in itself. So simply put, all this uh, technology, the rise of technology is a very Aquarian thing. The rise of certain New Age groups, the interest in um, divination and spirituality is a harbinger to the coming of the age of Aquarius. Uh, the empowerment of females, which has still not really happened yet, but is on its way, is also a part of that. The, but you see, the mythographers, these individuals who create whole mythologies, understand that this is also coming. And therefore, they don't sit easy. They create new uh, mythologies.
And where is this all coming out of? Vatican, which comes from the word Vaticanus, literally meaning the place of the sorcerers. So just realize when you're talking about Vatican, you're talking about the place of the sorcerers. Tony Bushby says, Tacitus described Rome at the time as a place where every horrible and shameful iniquity from every quarter of the world pours in and finds a welcome. It's the product of all these cults coming together. And they were heavily into astrology. That's why the cross is used. That's why in Celtic countries you see the ring around the cross, representing the zodiac and the cross. Again, in the, again, in the symbolism, you'll always see the sun back of the cross because they understood that this was about astrology. And what of the age of Aquarius when the sun makes its transition? Do the religions have anything to say about that? Well, remember, John 14, In my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also. The age of Aquarius is said to begin in A.D. 2740, but of course, there's different scholars have different dates. However, as the sun moves towards the final degrees of the previous sign, the descendants of the great cults of power who are at the helm of the religions and governments need to make arrangements for change. As each age terminates, the appointed mythographers have to get ready to script new mythologies consistent with the complex symbolism of the coming age. Their work is analogous to the Madison Avenue ad man, only their hot product is literally the new world order. The end of an age is always distinguished by orchestrated chaos and conflagration. This is the meaning of Armageddon. So end times, millennial angst, comings of new aeons, new ages, the passing away of old paradigms, the rescripting of new ones, uh, the coming of a new world order, a new age of the world, is a reference to this astrological changeover. And each age is known in all the mythologies of the world to end in calamity. There's an Armageddon, an apocalypse, not of the end of the world, but of the end of the age, in which there'll be debauchery and iniquity. So as these guys get ready to vacate, not literally, of course, but uh, re-script their mythologies, change their masks, we better understand the symbolism. One of the most important things to also realize about this uh, procession of the equinox phenomena is that when you study it, you come to understand how the art of prophecy works. Morning, noon, and night, you'll have to put up with the detractors telling you there's no such thing, it's all malarkey, it's all gibberish. There's no such thing as astrological prediction. There's no such thing as uh, doing readings and, and whatnot. Well, the fact of the matter is, of course it's possible. As we've just said, the tarot is a depiction one of its mysteries, one of its many mysteries, is that it's literally a depiction of all the ages of the zodiac. So using the cards in that way, one can know what comes in different ages using the, the symbolism of the tarot cards. Divination contains many secrets that we're not aware of. The 10th century Arabian historian and author Masudi says that on the eastern or great pyramid built by the ancients, the celestial spheres were inscribed. Likewise, the position of the stars and their circles, together with the history and chronicles of past times, of that which is to come and of every future event. Also, one may find there the fixed stars and what comes about in their progression from one epoch to another. That's right. On the pyramid walls, in the tarot cards that was created in ancient times to depict these astronomical events. In Ecclesiastics 1, it says, is no new thing under the sun. Is there a thing of which one might say, see this, it is new? It has already been for the ages which were before. That's right, nothing new under the sun. Not only is the Bible the center of Judeo-Christianity, but of course we have the cross, the crucifix, the story of Calvary. Well, Madame Helena Blavatsky says, the crucifix was an instrument of torture and utterly common among Romans as it was unknown among Semitic nations. It is certainly not the Christian cross that John had in mind when speaking of the signet of the living God. That's right. It wasn't the cross of Calvary 
of torture that John had in mind. We're going to find out what cross he had in mind when he was thinking of symbolizing Christianity. Tony Bushby says of it, the symbol of the cross originated as part of an ancient Egyptian initiatory rite and eventually found its way into Christianity. The church stated that in its history, there is no proof of the use of the cross until much later than the sixth century. It is recorded in Christian archives that the general use of the crucifix was ratified at the sixth ecumenical council in 680 AD. The council decreed that the figure of a man fastened to a cross now be adopted and the new church logo was later confirmed by Emperor Hadrian I. About a century later, the first pictures of Jesus Christ standing against a cross slowly start to appear. So we're talking about seven, eight hundred years after the rise of Christianity, uh, the cross suddenly becomes the central motif. Bishop Kaleno, he said that of the several varieties of cross still in vogue as national and ecclesiastical emblems, there is not amongst them the existence of which may not be traced to the remotest antiquity. They were the common property of the Eastern nations. So there's nothing uh, unique about the cross in Christianity. Tony Bushby in his Bible fraud he says there was no verification of a landmark or significant crucifixion of a person called Jesus Christ in the writings of such highly regarded contemporary historians as Philo, Tacitus, Pliny, Sut Suetonius, Epictetus, uh, Cluvius, Rufus, Quintus, Curtus Rufus, Josephus, Plutarch, and the Roman consul Plubius Petronius. None, no mention. Stephen Knapp in his book Proofs of a Vedic Culture's Global Existence, he says, it was not until the Sixth Synod of Constantinople that it was decided that the symbol of Christianity would be represented from that time on as a man crucified on a cross. In fact, the earliest instances of any artwork that illustrates Jesus on a cross can be traced back um, only to the eighth or ninth century. So how biographical is that? that they have to wait 800 years before they go, oh, let's use a cross. But of course, the ancient world knew all about it and have been using it for generations. Its origin, again, is the zodiac. We have two phenomena, two other cycles of importance in the heavens, which, without which you couldn't have astrology or astronomy, and these are known as the ecliptic and the celestial equator. There is a trajectory of the sun around the earth. Okay, we mentioned that. There's the trajectory of the sun around the earth. That is a band of about 17 degrees wide, on which are the major constellations. That is the zodiac. Now this belt itself crosses another belt called the celestial equator. When the sun annually reaches the junction point of this, of this cross, we have the spring and autumn equinoxes. Now for those of you who are coming to this for the first time and have no background in astrology or astronomy, simply take a globe or take even a, a two globes, take the one that has the axis bent, like a globe of the planet Earth, and then imagine another globe that's not the Earth, but just a perfect sphere, right? They're in one in one hand, one in the other. A perfect sphere, like a crystal ball, and then the other one, a globe. If you have one in your house, pick it up and look at it. The axis goes this way. And of course, if the axis of the Earth goes that way, then the equator of the Earth is at a slight slant of 25 degrees, right? 23 point something degrees or whatever it is. If you project that equator out to the night sky, which of course is nothing but another dome around the whole of the Earth, can be considered the theater of the night sky as a dome to astrologers and astronomers. But if you project that plane of the ecliptic, that's the equator, we're talking the equator here, think of that as being magnified or projected out to the night sky. That is what is known in astrology as the ecliptic the ecliptical belt. But of course the night sky would have its own equator, would it not? That night sky that envelops the earth can be that other globe that you're holding in your imagination, which has a straight axis. If that equator around that other globe was projected out, it would be straight. So one would be curved and one would be straight. And if you bring them together like those two hoops that a magician uses, right? get two bracelets and bring them together at an angle, they will cross at two points. Right? So two interlocking circles have two points of conjunction. In the year, when you cross the ecliptic and the celestial equator, those two joins is where we have, when the sun reaches them, that is, we have the spring and autumn equinoxes. So as the sun approaches those two junctions, as you can see in that diagram there, 
at the place where the two belts cross, you have the solstices and the equinoxes. And of course, there's two of each making four. There's a better picture of it. The vernal equinox facing the autumnal equinox, the summer solstice facing the winter solstice. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the original cross that John was talking about as the symbol of Christianity because he understood that the 12 disciples, Jesus representing the sun from the nativity onwards, this was all about the solar cult. And he wanted the symbol of the cross to represent the zodiacal cross, the great cross of the zodiac. How many flags do you know? How many flags do you know in the world that contain that cross? Here's a St. George's cross. What you're actually seeing there is a minute part of these two cycles. Those two lines or those two bars look very straight, don't they? But if you were to project them out and think of them actually as two circles and the point of crossing is the crossing of those two circles, now you will understand why the flags of the world were chosen with stars and motifs on them and why this peculiar symbol of the cross is found. It represents that very coming together, but of course they're focusing in on it, of the crossing point of the ecliptic and the equator. And the blue is nothing but the sky above. From Celtic crosses onwards, which are most blatant images of this, we see the circle of the zodiac and the solar cross, the astrological cross. So just remember when you see the cross and the, the sun god, we're talking astrology again. Here's the symbol for the uh, Golden Dawn, Secret Society. They know all about it. There's the cross of four, and below it the, below it, the uh, Trinity and the sun. Here's a corporate logo for the X-Files. It's just one of many. You pick on this one right now, but there's many like this, showing you exactly the same idea, the Earth. But look how mysteriously this cross of the X is placed. Somebody knows something. And when the sun moves into position at the cross junction, we have the solstices and equinoxes, the rising of the sun. And this is an explanation of why we have in the Bible the famous star in the east and the three wise men following that star. Now, the star that never sets or the great star uh, that was um, the bright star in heaven, we have to understand it's nothing but the sun itself. There's no bright star that the uh, three holy men were following. I mean, if it was a bright star, then what did these guys do uh, you know, during the day? when there's no stars out. They stay at the Howard Johnson and you know, get up and jump on their camels at night and make, it to Beth make their way to Bethlehem? Of course not. Uh, we understand that this is a propaganda story and that the bright star that is in the sky is nothing but the sun itself. They were astrologers plotting the sun. They were travelers coming to acknowledge the rising of the sun at the equinox. The word Easter comes from two words, Eastern and star. The famous Eastern position where the sun rises on the eastern equinox. Equinox meaning equal day, equal night. Throughout all the corporate logos of the world, we'll find so many examples of this cross point of the zodiac. That's what you're seeing when you look at NATO and many of these other logos. The merchant hasn't the faintest idea what these symbols mean, but the ad men who draw them up are aware that they are descendants of the stellar cult and they know the power of these symbols. And we have, of course, a Bible, and we have a New Testament, but we clearly find that the New Testament is divided into four books, not three, not five, but four. The reason, again, has to do with the Zodiac. Those four books or Gospels are known as the Book of Matthew, the Book of Mark, the Book of Luke, and the Book of John. Everyone has taught that from point go. But what we're not taught is that those four books of the Bible just represent the four cardinal points of the zodiac. The book of Aries, the book of Libra, the book of Leo, and the book of Aquarius. How can that be? He says that it was not and is still not possible to ascertain when and how those early gospels came into being. Neither original manuscripts not early references to such manuscripts existed. And even approximate dating is uncertain. 
Now, Ernest Busenbach, in his book Symbols, Sex, and the Stars, says that not only do the gospel writers fail to offer appropriate evidence to substantiate their claims upon the grounds of reasonable probability, but their numerous discrepancies, contradictions, and omissions, their readiness to accept as facts, rumors, and legends which they have heard at third and fourth hand, their obvious role as reformers, their desire to promote these doctrines, and their apparent willingness to even invent stories to promote these doctrines is proof that instead of being objective historians, they were decidedly propagandists. Indeed, if any subject other than a religion were involved, is it extremely doubtful whether any body of thoughtful men would take their writings of such men seriously. Tony Bushby says that church experts admit to no evidence of the existence of the Gospels for at least a century after the time it is said Jesus Christ was born in a manger. The most ancient literature fails to show any trace of the acquaintance with nor the use of the Gospels we know today. It is not possible to find in any writings compiled between the beginning of the first century and the middle of the second century any reference to Jesus Christ or the Gospels. So what we're talking about is that the Christians didn't have it until they get to Rome and realize, wait a minute, we can soup this whole story up with the Zodiac. We've got to turn back to the stellar cult. They had it all nailed down. Let's just borrow some of their mythologies and, you know, re-script our stuff because it's familiar to all the people of the world. Now, Tony Bushby in Bible Fraud says, The Dead Sea Scrolls made no mention of Jesus Christ or the early Christian church. It has long been known that there was, disinf that there was information in the Dead Sea Scrolls damning to Christian beliefs and the church's high-level involvement with interpreting the scrolls fostered a grave element of suspicion. Since the scrolls were found some six decades ago, close associates of the Vatican were placed in dominant positions in every phase of the investigation and translation of the scrolls. The priests regulated the flow of information and controlled its release. Now, those who've done their homework with Christianity, who've studied Christianity, know that its birthplace was um, at the Constantine's Council of Nicaea. Okay, so the Council of Nicaea is where everyone who would be the original patriarchs and founders of the Christian religion got together at a place. On June 21st, the day of the summer solstice, aha, isn't that interesting? On June 21st, the day of the summer solstice, a total of 2,048 presbyters, deacons, subdeacons, acolytes, and exorcists gathered at Nicaea to decide what Christianity really was, uh, what it should be, and what writings were to be used, and who was to be its god. The Emperor Constantine presided over the council. Dean Millman says of this, Nowhere is Christianity less attractive and less authoritative than in these council of the ch councils of the church. The degeneracy is rapid from the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. to the first of Ephesus in 431 A.D., where each party cause came determined to use every means of haste, maneuver, court, influence, bribery to crush its adversary. Tony Bushby says of it, a long, after a long and bitter debate, a vo vote was taken, and it was with a majority show of hands that Judas Crestus and Rabbi Jesus both became God, 161 votes to 157. A new God was proclaimed and officially ratified by Emperor Constantine. So we have two Jesuses. We have Jesus the Christ and his brother Judas equally being thought of as uh, good candidates for the Messiahship. Tony Bushby in his works even uh, points out that when we're reading uh, but the so-called biography aspect of Jesus Christ, we're actually reading about two individuals, not one, all mixed together. As we saw, Madame Blavatsky is talking about when we read the early Old Testament, it's two deities. We've got a Jehovah and an Elohim, and we've got the gods of different cults, all intermixed. Well, that, that must uh, account for the reason why we have this wrathful God on one hand, and suddenly we have this uh, very uh, beneficent and benevolent and loving uh, God on the other. Well, we're talking about more than one God. Tony Bushby uh, says that the emperor then instructed the bishop is Eusebius to compile a uniform collection of new writings to be bound together as one. Eusebius was to arrange for the production of a 50 sumptuous copies to be written on parchment in a legible manner and in a convenient portable form by professional scribes thoroughly accomplished in their art. Make them to astonish, said Emperor Constantine. This was the first mention of finished copies of the Christian New Testament in the history of mankind. With the, his instructions now fulfilled, Emperor Constantine decreed that the new writings be thereafter called the words of God. 
and be attached to copies of the Hebrew Old Testament. Emperor Vespasian in the first century had proclaimed the entire Jewish territory the personal property of the Roman emperors, and his decision was officially ratified by the Senate. In effect, all later emperors were in control of the Jewish religion. Emperor Constantine effectively attempted to amalgamate the earlier Jewish religion with his new cult. By legal inheritance, he was also the Messiah. After Eusebius had finished drawing upon the large array of Presbyter's texts, Constantine then ordered them to be destroyed by fire, and any man found concealing one should be stricken off um, his shoulders, that is, beheaded. Tony Bushby goes on to say, It is important to note that the format of the name Jesus Christ was not cemented down until the time of the Reformation. That is the 14th and 17th centuries A.D. For in earlier times it had several renditions, such as Yeshua Christ or Yeshua Christos. Now we saw a little earlier that the, the ecliptic and the celestial equator make the four cardinal points of the zodiac, which was the primeval Christian cross and also the pagan cross before that. But also in astrology and astronomy there are four uh, cardinal stars, four ancient stars that are of the most greatest importance. And they also make a cross in the heavens. They are Aldebaran, which means in uh, Islamic, the, it's a Persian word that means the eye of the bull, that's in Taurus. We have Regulus, the great red eye of the lion. We have Antares in Scorpio, and we have Fomahalt, that's one of the fishes in Aquarius. And these four great uh, stars are the uh, precursor, the origin of the four sons of Horus. Horus, the god of the old world, had four sons. And as we've noticed, many corporate logos, there's cars that go by the name of Forrester, but of course, if you really examine the word forester, it actually says four star. There they are, the sons of Horus. There's uh, Osiris sitting on his throne, the sun god, attended by his four sons, representing the cardinal points and also representing the uh, four stars. So Osiris is the sun, just like Christ is the sun at the Last Supper, and the four cardinal points are there. The ecliptic and celestial equator intersect at two hypothetical points. When the sun arrives annually at these cross points, we have the spring and autumnal equinoxes. When the sun moves 90 degrees, that's three months from each of these, we have the two solstices. This is a very important point to remember. There it is again. The 12 signs of the zodiac, the earth in the middle, the sun that moves slowly along the belt of the 12 signs, and the four cardinal points. When the sun reaches the summer solstice in the sign of Cancer and the winter solstice, it's in the opposite sign of Capricorn. These are at the highest and lowest annual declinations of the sun. And that's why on maps we see the tropics of Cancer and the tropic of Capricorn. All that means is that when you look on a globe, you'll see two meridians. One is called the tropic of Cancer and the other one is called the tropic of Capricorn. Capricorn is in the south and the tropic of Cancer is north of the equator. All they are is the highest rising point of the sun. The sun moves to the highest point of its arc during the year in Cancer. And it moves to its lowest point in the late Sagittarius moving into Capricorn. And that's why you have the solstices at those points. Solstice just meaning sun standing still. However, what I would like to bring out is that Cancer was known in the ancient days. This is where the summer solstice is. Cancer was known in the ancient days as the gate of birth or life. In fact, it was even believed that souls entered in through the moon or entered through the gate of cancer to take birth through the female. Because, of course, uh, cancer is the female water sign. And Capricorn was known as the gate of mortality or the gate of death. So facing, facing cancer is Capricorn, which is where the souls were meant to leave the terrestrial sphere after their sojourn, uh, what we call life. Tropics of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. And this is one of the reasons, again, in a practical context, that cities like Vatican City, like London, like Washington, use this circular motif in the playouts, these beautiful architectural uh, uh, edifices, but you'll always see the gate of the north and the gate of the south 
Pall Mall in London is a perfect example of this zodiological motif. Cancer is also very interesting because that's where the bear is. And the movement of the bear through the whole annual cycle makes the symbol of the swastika. You take the little bear and you position it at four points and it will make the symbol of we know as the swastika. We know that America is born in July 4th, that's the sign of cancer, that's why its symbol is the bear of the California flag it's to commemorate cancer and the northerly sign. Cancer is also very interesting because being the northerly sign it sits beside Leo which is also a northerly sign. Leo is the always been um, signified by the lion, the, ready li the red lion, the ruddy lion, and the sign of cancer, which was lunar, ruled by the moon. The most ancient symbol of cancer was the unicorn, the pale white unicorn. So if you're a cancer, you know that your symbol is the crab. But long before it became the, was the crab, the symbol of the unicorn was the symbol. And that's why you see on royal heraldry, the royal families are all very aware of this. They design their cities this way, they put their throne rooms this way, and even their heraldry shows you the red lion of Leo right beside the unicorn of Cancer, the pale white moon. Now in the story of Jesus we have of course the famous motif of the birthday of Jesus. It's well brought out, it's a famous story, nativity, that the Son of God is a historical personage they try to tell us and that he has a birthday, the nativity. From Fraser, we find that the custom of celebrating Christ's birth began in Egypt, being derived from the mother goddess cult there, and the Christians there celebrated it on 6th of January. Okay, so the original date of birth of the sun god from ancient times was January 6th. By the 4th century, it had become generally established in the East. The Western Church had never recognized the 6th of January as the true date, and in time, its decision was accepted by the Eastern Church. At Antioch, this change was not introduced until 375 AD. Now, the reason why the Fathers transferred the celebration of the 6th of January to the 25th of December was this. It was the custom of the heathen to celebrate on the same 25th of December the birthday of the sun, at which they kindled lights in token of festivity. In these solemnities and festivities, the Christians also took part. Accordingly, when the doctors of the church perceived that the Christians had a leaning to this festival, they took counsel and resolved that the true nativity should be solemnized on that day and the festival of the Epiphany on the 6th of January. Accordingly, along with this custom, the practice has prevailed, the kindling of fires until the 6th. Alexander Del Mar in his fine book, Middle Ages Revisited, says, Sir Isaac Newton in his Prophecies of Daniel showed that not only the solar festivals but all the other principal ones observed by the early church were Roman festivals fitted with new names. There's nothing holy about the Holy Roman Empire, there's nothing holy about Constantine, and sadly there's nothing holy about modern Christianity that came right out of that. Now Melito of Sardis, the second century theologian, said that King of Heaven Prince of creation, son of the eastern sky, who appeared both to the dead in Hades and to the mortals upon earth, he, the only true Helios, arose for us out of the highest summits of heaven. So wait a minute, I thought that Jesus rose out of the highest summits of heaven. No, Helios did, the king of heaven, the sun. Here's a passage. They are all thine. All those who come to thee, great and small, they belong to thee. They who live upon the earth, they all reach thee. Thou art their master, there is none outside thee. Sounds like a lovely biblical passage, doesn't it? But guess what? That's from the Louvre Steel, an Egyptian hymn to the sun god of the Egyptians, Osiris. So we've heard about the rising of the sun from the equinox of the spring up through Cancer, the northern sign, and then as it subsides down towards the fall months, that's why it's called fall, because the sun is falling into the cold winter months uh, for another sojourn. That is called the underworld cycle. And as the solar cult became powerful, they wanted to re-script the mythology and make these southern signs be given over to or attributed to the darker powers, to the more what they had as the satanic energy or the evil ones. And of course, that included the women, because remember I said, in the solar cult and Saturnian cult, the women were always considered uh, auxiliaries of the negative power. And we see this when we look at the zodiac idea of the sun, the great hero, 
um, losing his rays and shrinking and being found impotent and weak and falling into the female signs of Libra and uh, Virgo and Libra. This is clearly shown in the story of Delilah. The word Delilah comes from Leila, which means night, and D in the ancient languages of the world meant Daleth. In Hebrew, it's Daleth and Delta. So D meant the doorway. So Delilah just simply means the door of the night. We don't have time to explore it all here, but if you get into mythology, you'll realize that the sun receding into the fall months, losing his hair, is the idea of the sun's rays being lost, and the old sun, old father time, uh, losing his potency and his power, and being weakened, or having his eyes put out, being blinded. It's another motif that you'll see a lot of mythology. And of course, always somewhere, there's some evil female uh, bringing it all about. This is a story which would have been nonsense to the stellar and lunar cult, but carried a lot of weight later on. So Libra, the sign of the female where the sun goes into the underworld. In fact, if you are a Libra, you'll know that your symbol is that little one on the right. It is a straight bar, and then there's a loop. Well, that little loop there is the sun, half above and half below the meridian of the western horizon. After you get through Libra, the sun makes its way into Scorpio. Scorpio has always been the skeleton. You always see it symbolizes death, the sign of Scorpio. And that's when the sun, that's why today in Halloween, for instance, we have a uh, pumpkin, which is always orange because that represents the sun, and you put a little evil face on it. It's a composite symbol. The pumpkin is nothing more than the sun. But now that the sun has become part and aligned with the southern signs, we put a little demonic face on it because it's fallen into the, the power of the evil ones. We worship it every year and have the faintest idea where it comes from. Scorpio, a huge sign in the ancient uh, calendar, understood to be where the sun goes to die. The whole idea of St. Peter, who's another solar god, being crucified invertedly, represents this fall of the solar king into the underworld. Of course, we understand that the tarot cards commemorate this, the hanged man. We're seeing tarot symbolism in the Bible. The hanged man is associated with the sign of Scorpio. We also hear about Odin, literally hanging upside down on the tree of life. As I said a little earlier, we do know that Scorpio is symbolized by the scorpion. But just in the case of cancer, cancer's original symbol was not the crab, but the scarabus beetle. Uh, they changed it from the Egyptian scarab to the, the crab. But originally, the sign of cancer was the scarabus beetle. And then before that, it was the unicorn, or contemporaneously, it was the unicorn. Same thing in Scorpio. Yes, the scorpion rules, but the real symbol of Scorpio is the constellation, which is the biggest one in the sky in the area of Scorpio. And that's Aquila, the eagle. So when we see that the American flag, the American symbol, is Aquila, understand that we're talking Scorpio here. America is under Scorpio, as well as cancer. And we see some corporate logos using the great eagle wings. We're talking power and money, because Scorpio, as an astrological sign, rules power, money, government, domination. Of course, we go into this much more thoroughly in the subversive use of sacred symbolism in the media, the other um, program in this series. And the uh, number 13, which is always uh, associated with Scorpio, the tarot card, number 13, rules the sign of Scorpio, is found on the dollar bill in numerous times. The 13 arrows, the 13 berries, the 13 leaves, the 13 stripes, the 13 stars, the 13 levels of the pyramid. It has many reasons for this, but one of them is to represent the sign of Scorpio, which is the eagle, Aquila. Just as you go past Scorpio, you come to Sagittarius, or you come to the place between the signs, and you're very close. When you're in Sagittarius, you're very close to what is known as galactic center. Galactic center, the center of the galaxy. The center of the galaxy is in the constellation of Sagittarius, and that is, in fact, why you have the archer. The archer pulling his bow, that arrow of, of Sagittarius, was meant to face galactic center like a man shooting at a target. That's why the symbol of Sagittarius was chosen. Originally, he wasn't a horse, it was a dragon. He was half man, half dragon. Later, the image was softened into a horse, the centaur. And the symbol 
for the center of the galaxy, for galactic center, was known from time immemorial as the Black Sun. And on Bracken House here in London, many other um, buildings, as a secret society symbol primarily, you'll see the symbol of the Black Sun. And when you see that symbol, realize that it is referring to the center of the galaxy, not the physical sun. In the tarot card number 14 that refers to Sagittarius, we'll see something interesting. The figure there has her foot in water and one foot on earth. So the card that represents Sagittarius, the sign of Sagittarius, shows a figure with one foot in water and one foot on earth. Now this is, again, symbolic communication. The water sign, Scorpio is a water sign. So the angel is literally having her one foot in the water sign of Scorpio and on the fire sign, uh, sorry, excuse me, the earth sign of Capricorn. Because after Sagittarius comes Capricorn. So Sagittarius is in the middle of the water sign of uh, Scorpio and the earth sign of Capricorn. It's just a way that the ancients used to uh, symbolize things. But how did the ancients actually discover this phenomena of the solstices and the equinox? It was a very lengthy process, of course. The um, ancients used to notice on their sundials that the shadow did something strange as the sun approached these uh, southerly signs. As the sun descended down towards Capricorn, past the celestial equator, excuse me, past the celestial center, the galactic center, and as it passed into the sign of Capricorn, it would stop. It came to a point around about December 21st, and then it would stop dead in the sky. The ancients noticed this, and for three days they noticed that the sun would not move. But on the third day, that's about the 23rd, it would start to move again and resume its northerly course. And for those three days, it was sort of like dark days, or the dead days. And that's why we have the term solstice, because it means solstice, sun standing still. The ancients noticed this. That's why we have Jesus saying, for three days I will die and rise again. We hear that when Jesus was born, for various reasons, his family had to run away and they made flight into Egypt. Now, what we have to discover about this, it concerns also celestial activity. We say that uh, the winter months, the, summer solst the winter solstice is in Capricorn, but the earth turns. So, yes, December, during the day, you can't see the stars. And what you don't realize is that during a day, the, the, the planet uh, Earth is moving around the sun. So when the night sky comes upon us at, at the evening, when we go out to look, we're not going to see the, the stars of Capricorn. They were out during the day, but we couldn't see them. There's a 180 degree turn that's just happened. So when we go out at night and we look into the night sky, we will actually see the constellations of the opposite sign. Because again, the Earth has turned 180 degrees. So during the evening time at Christmas, during the solstice time, if you go out and look into the heavens at night, you will see the, the constellations of Cancer and Leo, the northern signs, and vice versa. If you went out on the night of the summer solstice, you would see the constellations of the southerly signs of Capricorn and Aquarius and so on. So we understand that during the solstice, during the period of Christmas, the stars that are in the sky at night are the sign of cancer, and cancer was always the symbol of the Holy Mother, the female mother sign. Now cancer, as a constellation, is very interesting because it has the least brightest stars of any of the constellations. And because of that fact, it was known in ancient times as the wilderness. It was literally known as the wilderness because it was so bleak. It does have stars in it, many of them, but they're faint in magnitude. So the ancient astrologers used to call it the wilderness or the desert. That's why we hear so many stories, for instance, about Moses and Joseph and Jesus and, and uh, all sorts of patriarchs and prophets going through the 40 days in the wilderness. We imagine that somebody going out into the wilderness for 40 days. No, it isn't. It's to do with the sun, which is represented by all these heroes, passing through the sign of the zodiac, Cancer, a very big constellation, for 40 days in the wilderness. So when we realize that the stars of the sign of cancer are seen at the time of Jesus' birth, we can unravel a great mystery. Because as I said, although the constellations are not bright in cancer, there are some very important star groupings there. And one of the most important 
that's a constellation within Cancer, is known as the cradle or the manger. And go to an old planisphere and you'll see it right there. There is a constellation in Cancer called the manger. Now, that is why when the sun is descending towards Capricorn and moves into the period we know as Christmas or the summer solstice, and we hear that the sun is born in a manger, born in an inn in the manger, this is a reference to the sun being back of the sign of Cancer. Now, when John the Baptist declares that he is not the true light, but the one who follows him will be the true light, he is identifying himself with the moon and with the lunar cult. He was also the man of the wilderness, a term which implied the night sky. He had his head removed, and he was followed by the solar king. Pickett and Prince, in their book Templar Revelation, say that the ritual of baptism, as done by the Baptist, has no precedent in Judaism. That's right, but it does in the old lunar cult of old. And John the Baptist, using the water to purify, is, a, is identifying himself with the lunar cult, and he's supplanted by the sun king to come. And the moon is related to uh, cancer, the sign of cancer. We also read that Jesus was born of a virgin. We looked at this a little earlier. But again, if we go to the chart of the earth and we find something very interesting, we discover that if the signs, the constellations, the starry groups are reversed at night, then that goes for the ones that are on the eastern and western horizon as well. If the constellations of Cancer are seen in the sign of Capricorn at night, or during the solstice, then what is seen on the vernal equinox? That means if you look to the east, what star groups are rising there just before morning? The sign of Virgo, which is usually on the western horizon, is seen rising just before sun, sun uh, break on the eastern horizon. And the sign of Virgo was, of course, always known as the Mother of God. So in the chart of Jesus Christ, at that day, at that moment, you'll see the sign of Virgo popping its head up above the western, above the eastern horizon. So it was said that the son who is born in a manger is born of a virgin. Because literally, Virgo is overlooking the solstice point. As I said, the following of the bright star in heaven merely referred to the sun that was being followed to the point of the solstice. We also hear at the um, birth of Jesus that there arrive not only three shepherds, but three wise men. Well, this can be explained again in the same way, using the same astro-theological uh, reasoning, the same astro-theological device. On the western horizon, if Virgo is rising on the eastern side, then the, we the eastern constellations must be appearing on the western side. And that's exactly what happens. The sign of Taurus. Uh, the stars of Taurus, the constellations of Aries and Taurus, are seen on the western horizon. But within Taurus are three very important stars. There's many constellations in Taurus, like the Pleiades and uh, Aldebaran, the star Aldebaran. But there's also Orion, the constellation of Orion. And Orion is always distinguished by three parallel stars, the three stars in the famous belt of Orion. But in ancient days, those three stars were referred to, literally, as the three wise men. It's as simple as that. So the three wise men who visit Jesus in the manger in Bethlehem are the three stars overlooking the western uh, equinox, but again, overlooking the manger or the cradle of the solstice point. The three wise men are seen in ancient Sumeria and Babylon. Here's a picture of the sun god in his tabernacle, in his precinct, in front of the precinct, uh, or we see the uh, solar disk, there's the sun, the bright star, and in front of it the three little uh, wise men. The three shepherds are the three wise men. And the king is holding the ring and the rod, the ancient symbols of royalty. There's nothing new in Christianity. And as I said earlier, the shepherds who watch their flock by night is a clear symbol of the shepherds because the crook of the shepherd it refers to the pharaonic crook that the Pharaoh is seen worshipping, and the Pharaoh is the head of the stellar cult, the head of the Magi. So when you hear of these humble shepherds just happen to be watching their flocks by night, you can bracket that and realize it's about astrologers watching the heavens by night. But coded language was being used. And the good shepherd, just like the Pharaoh, is the Christ seen holding the Pharaonic staff, the crook. So there you have it. There is the chart 
of the earth, the position of the constellations, that unravel the literature, the grammar, the text, the explanations, and the gospel story. It's a simple matter of astrology. Now, this we are only having time to just canvas this a little in this program. If you go to my website and or contact me personally, look at the links page. We've got volumes of information on this, decoding each and every part of the gospel story and even a lot of the Old Testament motifs like Jonah and Daniel, uh, Samson fighting the lion, Jonah being swallowed by the whale, uh, Christ walking on the water. So when you hear the Christians uh, chanting and talking about following Christ to the cross, just realize what cross it is. Now Joseph A. Seiss in his Gospel of the Stars says, In the triad of the three great Egyptian gods, each holds a sacred Tau or the cross as the symbol of life and immortality. So the fourfold cross is seen here on Ta, the ancient god of the Egyptians. And when you hear of Jesus dying on the cross, realize that it's the cross of winter upon which he is dying to be reborn again after three days. Luke 23. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. Centurion is a coded message. It refers to Ares, the warrior. When the Ares, as the sun is dying, the centurion sees what is happening. He understands that God is dying, but that he's innocent. The entombment of Jesus into the... Um, cave or into the uh, tomb is also referring to the southern signs. When the sun falls into the dark signs of winter, it's just a symbol of entombment. You find this in the story of Lazarus. You find this in the story of uh, Osiris and all the Christ saviors of the world go into the dark place for a sojourn from which they will rise again. And on the third day I shall rise again, said the Christ. The third day can be looked at as the three signs from Capricorn to Aries. The three signs from the depth of winter to the spring. Okay? Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces. We're thinking of three days, three seasons, three periods of time. And importantly, we know that Cancer is the mother of God, but you see in all the Renaissance paintings, you often see the two mothers of Christ. This is a very common motif in ancient art. The two Marys at the foot of the cross. Well, the two Marys are Mary, the mother of God, and Mary Magdalene, but we have a Martha and a Miriam turning up. In the Old Testament, we have the two primordial females of Eve and Lilith. In Greek mythology, we have the syzygy in the form of Demeter and Persephone. But guess where they come from? They come from the old Egyptian Isis and Nephthys. They come from Taur, Taurt, the original mother goddess of 25,000 years before. There you can see the picture of the hippopotamus god in the center of the zodiac, the planisphere. The earliest uh, depiction of the mother goddess was the hippopotamus. And the name of that uh, deity was Taurt, from which we get the word taro. We also get uh, from Taurt the word church, charuch. When the hard T's are softened to CH's, taruch becomes charuch, so the holy mother church. Christians talk about holy mother church. They dress in flowing robes of the female because they know what we're not supposed to know is that this is a throwback to the ancient goddess cults of the ancient world. And if you suppress that and throw it away completely, that's no good for the psyche. You can't control people. You have to have something they recognize and will yearn towards. That's how subliminal manipulation works. So they know they're a male patriarchy, but they've got to encompass some of the feminine motifs. Well, that's all right. We'll just dress ourselves up as female, build churches with uh, womb-shaped doors, and the whole have the waters of the female of the baptismal fonts, and use all those symbolisms but nobody knowing where it originally originates. And we'll talk about Holy Mother Church and Virgin Marys, but let nobody ask where it all comes from. The original Virgin Mary was Taurt, later as uh, Nuth, later as Isis, then Sophia, and down to Mary, the original heavenly Madonna. There's even talk of the black Madonna. Of course she's black, because the night sky is dark, is black. It's not that there was a physical black Madonna walking around. The black Madonna is literally the night sky that gives birth to the sun every year, every morning. In the Far East, we find the Virgin with her little child, Krishna, Rama. 
and the cow goddess. We have Lord Krishna, who is the prototype of Lord Krishna or Christ. We have in the later Arthurian legends, Lady Nimue and her son Lancelot, the great solar king, the solar knight, and the lady of the lake. The inscription for Jesus, IHS, which is used on churches and by Christians, actually is nothing to do with Jesus. It comes from Bacchus. In the ancient languages, IHS simply stood for the word Bacchus. There's a tie-in to Orpheus, we think that Orpheus is a Grecian motif that came later than Jesus, but that's not true. Orpheus is a primordial deity. Orphe, uh, Ophion, uh, O-P-H, represents the serpent. And of course, there's a whole underworld story relating to the great god Orpheus. And Dionysus, there's a tie-in with Jesus and the cult of Dionysus. In Arthurian mythology, one of the most beautiful and poetic of the myths of Arthur is that concerning Sir Tristra, or Tristan, of sorrowful birth. But the word Tristam, or Tristna, comes from Kristna, which goes back to Jesus Christ. There's a connection. They all have evil uncles. They all are, have followers. They all have a sorrowful birth. There's many motifs that they have in common. There's a tie-in with Jesus and the cult of Zoroaster in Persia, and also the Persians Mithras and Ahura Mazda. Tony Bushby says that the similarities between Christianity and Mithraism in the 5th century were so striking that St. Augustine grudgingly confessed the priests of Mithra worshipped the same deity as he did. But in Egypt, we always find Aten and Ra, the sun gods. We find out from Kersey Graves' great book, The, 16, the World's 16 Crucified Saviors, a highly uh, suppressed book, to say the least. Cursey Graves was a scholar and he found out that there was in the world at least 16 crucified saviors. All died on crosses, all were born from a virgin, and all uh, came to bring light to the world. We don't have time to go into all the details of the Bible stories, but on the website, on the pages that have to do with astrotheology, you will find the astrological or astrotheological analyses of many of these. Uh, biblical images of the three wise men and the 72 disciples and the marriage of Cana and so on. Now we know that Jesus had the 12 disciples, but we also read in several uh, parts of the Gospels that he had 72 apostles, those who would go about without script nor purse. In Luke 10, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go, the 72 apostles. Well, that's all astrology, astronomy, astrotheology. We know about the 12 official signs. The 12 signs of the zodiac are the 12 disciples of Jesus. But there are many other constellations up there. We talked about the sun passing through the zodiological belt. That's a band about 17 degrees wide. And the sun passing on that year after year, that's the zodiac belt. But in and around the zodiac belt, in and around the other main 12 constellations are other constellations, some of them of great importance. They may not be important to us now in solar-centered astrology, but to sidereal astrologers, to the ancient stellar cult, they were equally important. Now these many constellations, and there's about 72 of them, they are known by names and they're worshipped and they have great symbolism attached to them. And there are 72 of them. Those are the 72 unofficial disciples or unofficial apostles that also served the Christ or the Son. Now the early church fathers prohibited astrology and the Council of Toledo banned it forever. Nevertheless, 600 years later, the dates of the Pope's coronation were determined by the zodiac. The church hierarchy employed their own astrologers and signs of the zodiac appeared all over the church furnishings, tiles, doorways, manuscripts and baptismal fonts. And we might remember at the turn of the millennium in 1999 to 2000, the Pope John comes out to make his apology, quote-unquote, to the Jewish people. Well, he chose Pisces to do it in. It was in March. And if you track all of these different ceremonies that the Pope is involved in, you will find that they have astrological significance in order to strengthen themselves. We find out in Ireland 
that when the uh, Vatican uh, servants there wanted to give the Pope's chair a clean, and we know that the Pope's chair is the famous chair of St. Peter, which had gathered so much debris over the centuries, so they took it away to refurbish it and give it a good clean. And when they took off all the debris, what do they find on the chair and the seat is a huge zodiac in brass, this incredible zodiac. So they quickly covered it over again because, of course, you don't want anyone to know about that. Holger Kirsten in the original Zodiac and the original Jesus says that the Jesus mediated to us by the church is not the true Jesus. That is an artificial construction assembled from true and false fragments of his biography from authentic and invalid statements and based on a great deal of inventiveness on the part of the Christian writers. He says that uh, the religious teaching presented in Paul's epistles is fundamentally different from what research has recognized as being authentic sayings of Jesus. What we know as Christianity today is not the teaching contained in those authentic sayings. It is the theology disseminated by Paul and the doctors of his epistles. That's right, with the Romans paying the bills. Burton L. Mack, in Who Wrote the New Testament, says the writings in the New Testament were not written by eyewitnesses of an overpowering divine presence in the midst of human history. The Christian Bible turns out to be a masterpiece of invention. To be quite frank about it, the Bible is a product of very energetic and successful myth-making on the part of those early Christians. And T.W. Doan, in, in his book, says, The canon of the New Testament is nothing more or less than a copy of the mythological histories of the Hindu savior Krishna, the Buddhist savior Buddha, with a mixture of mythology borrowed from the Persians and other nations. Now we know the birth of Jesus, we've looked at, but we also hear a very specific detail. Christ dies at age 33. Well, the answer to that is again concerning the procession of the equinoxes. The sun passes backward through the zodiac, remember, and moves through each of the 30 degrees in approximately one month of 30 days. So, on a daily uh, routine, it takes 30 days to move through one sign. It comes into a sign at the first degree, and is completely out of the sign by the 33rd degree. That is why Jesus, the Son of God, was said to have died at 33. It is also why there are 33 degrees within Masonry. Freemasons are the descendants of the stellar cult. So we have Jesus, our Father, who heart in heaven, referring himself to the sun, to Venus, to the morning star. The sun is three degrees in the sky. A sign is 30 degrees in order to move 30 degrees, but to completely leave it, it's about 33 degrees. Let us understand also that when the sun god falls, he falls into the female signs. And although the Christians did uh, a lot of heavy duty work to denigrate that, the idea was that the sun is born in the virgin and he dies and goes back to the virgin, to the mother. That is the night sky. Forever he is encompassed in the body of the womb of the night sky. So at this stage of our program, it is not outside the bounds of reason, after what we've been uh, showing, that we have to understand that the Gospels are not a biography. The Bible was and is nothing more, nothing less than an astro-theological story, a sidereal myth. I believe that the writers of the Bible knew that. They had no intention of ever presenting it at anything else. And they would have been astounded that modern generations would actually think that it was a biography. Because if you were actually trying to create a biography, you would have done a much better job than the one that we have coming down to us. Even with all the machinations and throwing away and burning of other books, you still would have made it look more officially like a biography if that had been your intention. But the allegorists of the ancient world knew that everyone knows that this is a fable, a story. They would have not been able to even comprehend how this literally would have been taken so literally. And that the real, pure, beautiful, intriguing and mysterious meaning of it would just have been thrown out with the trash. This can be confirmed because if one substitutes the words zodiac and constellations for the following terms, the scriptures will begin to reveal their secret meanings. What terms? You can take a lot of them. Tabernacle, New Jerusalem, Nazareth, Bethlehem, Hall of Judges, Kingdom of God, Tent of God, Flocks by Night, Aeons or Ages, Seasons, oracles, citadel. So he or she entered into the tabernacle. We have the seven churches, the Mount of Olives, Mount of Glory, City of David, Celestial City, 
heaven, throne of the elect, abode of the Most High, the labyrinth, the most holy place, mercy seat. Whenever you uh, meet or encounter these uh, strange, cryptic, uh, untranslatable terms in the Bible, just in your mind, substitute the word constellations or zodiac and see what happens. You might be amazed. Now the dramatis personae of the Old Testament are not biographical characters. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Solomon, David, Samson, Joseph, Daniel, Jesus, and all the other patriarchs originally symbolized alignments and conjunctions between the planets and the luminaries. Their many wives, their sons and daughters simply represent degrees and minutes of zodiacal arc. So that's right, when we read about these patriarchs and their wives and their many sons and daughters, let us understand that this is another coding system. Everybody's running around trying to find how to break the code of the Bible, and yet these most important codes nobody pays the slightest attention to. These patriarchs, nobody's ever found any history of them that they ever even existed. And we're not going to be able to decode this Bible until we understand how it works. So when you hear about uh, Abraham uh, coming unto the Pharaoh, or Moses appearing to the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh or any king, when you, I'm just giving you one example here, the kings of the world were always represented by the sun or by Jupiter. The rabbis and the Semitic people really preferred Saturn, as we saw. So when the Saturnian patriarch, Moses, David, Abraham, Solomon, comes to the Pharaoh, as an example, we're talking about a, a conjunction of some kind, an aspect between the planets Saturn and Jupiter. The amount of daughters and sons they have are minutes and degrees of arc. So this whole thing could be decoded. There are scholars who are working on this right now to decode the whole of the Old Testament. Now, as I said, the potentates know this. Pope Leo X, it has served us well, this myth of Christ, he said. If we look on the uh, internet to gospelnet.com, this is a Christian website featuring the Bible. We, what do we find as their logo? The rising sun. Not Jesus, not a picture of the Christ, not a cross, but the sun of God, the sun in the sky is the logo of gospel.net. How interesting. We have the very dramatis personae of the Bible, as I said. You can decode it. God is the sun, obviously. There's no female of any uh, significance in the early part of the Old Testament, so we just start with God, the sun. His son, Adam, corresponds to the male uh, sign of Aries, which is always shown as the uh, bulky, uh, uh, phallic male, the aggressive warrior. That's Adam, the first son. Eve can be Taurus. Taurus is the female sign ruled by Venus, the earth, the earth sign of Taurus, who's always feminine. And then they have Cain and Abel. They're twins. And what do we have after Taurus? Gemini, the twins. And Cancer that comes after that is the first holy family. They make up the family, which is known as Cancer. Then comes the conflict between the brothers, that's Leo, the time of conflict, and so on. This has a very modern context, though, because this reminds me of the speech that Gore made in uh, Weapons of Mass Deception. In this series, we go into uh, the occult history of the politicians and uh, make reference to that. In one of the uh, addresses that uh, Gore, Vice President Gore, made when he was with Clinton, I happen to notice, and this is common that I notice this with politicians, they use old archetypal motifs. In the speech that Gore was making, he literally went through the signs of the zodiac, meaning he used terms and passages that related. He talked about independence and the war on terror and the need to be strong, and that's of course Aries. He talked about the budget and how they have to always solve the, economical, the, eco the economical problems, the financial world, that's Taurus. He talked about um, coming together and problem solving, which is a Gemini type of understanding, connectivity. He talked about the family, as they always do, and healing the family and making sure they all have Medicare and whatnot. That's cancer. He, he bypassed Leo because Leo is him, the idea of the solar king doing the talking and the pride and all of that, and the pride of America. But he moved on to Virgo, which talked about sacrifices and also talked about the medical world and that they're going to uh, take care of that. 
and all the way over to Libra, you know, where they're talking about stretching their arms out to the allies and uh, bonding with allies and all the rest of it. If you listen to that speech, every one of the signs of the zodiac was subliminally implied. So God is the sun. But Samson was the sun. In fact, the word shamash, Samson in Hebrew, shamash means the sun. It's so literal. Daniel in the lion's den, fighting the lions or being saved from the lion. The whole idea is Leo based at the sun of God is passing through the trials of the sign of Leo. Because like Hercules, you go through the 12 signs if you're the hero. Decoding the Bible is very important when we understand that the sons and daughters represent degrees of arc and that the patriarchs can also represent the great planets. But you see, earthly terrestrial matters, like I give the example of, of, of Gore, um, terrestrial matters are based on celestial. A very important um, historical anecdote in Irish mythology is the coming of William, King Billy, William III of House of Orange, destroying the Stuarts. But where did they decide to fight this battle? On the River Boan. On the River Boyne, not far from New Grange, literally the oldest uh, monument, the oldest pyramidical structure or the oldest uh, domain in the world, the oldest ancient site known to man. They have their great conflict there. What's more is that when the horse, this great white horse that the King William was riding, entered into the water, at precisely that moment, this, the planet Jupiter was moving over the Milky Way. The Milky Way is known to be the great river up there, the river Styx, the river of the heavens. So somebody is counseling the king. Everything is done with the uh, idea of protection, the use of the old Sabian magic. In the Bible, we're always hearing about the word of God and the sanctity of the Bible itself. Of course, our modern clergy and religious representatives are always declaring that belief in and practice of the divination arts like astrology is sacrilegious and absolutely forbidden. Yet they confer names and titles upon themselves which clearly originate from the stellar, lunar, Saturnian and solar cults. On my website, if you visit it, you'll find that there's a detailed analysis there of exactly this point, that the word pastor, master, minister, ceremony, deacon, cardinal, sexton, the word nun and the word monk or monsignor, monastery, all come from these ancient cults. We talk about a monastery. That's where monks and religious people will go. But what does the word monastery mean? Mon is moon and stir is the stars, the place of the meeting of the moon and the stars, a monastery. But you try going in there and going, hey, do you guys practice astrology? They're liable to sprinkle holy water on you, tell you to get thee hence. What they don't tell you is that a deacon which is a clerical duty. Deacon comes from the word decan, D-E-C-A-N, which is a division of the zodiac into 10 degrees. The decans are the deaconates. They don't tell you that a sexton comes from the word sextant, which is a navigator's uh, tool to do what? Measure the stars. A minister is a moon and a star. Mr. Minister is literally saying the man of the moon and the stars. or monarch and patriarch and archbishop, mystery. Christians, Christians are forever telling you that there's a great mystery. But the one thing they don't tell you is what the word mystery means. The word mystery comes from mesta, or mista, which meant woman. In Egypt, the word for woman was mesta, M-Y-S-T-A, or M-E-S-T-A. So the great mystery is concerning the female. We have the magistrate, or the magistrate. That's right, you go to court, you have 12 jurors because you have 12 watchers. You have to be in balance. So the 12 watchers are the 12 signs of the zodiac. But the 13th sign of the zodiac is the magistrate. When you go to court, you're in the 13th sign of the zodiac. You're out of the normal procedures. You've been sequestered away, and you're under judgment of Saturn, the 13th sign of the zodiac. Countless English place names control, contain the, the stir, S-T-E-R, a star. So Chester, Gloucester, Rochester, Worcester, Dorchester, Chichester, whatever, all the stirs. It's under the stars because all cities were founded by the Magi, by the Druid who would come there and plant his wand and he'd look up and he'd study the heavens and he'd say, what constellations are arising and setting here? What does the sun do? What are the primary constellations and stars? And then they'd say, this is man Chester. 
This is Da Belin. This is Belfast, Belfast, under this particular star. And these terms are absolutely conspicuous in Ireland. On the website, you'll see that I go into the meaning of Ulster, Munster, Linster, Connaught, and Meath, the divisions of Ireland. Now, the word of God, we find that in the Bible, the very word we use, Amen, Amen, at the end of a prayer, we say Amen. Amen is literally Amen Ra of the Egyptian pantheon. The god of the Hebrews is Adonai. But that comes from the sun god Aton. The T becomes a D. In the Egyptian, there is the prayer that opens Amon, Amon, who art in heaven. In Egyptian, the word Adam comes partly from Atum. Atum is the first Egyptian deity. So that's the very first male god of the first pantheon, the first dynasties of Egypt. It's called A-T-U-M, Atum. That is where we get Atman, the, the Hindu idea for the soul or the embodied soul, the great spirit, Atman. It's Egyptian, it's Atum. And the Hebrews pick it up and it becomes Adum or Adam. Christmas Day, as we saw, December 25th, was really the birthday of Horus. January 6th was the birthday of her second son, Isis's second son, brother of Horus, Aeon. And January 6th is where the Hebrews worshipped their festivals. Joseph, the father of Jesus. Joseph, Julius, Julian, Julio. These names come from Julio or Yule. In English we say wheel. December is the birth of the sun. The Yule tide is the time of Christmas. And Yule meant wheel. That's where we get the word wheel from because the zodiac was a wheel. So the father of Jesus... Jehoshaph is the wheel, the Yule. The father of Jesus is the zodiac. Jesus and Joseph are carpenters, but this is a mistranslation from Nagar, which really means the learned man or the wise man. Jesus at 12 years old is referred to as the most high. In the Bible, he's referred to as the most high. Well, the sun at the noon position of 12 o'clock is the original most high. When you see the Eucharist at the most important celebration of the Christian Mass, the Eucharist, when the little solar disk, the little white disk is held right up above the head of the priest, that is the time of the sun reading the 12 o'clock noon position. That's all it represents, is the sun at the most high position. As we said, Christ comes from the Egyptian karast, meaning made flesh. All right? So the word is ancient. It comes from the word karast, meaning to be made flesh. It also means, as a secondary meaning, to be anointed with oil. The Christ is to be the oiled one or the uh, baptized one. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani is not my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It actually derives originally from Elahi, Elahi, or Hile, Hile, or Helios, Helios, son, son, why hast thou forsaken us and covered my face with darkness? There is also the Hebrew version, Eli, Eli, Lama, Azubathani, meaning, my God, my God, how dost thou glorify me? Water turns to wine in the story of the marriage of Cana. Well, this occurs at the Feast of Cana in Egypt when the vines are harvested. Remember we said that Cana in the stellar cult was the name of the serpent. It's a great serpent festival of the serpent cult. When the wine, uh, the, the vines are being harvested, and of course, if you take the vines, how do vines get to be vines? From the water of the Nile and from the rains that have fallen. So the Egyptians used to say that the grapes are the wine, the water transferred into wine. It's as simple as that. And the master of the harvest would always raise a, a chalice of the wine to his lips, the new wine, to taste it. And if it was good, he would exclaim, Behold, it is finished. Just like we hear Jesus saying on the, the, uh, the cross, Behold, it is done or it is finished. But these terms come from way before Christianity. Now the four-day ceremony around the resurrection of Jesus was based on the raising of Osiris by Isis. Osiris was killed on a Friday after the spring equinox and raised on the sun day. But it was done with Osiris and Isis before. Lazarus comes from the Egyptian La Asuras. Asura is the Indian Surya, which to this day means the sun. But Asuria was actually the old name of Osiris. They didn't pronounce it Osiris. They called him Asuria. 
the sun. The Indians have Surya, the sun. Lazarus, coming out of the dark tomb, wrapped as a mummy. Christ said he's only sleeping. He'll come forth as a sleepwalker. It's Osiris, coming out of the underworld, coming out of the tomb, being born again. Nazareth, Jesus is meant to be born there, but never on any map have they ever found it. There's no locale called Nazareth. The word derives from the Egyptian Nasir, meaning prince who is sent, and also from Nasir, meaning Sirius. It was Jesus of Nasirius. We hear in the Bible, Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. However, what we're not told is that is a statement that comes from the doorway of the temple of Dendera in Egypt. The temple of Dendera was sacred to Isis. Isis was the one who said, Come unto me with all your burdens, and I will rest you. Not Jesus. We talked about the stellar and the lunar cult. But what about the Saturnian cult, the worshippers of the planet Saturn? We mentioned that their god was uh, El, E-L. And that's why we find this term, this uh, prefix or this suffix, so common in the words that have to do with religion. We have a tempel, a circle, a gospel, a disciple, an apostle, an evangelist, or El Ohim. If you were some bigwig in the Saturnian cult, you were known as an elder or an elite because you had the light of Saturn. Saturn was being nice to you and he had enlightened you and now you would be called an elite. Or you were one of the elect. You were an elector. We still use the term elect today in a political uh, milieu. Also, you were elevated. You were one of the elevated because you were a worshipper of El, the god Saturn. The study of the Saturnian cult is a whole study in itself. The women, specifically, were remonstrated with and said that they should listen and pay attention to their god Saturn. So Saturn has rings, so ear rings were put in the ears to commemorate that you were Saturn worshipper. You were married under your god Saturn in the Saturn cult, so you wore the wedding ring. The priests are often seen with the ring, the white ring around their neck. All black, because the planet, everyone who's a Capricorn, anyone who studied the symbols of the sign Capricorn or the planet Saturn know that the color is black and the metal is lead. But the, white, the black robe and the white ring represent the ring of Saturn. The old monks used to shave their head at the top so that the hair would be like a ring because they were receiving uh, the light from and the knowledge from their god Saturn, the ringed one. The Jews who worship on Saturday were the yamoka, the little round ring. Magic circles. You always drew a magic circle around yourself. In Hebrew, the pregnant women, at certain times when they're about to give birth, a magic circle, a ring, would be drawn around them, the protection of the god Saturn. Many royal symbols and royalty, like the dome, the ring, the uh, globe that is held by the royals, represents also Saturn. Ringing the bell in church. Archangels, that's right. Not only do we have the L in archangel, but the very names of the archangels themselves, Raphael, Gabriel, Michael, Uriel. What's this L bit? It's Gabriel of God, Gabe of El. Because El was the God once upon a time. The very design of churches, from the steeple to the spiral, to the bell, to the cabel, to the gabel, to the shingles, to the aisle, to the navel, to the altar. This encodation of the L is that all places we're celebrating to God. The word bell comes from Baal, B-A-A-L of the Canaanites. And always when you came to worship your god Baal, you rung a bell. Well, we still have that today in the churches, but it's a very old story of ringing the bell to bring the congregation to worship Baal. And even the magic circle that we see uh, in old pictures, and we associate with magic, has an origin. The rings of Saturn. When we see halos, we understand that the halo does represent the sun around somebody's head, but it also originally represented, it came out of the time when Saturn was king. Saturn was worshipped, and the, the idea of the ring of Saturn being a, a very important symbol. The ancients understood that Saturn had rings. They knew many mysteries pertaining to the heavens. The Jews, of course, are the most clearly 
obvious Saturnian cult, but there are many others. They're part stellar because you have the seven candelabra, the seven days of the week. But in a modern context, which is one of the most interesting things to study, we find that the colors of the police uniforms and the judges and the robes and rituals involved in courts, the priests, as I said, with their black robes and white collars, the monks with their shaved heads and robes and teachers even, the teachers coming out in their black robes representing Saturn. Everyone in astrology knows that Saturn rules order and discipline and studiousness and patience and matriculation. But the fact that they're dressed also in black and have the square head gear is all coming out of a particular cult, very ancient. We also, like we have a cult of Venus and a cult of Dionysus operating in the world, we also have a priesthood of Saturn operating in the world. And they also can be getting up to no good. Cronus is the other name for Saturn. And from the word Cronus we get chronology, which represents time. Crowns. The idea of a king wearing a crown was that he was a regent under Cronus. He was an agent on earth of Cronus. He uh, turned the rays of the sun inwards, as Jordan Maxwell has pointed out. The rays of the sun turned inwards make a crown, a coronet. A crona. Coronet. Corona. Cron. Karen. They all come from a word. Each of these deities has many symbols attached to it. Now, in a modern context, we find that these uh, strange assassination type happenings and uh, other bizarreties happening on earth like we went into in weapons of mass deception behind the new world order the uh, importance of ritual satan satanic ritual that uh, politicians and secret societies are involving themselves in one stock example that involved the symbolism associated with saturn was the heaven's gate remember earlier we were talking about the heaven's gates literally the northern gate of birth and the southern uh, gate of death well that's what these people were referring to the death gate is saturn Capricorn. And sure enough, in that particular ritual, Apple Gate or Apple White and his mad cult, we discover many Saturnian symbols, not only with these people castrated, but you only have to open a book on Greek mythology uh, to find out that Cronus castrated his father. And the sickle is a very, very important hallmark of Saturn worship. We not only find that they dressed all in black, black as the symbol of Saturn, the Nike logo, they all wore Nike gear and Nike shoes, well, the Nike logo is a subliminal symbol for Saturn. If you uh, look at the logo for uh, Nike, you'll find that it's the edge of the ring of Saturn. But the very name, Heaven's Gate, is enough to put us on to what's really going on here. This is a massive ritual to some ancient deities. Now, concerning the uh, lunar cult, Pickett and Prince in their book Templar Revelation say that in the Synoptic Gospels the woman who anoints Jesus is not named, although they make a point that she is a sinner. Mary of Bethany, who did the anointing, was known by the rabbis as Mary Lucifer, Mary the Lightbringer. So right there we've got a dichotomy. Yes, we know from the stories and the movies and whatnot and from Sunday school and everything else that this sinner, all the disciples hated her guts and didn't know why Jesus was hanging around with her. But then we have in the rabbi tradition, oh no, she's, Lu she's Lucifer, the lady light bringer. And then we do, even in the Bible, have her mysteriously initiating or anointing Jesus. So which is true? What is going on here? Well, what's going on here is revealed when we analyze the word sinner. Those who have looked at my Astro Theology page on the website, who have uh, checked into this, know that the word sinner doesn't mean anything negative at all. In this program, we've been talking about how one cult uh, supplanted the others and uh, one cult becomes the hegemony over another. Well, in that process, the previous cult, together with all of its customs, its traditions, and its belief systems, are considered or thought to be negative. All right? They're demonized by the next cult that comes into power or into ascendancy. The word sinner comes from the word sin, S-I-N, which was the earliest known name of the moon goddess. She was known as Min. And he was also in Babylon known as a male, Sin, S-I-N. So when you hear the prophets of old and we hear them remonstrating saying, get thee hence, uh, go and sin no more, uh, get this woman away, she's a sinner. 
It does not have anything to meet. It doesn't have anything to do with moral or karmic rectitude or Im imperfection. It simply means this is a female of the lunar cult. So when you hear them say, go and sin no more, all they're saying is go and sin no more, go and don't go and worship sin anymore. Worship the sun, that's all holy, but don't be worshiping the moon. And if you do, you're a sinner. So Eric Newman, the German scholar, says that a favored symbol of the matriarchal sphere is the moon in its relationship to the night and to the great mother or the night sky, an expression of her essential spirit. As I said earlier, the lunar cult was symbolized by the scarabus beetle of Egypt and the unicorn, the white pale unicorn of the moon and the northerly sign of cancer. The scarabus uh, beetle motif comes from Kephra, the Egyptian god of the scarabus beetle whose sign was when the sun passes to its highest point through cancer up into Leo, its royal house. Kephra, the god of Egypt. All the lunar cult were distinguished because they'd wear the horns, the lunar horns. Um, same as the Native American Indians who count time by the many moons, well their, their uh, shaman would wear the lunar horns. And we see uh, Michelangelo, Moses, who by the way was the leader in the ancient times of the lunar cult, is seen in the sculpture with the lunar horns. It's always perplexed art historians and, and the Christians, why is Moses seen with the horns? What could it possibly mean? It means what Michelangelo, being a member of secret societies, understood and that is that he is the king or the leader of the lunar cult. And he worshipped on Mount Sinai, Sinai. Sinai was the mountain on which you worship the moon. And this, because of course you have to go high on the mountain to have your observatories and your shrines when you worship the constellations in the heavens. That's why mountains and hills were considered sacred. Moses means from the water, that's all it means. The priestess draws Moses from the water. Now Moshes or Moses also meant the initiator, the one who initiated with water. On Islamic flags to this day we'll see the crescent moon and even though as patriarchal and as fundamentalistic as they may be, their symbols show you where they originally came from. The star and the moon that's on their turrets and their minarets and on their symbols and their flags show you that they originated like Christianity from the stellar and the lunar cult. The symbol we use today for money, the, the so-called dollar bill sign, is a very, very ancient motif coming out from 10,000 years and before, from uh, the time of uh, Egypt. The god, as I said, the color of money was the three colors of the sun, the moon, and the uh, earth. But silver is more predominant than gold. So most of the coins of the world were silver, and most of the money and the coins of the world were dedicated to the moon, because moon is silver, and moon is white. And if they're dedicated to the moon, they're obviously dedicated to the goddess of the moon. And the most famous goddess of the moon was Isis. And if you uh, shrink her name, to, uh, the name of Isis, I-S-I-S, -I -S, if you uh, compact those together, you will get the American dollar sign. Money, M-O-N-E-Y, mon, for the moon. The Virgin Mary is always described as having 12 stars in her hair. Twelve stars around her head, crowned with twelve stars, and standing on the crescent moon. What could it possibly mean? The Statue of Liberty, the very symbol of America, is Egyptian, comes from Lady Ceramis, or also from Seshet, the Egyptian goddess. So the females of the lunar cult were once the keepers of the Gnosis. They understood the mystery of the fauna and the flora and they were the high initiators. Particularly coming down to us is the Holy Grail motif. The Holy Grail motif, which is picked up in the Christians with the Eucharist and the drinking of the wine, and here's the bread, which is my body, and the wine, which is my blood. But of course what we're not told is that bread is sacred to the female cult because the four ingredients that come to make up bread, yeast, grain, uh, water, and wheat, are all female earth symbols. And the blood of the the red wine is very clearly the female menstrual blood. In the tarot we have the suit of cups and the ace of cups all representing this motif of the chalice as being um, connected to knowledge. But as time passed 
and these cults supplant each other, the lunar cult and its representatives become demonic. As the elucidation says, that, uh, and the kingdom became dead and desert, for they lost the voices of the wells and of the damsels that were therein. In Divination and the Goddess, we talk very much in that program, in this series about how women were the keepers of being, where men were more about the keepers of doing, and how women are, have lost that, which is partly why the world is in the state that it's in, and that in order to even be able to work in society and operate today, the females have to lose their femininity, just as men have lost it, and become more masculinized, and the consequences of that for both the sexes and for the world. Now, as I said, the word mystery comes from the word for woman. It derives from mesta and also from mass, M-A-S. So when you hear about the Christians holding their mass, it's an entirely female rite and ritual coming out of Egypt, the mass. It also gives the mess, M-E-S-S, is an Egyptian word, as in the Catholic mass. It originally was the circular wafer representing the ovum. So when you see the priest putting that little round white wafer into the uh, believer's mouth, that represents the wafer, which represents the female ovum, so that by you in taking it into your body, you will become feminized. He's already dressed in robes of a female, standing in Holy Mother Church, with a chalice in one hand, offering you bread with the other. It's all a feminine matriarchal symbol coming from the lunar cult. The word secret comes from the word secretion, implying again the female mysteries, the biology of the female. When we are given a blessing, what we're not told is that comes from blotzen, which means in Teutonic, in Germanic, bleeding. Female again, feminine. Now the tears are oblique references to the divine menstruum. Okay, so the falling of tears of the Jew, and if you look at tarot card number 18, you'll see that the moon goddess is weeping tears. Isis, of course, wept tears for Osiris. Well, the tears are oblique references to the divine menstruum called the Ku, K-H-U, by the Egyptians. It was the tears which Isis cried over her lost consort Osiris. In alchemical writings, this menstruum was known as the star fire or even the wise blood. It also is the Saint Grael of the Arthurian legends, carried by three maidens. In the Orthodox canon, it appears obliquely as the red wine of the Christian Eucharist. We hear in the Bible that Mary Magdalene is the harlot, but what we don't read is that that again is a mistranslation. The word harlot comes originally from Herodoli, but Herodoli means the sacred or beloved one. Ah, is that a change? Harlot comes from Herodoli, meaning she is the sacred one, the beloved one, my beloved one. Now Mary Magdalene, Magdala in Aramaic means tower. Mary Magdalene is known as the lady of the tower. But who's the original lady of the tower? The original lady of the tower was Nephthys, the sister of Isis. If you look on any Egyptian papyri, you'll see Isis, the two females, the two mothers. Like I said earlier, that all those two Marys motifs comes from Isis and Nephthys, the twins. But you'll notice that Isis has her famous headdress, the seat, and beside her stands Nephthys, and her headdress was the tower. So thousands of years before, we have the story of uh, Mary, Magdalene, Lady of Magdala, the Tower, it's an old re-scripting of Isis and also of Nephthys, the Lady of the Tower, Egyptian. The wedding feast at Cana is the wedding feast of the serpent, of the stellar cult. And at that point, we understand that it's now coming to light through the release of the Gnostic Gospels and other deep researches that the marriage feast of Cana was the marriage of Jesus Christ to Mary Magdalene. And that's just as simple as that. The two were wed. These two individuals, it was covered up later, but the idea that even if they're bio biographical or they're fictional, the idea was that at Cana, there was a coming together, a marriage. Now, Leonard Schlein, in his book, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess, says that the Egyptians, Babylonians, Greeks, and Romans had no word in their language for sin. The Israelites introduced, introduced both the word and the concept into the stream of Western civilization and by so doing diverted it. One of the most important uh, female goddess uh, traditions, concepts, was Sophia, called the goddess of wisdom. The word Sophia means wisdom. 
and Caitlin Matthews lets us know how important Sophia was to the Christians. She says, it was Rudolf Bultmann, was it not, the German biblical scholar who cited certain passages in the Gospels as interpolations of Sophia herself put into the mouth of Christ. The most powerful cult that rules the world from the Grecian times onwards and possibly even from the 18th dynasty of Egypt onwards is the solar cult. This is the dominant power through all the ages of the modern, even though, of course, the solar cult has appropriated many of the symbols, as we've seen, of the lunar and the Saturnian and the stellar cult. The solar cult and the paradigm of thinking that goes with that is the one that uh, is in prominence or is in ascendancy in the modern world. As Shwala de Lubitsch wrote, the priesthood and he's a, he means the priesthood of Saturn and, and the Sun is always will be abusive. One of the main fallacies of Occidental religions is that which espouses that man begins as a sinner and gets to the light by means of conversion involving any number of physical intermediaries. In my book, uh, Introduction to the Tarot's Major Arcana, I say that to the Gnostics and Sophics, this philosophy holds no currency. The Gnostics did not convert sinners, they awaken, they are ready. Eric Fromm, talking of the Old Testament, says, the document that most powerfully exemplifies an extremely male patriarchal attitude is the Old Testament. It is not surprising that the subject of productiveness, the creation itself, also finds an extreme male solution in its pages. The reason why the Old Testament exhibits such a one-sided male character is that as the primary text of the Jewish monotheism, it represents a male victory over female deities, over the matriarchal remnants in the social structures. The Old Testament is the triumphal hymn of the victorious male religion, a song of victory commemorating the destruction of all traces of matriarchy in religion and society. Leonard Schlein says that about 1500 BC there were hundreds of goddess-based sects enveloping the Mediterranean basin. By the 5th century AD they had almost been completely eradicated. By then women were also prohibited from conducting a single major western sacrament. The oldest temple of the Western world, the Pantheon, is actually de dedicated to the female goddess. Lewis Mumford, an historian and philosopher, a sociologist, says that out of the early Neolithic complex, a different kind of social organization arose, no longer democratic, that is based on neighborly intimacy, customary usage and consent, but authoritarian, centrally directed, under the control of a dominant minority, no longer confined to a limited territory, but deliberately going out of bounds to seize raw materials and enslave helpless men to exercise control and exact tribute. This new culture was dedicated not just to the enhancement of life, but to the expansion of collective power. By perfecting new instruments of coercion, the rulers of this society had, by the third millennium BC, organized industrial and military power on a scale that was never to be surpassed until our time. Eric Fromm goes on to say, the thought that the male can create living beings by himself, with his mouth, through his word, or out of his spirit, is the most unnatural fantasy conceivable. It denies all experience, all reality, every natural condition. It disregards all the laws of nature in order to attain the one goal of presenting the male as the perfect being per se, who possesses the ability life appears to have denied him, the ability to give birth. The first act of creation is the birth of light, Light is always and everywhere a symbol of the male principle. Those who have checked out my astrology, astrotheology pages on the website will understand what he means by this. And we go into a description of how light is connected to the male and how light is also used as the weapon. Intellectual light, psychological light, and also physical light is used in this uh, weaponry, this arsenal of weaponry against the feminine principle. And the feminine principle is not something in women only. It's a principle, uh, a mode of thought, of consciousness of the, ma of the male as well. We're not talking about male and female here only. We're talking about masculine and feminine, two polarities of even one individual. The Judeo-Christian paradigm comes in to subvert this, to control it, to mess it up. And the atrocity that they have created to create this inner scission, this inner schizophrenia. When we're in this kind of state, it leaves us open to any kind of power dynamics and manipulation. Don't we remember that in the Ten Commandments, 
in the Old Testament, the Jews are considered the chosen people. Well, they haven't built any pyramids or anything. They're not being honored by God because of their great genius. They're not being honored by God because of uh, their great power inherently. They're being honored by Jehovah, by God, by the big father, the big daddy in the sky, because of one thing and one thing only, their obedience. They've been given a Decalogue, they've been given a Ten Commandments, and because they're so obedient to that, they are considered the chosen people. Leonard Schlein, in Alphabet Versus the Goddess, says that monotheism does not mirror human society. First, humans are first and foremost social animals, a deity who was alone, not by choice, but because there were no other companions for him, was a concept without parallel in human society. The God of the Israelites did not have a wife, a son, a daughter, or a mother. So there you have it. All you need is uh, the masculine principle. Samson, Solomon, David, Abraham, Jesus. The whole list goes on. It's the whole concept of the Sun King. He's alone. He creates by himself. And all are his obedient children. The Israelites are obedient. So today, in our crazy, war-torn world of stress and frustration, if we are obedient to Big Daddy, to Big Father, we will be the chosen ones. It works in ancient times, it works now. And these political leaders, as we saw in other presentations, other programs in this series, they know how to manipulate this. They know how to understand that they want something for giving us protection. And what they want is our obedience. And the more obedient we are, the more humble we are, the more selfless we are, the more likely we'll fall in line, then we will be sure to receive smiles from them. What is the attitude of the slave? What is the master-slave dynamic? It's very simple. The slave knows that the master can completely destroy him. Here's what you call your master, your leaders. These are people who can decimate you, take your very life away. So just in the act of your destruction, we say, don't kill me, I'll be your slave. So the slave and master relationship is born. But you see, the master always sees in the eyes of the servant and the slave the deep hatred that's there. And so eventually the master comes to hate himself because he knows that the whole dynamic, the whole relationship is built on violence and sadism. So not immediately, but over time, even the masters, the leaders, these sadists of the world, by being worshipped, but by being adored in hatred, not out of love, come to despise and hate themselves. Well, what do you think is going to happen in society and culture when these leaders need to vicariously process that hatred? In Weapons of Mass Deception, Behind the New World Order, we talk about this and how the sadist, if he can make his ambiance filled with violence and terror and war and, and upheaval and filled with enemies, then his own sadism is, is less apparent. And also another adjunct to that is that they're going to need to process this. It's vital for this inner toxicity to become processed. So the slave is responsible for the, what the horrors that his master does. There's a connection here, a relationship. This is what we're left with when we understand how these cults have worked and what religion is really doing. Now, M. Hester Harding, one of the greatest psychologists the world has ever known, in her book Women's Mysteries says, the rise of masculine power and of patriarchal society probably started when man began to accumulate personal as over against communal a property and found that his personal strength and prowess could increase his personal possessions. Okay, so the muscular strength, the muscular power is mentioned here. This change in secular power coincided with the rise of the sun worship under a male priesthood. Sun worship was usually introduced and established by an edict of the military dictator, as happened in Babylon and Egypt and probably other countries as well. Eric Newman in his masterpiece, The Origin and Evolution of Consciousness says, the correlation of consciousness with masculinity culminates in the development of science as an attempt by the masculine spirit to emancipate itself from the power of the unconscious. We call this path ascent because we experience consciousness and the world of light as being above us and the unconscious and darkness as below still under the spell of the primitive symbolism which associates the upright posture of the human figure with the development of the head and the rest of the higher centers of consciousness. So Newman, like many scholars in this, have thoroughly researched this and understand how the endogenic part of this works, 
how the interior thinking process, the apparatus of mind, of cognition, also is affected by this. And how up is heaven and down is hell. And how shadow and femininity and nature and children and animals, they're all a waste of time, completely uh, without reason. They don't operate from reason, therefore they're lesser on the ontological scale of things. But God and man and heroes and bloodshed, that's all fine, that's all dandy, that's wonderful. Lawrence van der Post, a sociologist in his Jung and the Story of Our Times, says that the history of civilization appears to be a sorry, one-sided history of domination by man. Almost invariably, the basic cultural pattern has been the work of man. Whole areas of history are darkened by the ignorance of man of the truth that they can create only through the feminine in their own natures, just as they can procreate in the world uh, without the woman alone. Those familiar with my uh, writings, uh, especially on the tarot and the meanings of the different tarot cards, understand that I've gone into this also. That technology, science, is nothing but man's Frankensteinian warped uh, nightmare to try and mimic that all-important power that he doesn't have. Women give birth to, to children. Well, God gives birth to the human race, but somehow he's favored women with the power to give birth. Man doesn't have it. So, not immediately, but over time, compounded by the ages, man wants to rival the power, the procreative power of the female. His methodology of doing that is technology and science and cybernetics. Alvin Boyd Kuhn, in his book, The Ultimate Canon of Knowledge, he says, it needs no dissertation to elaborate and certify. What the record of history reveals as to this portent obsession with the dour religious consciousness over the centuries. It has left its lamentable record in the tale of corruption, banality, superstition, bigotry, and general moral and mental blight that overspread the area of Christian Europe over the middle period, which has come to be known as the Dark Ages. David Watson in his Pathology of Civilization says its name is Progress and the dream of progress continues to fuel global civilization's expansion everywhere, converting human beings into mechanized, self-obliterating puppets, and nature into dead statuary. William A. Kotke says in his final empire, the civilized people believe they have an obligation to bring primitive and underdeveloped people up to their level. Civilization which is about to self-destruct thinks of itself as the superior culture that has answers for all the world's peoples. The addict truly is a person who is emotionally dependent on things, television, substances, personality routines, other people, mental ideologies, total immersion in some cause or work. If the object of dependency is moved, addicts will experience insecurity, discomfort, distress, the symptoms of withdrawal. Well, as we've been pointing out in other programs, like weapons of mass deception, these symptoms are being withdrawn. There's a death happening, the death of the middle class, and there's going to be withdrawal symptoms taking place in the very near future. The Maya predicted it, and it's on its way. And unless we get back to what is real, culturally, biologically, psychologically, there's not going to be much left to work with. Eric Fromm and his anatomy of human destructiveness says these social and political changes were accomplished by a profound change in the role of women in society and of the mother figure in religion. No longer was the fertility of the soul the source of all life and creativity, but the intellect which produced new inventions, techniques, abstract thinking, and the state with its laws. No longer the womb, but the mind became the creative power, the simul and thus simultaneously not women, but men dominated society. He goes on to say, it was Johann Jacob Bakofen, professor of Roman law at Basel, who presented the first major challenge to the naive beliefs that patriarchal society was a natural state of affairs and that man's superiority to women was a self-evident matter. But Aristotle, he said, the male is by nature superior and the female inferior and the one rules and the other is ruled. This principle of necessity extends to all mankind. So here you have it, the greatest philosophers. Of course you're going to believe it. The greatest philosophers in the world are telling you it all, that the male is superior. We're in the 21st century now. Maybe we can, you know, finally refute this nonsense. 
Mark Nathan Cohen in his book, The Health and Rise of Civilization. Civilization, he said, has not been as successful in guaranteeing human well-being as we would like to believe, at least for most of our history. There is no evidence either from ethnographic accounts or archaeological excavations to suggest that rates of accidental trauma or interpersonal violence declined substantially with the adoption of more civilized forms and political organization. In fact, some evidence from archaeological sites and from historical sources suggests the opposite. Leonard Schlein points out that Nicholas Copernicus, the Polish um, scientist, he actually displaced Mother Earth from the center of the universe and replaced her with Father Son. So again, you can see as these things start to happen down through the centuries, eventually the male psyche starts to warp reality uh, and starts to compound the problem. John Zerzan, in his Elements of Refusal, says that when Descartes enunciated the principle that the fullest exploitation of matter to, use, to any use is the whole duty of man, our separation from nature was virtually complete and the stage set for the coming of the Industrial Revolution. 350 years later, this spirit still lingers in the person of Jean Vorst, curator of France's Museum of Natural History, who pronounces that our species, because of intellect, can no longer recross a certain threshold of civilization and once again become part of the natural habitat. He further states, expressing perfectly the original and persevering imperialism of agriculture, that as the earth in its primitive state is not adopted for our expansion, man must shackle it to fulfill human destiny. And Sir Francis Bacon in his Novo Organum, The New Organism, says that consistently he used uh, metaphors derived from the witch hunt and the torture chamber to describe how scientists should force nature to relinquish her secrets. Theodore Rozak, the American scholar, in his book Where the Wasteland Ends, says the astronautical image of man and that it is nothing but the quintessence of urban industrial society's pursuit of the wholly controlled, wholly artificial environment amounts to a spiritual revolution. This is man as he has never lived before. It draws the line through human history that almost assumes the dimensions of an evolutionary turning point. So it has been identified by Tillyard de Chardin, who has given us the concept of the newosphere, a level of existence that is to be permanently dominated by human intellect and planning, and which our species must now adapt if it is to fulfill its destiny. Alvin Boyd Kuhn says, a study of Christian history discloses the portentous fact that the concept of the malignancy of matter coming into the movement of Hinduism through Zoroastrianism became an influence overwhelmingly dominating the theology and the ethic. It bred the monstrous cult of asceticism whose driving motivation was the idea that the instincts of the flesh must be crushed down in the interests of the spirit. The tragic consequence of this staggering default of insight are incalculable, but in all conscience overwhelming to any intelligence that discerns it. It lay the Christian mind open to the obsession of a psychological influence that has been nothing less than devastating to sanity, inflicting upon the psyche a trauma that has produced morbidity and crushed to a degree the natural instincts for human happiness. But that's what this whole blitzkrieg on the human psyche was meant to do to suppress the feminine, to alienate you from the earth, to think that God is up in the cloud somewhere and he's also wrathful. He's also an all stern father figure who's judging your every move to get you to be so schizoid, pathological and uh, existentially dreamt that you wouldn't even be able to fashion your own destiny, your own thoughts. Eric Fromm, in his Anatomy of Human Destructiveness, says, The deep need of man not to feel lost and lonely in the world had, of course, been previously satisfied by the concept of a God who had created this world and was concerned with each and every creature. But for many of those for whom God was dethroned, the need for a godlike figure did not disappear. Some proclaimed a new God, evolution, and worshipped Darwin as his prophet. I added this because I want to make it stressed that just because you maybe have put aside one lie like you don't believe in God or say for instance you are not very religious be aware that it's not just as simple as that you may have other uh, deities that you worship in exactly the same way which also engender 
this patho pathogenic type of thinking pattern. Material thinking in general, the worship of money, of power, all does the same thing. Uh, Mark uh, Brownstein says, where religion brought hate and called it the search for divine love, science brings death and calls it the quest for eternal life. I write that the expulsion from Eden meant the loss of the symbiotic connection with nature and the universal order, the scission between the microcosm and the macro microcosm, between psychic energy and physical energy. So it's poetic, I know, but we can think of that expulsion, that falling out of paradise of Eden as literally being disconnected from the earth. Ergo, the return to the earth and the return to the philosophy and the ordinances to be more obedient to the laws and the inherent subtle ordinances and principles and laws of, of nature, of the earth, will signal the apple being put back on the tree of life and also the return of sanity to the mind of man. Genesis 3 we read, because thou, and they're talking about Eve, not the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou wilt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. In the Lament of Sophia, from the ancient Gnostic book, the Pistis Sophia, it says, they have taken my light from me and my power is dried up. I have forgotten my mystery which heretofore I was wont to accomplish. I am become as a demon apart, who dwelleth in matter, and light is not in him. And we all know the idea of Lilith being banished and called a demoness. Lilith is nothing more than the healthy masculine aspect of the feminine. See, we accept the feminine, we accept Eve, do we not? We accept Mary, but it's this soft, pliable, recumbent, <laughs> completely uh, submissive uh, principle. It's okay as a mother, uh, it's okay as a whore, as a sinner. But to have the strong female and the strong feminine within, no, that's prohibited, that's taboo. Alvin Boyd Kuhn, he says, the influence of the book has done nothing to mitigate the virulence of the Western religion's bias against nature. Its glorification of the person and function in the history of the Son of God has in effect diverted all interest in the religious field away from man's relationship to nature. And uh, Eric Fromm points out the consequences to this. Man differs from the animal by the fact that he is a killer. He, the only primate that kills and tortures members of his own species without any reason, either biological or economic, and who feels satisfaction in doing so. It is this biological, non-adaptive and non-filiogenetically programmed malignant aggression that constitutes the real problem and the danger to man's existence as a species. He says, the most ample and horrifying documentation of seemingly spontaneous forms of destructiveness are on record of civilized history. The history of war is a report of ruthless and indiscriminate killing and torture whose victims were men, women, and children. Many of these occurrences give the impression of orgies of destruction in which neither conventional nor genuinely moral factors had any inhibitory effect. There is hardly a destructive act human imagination could think of that has not been acted out again and again. George P. Marsh, in his book, The Earth as Modified by Human Action, says that, but man is everywhere a disturbing agent. Wherever he plants his foot, the harmonies of nature are turned into discords. And Alvin Boyd Kuhn again, he says, thinking which does not start from and continue in close relation to its foundations in the physical universe must lead to falsity. Eric Fromm says, in addition to sadism, the passion to destroy life and the attraction to all that is dead, that's necrophilia, seems to develop in the new urban civilization. Michael Elner says that just look at us, everything is backwards, everything is upside down. Doctors destroy health, lawyers destroy justice, universities destroy knowledge, Governments destroy freedom, the major media destroys information, and religion destroys spirituality. Caitlin Matthews, the Celtic scholar, writes, Our exile has not only been from the goddess, but also from nature. It is not surprising, considering that most Westerners live apart from their environment, protected by concrete roadways, consuming machine-processed foods and filled with media information, 
to the detriment of the experience of their own senses. The seasons go unnoticed. We seldom touch the earth or eat fresh food or observe the world personally. The sacred is a forgotten dimension in our society, which we ignore at our peril. And David Watson in his Pathology of Civilization says something which has always uh, affected me very profoundly. He says, we, produce, we reproduce catastrophe because we ourselves are traumatized, both as a species and individually, beginning at birth. Because we are wounded, we have put up psychic defenses against reality and have become so cut off from direct participation in the multidimensional wilderness in which we are embedded that all we can do is navigate our way cautiously through a humanly designed day-to-day -day substitute world of symbols. It's a world of dollars, minutes, numbers, images, and words that are constantly being manipulated to wring the most possible profit from every conceivable circumstance. The body and spirit both rebel. And that is what is happening. That is what is occurring in the next 10 years. There is going to be what Nietzsche referred to as the return of the repressed. One, whether it's from worshipping false leaders or from not doing one's own spiritual inner work, or as these scholars are saying, whether it's from being cut off from nature or suppressing our feminine side, from all of these and many more um, reasons, there's a build-up of toxicity in the unconscious. And at some point, it's all needing to be processed. It's all going to come out. In the program we did called 2012, we looked at uh, the fact that there's shadow work. Normally, a healthy individual will do what is called shadow work um, to process some of this dark content and may graduate spiritually as a result, become more adjusted to life. But there's times when simple shadow work is not enough and other archetypes then take the lead. And that those archetypes are again the, the great father, the all-father, the all-powerful masculine archetype that leads its uh, derelict children in the direction that it wants to go, which creates enemies uh, and wants to destroy those enemies. And like in a sort of a Dr. Strangelove scenario, wants to drop atom bombs and cause all manner of havoc in order to expatiate and exorcise all of our own darkness and, and, and disturb psychic content. We may wonder if the overwhelming success of linear perspectives as the sole definition of visual reality isn't a symptom of some deeper condition seeking expression. And we might ask, why did some humans create and then rationalize with elaborate devices ideologies and defenses, an unprecedented way of seeing the world based on distancing and detachment. Could it be that the linear perspective that infuses our vision from our glorification of intellectual distancing to our debunking of earlier realms of feeling and intuition to our relentless lifting upward with skyscrapers and space shuttles to the ultimate techno-utopian vision of downloading human knowledge into self-perpetuating computers to make embodied life obsolete that such a perception is the result of some traumatic violation that happened in our human past. So again, the idea of trauma in the ancient past. Now in this age, in this time, we're going to have to discover that if we realize that when we were close to nature, not close to the concrete and the steel, but when we were close to nature, when we lived amongst the shamans, when we had people who understood and took care of our psychological welfare as opposed to just our physical and intellectual welfare, that we went through rites and rituals that helped us to process all of this dark content. You see, our world today is void of any of these rituals. In fact, the only rituals that were provided are sinister ones, which only make the problem worse. Bradley uh, A.T. Pask in his book, Rape, in uh, the book Rape and Ritual says, depreciation and loathing of women, her body and by extension the feminine, has been expressed repeatedly by our intellectual and psychological forefathers. In the Gospel of Thomas, St. Peter is meant to say, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. And Tertullian, the church father, patriarch, says, woman, you are the gateway of the devil because of you, the Son of God, had to die. Well, that's very peculiar, isn't it? Because five minutes later, they're setting up in the Christian church the image of Virgin Mary, the sacred mother of Jesus. But then you turn to passages where Jesus is rebuking his mother, going, get thee behind me, I have no mother. I mean, which is it? We, you know, we've got so much contradiction here, we can't make up our minds. In Techniques of Persuasion, the um, scholar J.A.C. Brown writes that the 
Thus the tendency of religions to suppress the natural expressions of the sexual drive would seem to indicate a subconscious awareness of the fact that when normal outlets are allowed, sublimation into religious feeling is less likely to occur. One cannot help but notice the predominant role played by unmarried women in the Christian church or the visible loss of enthusiasm for religious interests on the part of happily married women. Many have noticed the common use in devotional works of sexual symbolism and the tendency to express religious feeling in erotic imagery even to the extent of describing what in another context would be taken as an account of sexual orgasm. Eric Newman says that for a while the specific achievement of the male world lies in the development of the masculine consciousness and the rational mind. The female psyche is in far greater degree dependent on the productivity of the unconscious. So what is this scholar telling us? He's saying that the feminine, what we call the feminine principle, is aligned with or commensurate with the unconscious part of us and that consciousness is the ego waking consciousness. But as scholars like, and scientists like Bruce Lipton have pointed out, we are motivated entirely by the unconscious. Consciousness makes up only the smallest quotient of our psyche. So if we suppress the unconscious, not working with it, we're already in a schizoid state from that point on. Carl Jung, in approaching the unconscious, says that modern man does not understand how much his rationalism, quote unquote, has put him at the mercy of the psychic underworld. He's freed himself from superstition, or so he believes, but in the process, he has lost his spiritual values to a positively dangerous degree. His moral and spiritual tradition has disintegrated, and he is now paying the price for his breakup in a worldwide disorientation and disassociation. But that's all right. The pharmaceutical industries run by the cult of Dionysus, they'll help. They've got answers. All you need is medication, pharmaceuticals, uh, designer drugs. They'll take care of it. Now, Chellis Glenn Denning, in his book, My Name is Chellis and I'm Recovering from Western Civilization, says that Terry Kellogg emphasized the fact that abusive behaviors, whether we direct them towards ourselves or other people or other species, are not natural to human beings. People enact such behaviors because something unnatural has happened to them and they've become deranged. That's right, we are basically schizoid, we're deranged, and we are going to either project our sadism on others, or masochistically we introject the violence and the horror and the frustration and tensions that we feel. Loosely they say that women tend to introject their self-hate, or their world hate, and men tend to project it. This of course is because men are allowed to box each other and play uh, competitive sports, down through the centuries, so they're, yes, they're more likely to do it in an external way, it's considered less taboo. Whereas women have been prevented from that, so their tendency is to overeat and uh, beat on their children and whatnot and get into all other manner of dysfunctions. But the same root exists, it's the same origin to all these dysfunctions, regardless of whether it's interjected or projected, the problem is the same. Now, J. A. C. Brown and his Techniques of Persuasion lets us understand something about the nature of religion. He says that at a Calvinist revival meeting around the year 1800, in the meeting which followed in 1801, 20,000 men, women and children assembled outdoors and listened to the doctrine of hellfire and eternal damnation for the unrepentant. Almost immediately, excitement broke out. Some ran about shrieking in agony or rolled on the ground for hours at a time. Others rushed into the surrounding forest crying, lost, lost, at the full pitch of their voices. Convulsive jerking movements began almost many, amongst many, and spread like a contagion throughout the congregation and elsewhere. Groups of men and women went through the process known as treeing the devil, where they crawled around on all fours, barking and snarling at each other for long periods of time. Another phenomenon was the so-called frog hopping, when both men and women occupied themselves by frenziedly leapfrogging over each other. As might be expected, many in the final phases of the meeting went into trance or had visual hallucination and ended up by taking part in uh, sexual excesses. He says in 18th century France, in a convent, one nun began to mew like a cat until presently the whole community was mew mewing day after day until stopped by the threats of the local militia. 
and the biting mania which spread through the convents of Germany, Holland, and Italy. In the latter case, powerful excitement manifested itself not only in biting, but in indecent exposure, tearing their hair out by the roots, and group howling and gnashing of teeth. He has a statement in his book from Martin Luther. Martin Luther writes, When my heart is cold and I cannot pray as I should, I scourge myself with the thought of the impiety and ingratitude of my enemies, the Pope and his accomplices and vermin, so that my heart swells with righteousness and hatred, and I can say with warmth and vehemence, Holy be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And the hotter I grow, the more ardent do my prayers become. St. Augustine wrote, Meanwhile my sins were being multiplied, and my concubine being torn from my side as a hindrance to my marriage. My heart which clave unto her was torn and wounded and bleeding. To thee be praise, glory to thee, fountain of mercies. I was becoming more miserable, and thou nearer. Because Augustine was uh, thinking of getting married, and his mother told him that can't be, and he, of course, had to abstain. And here we read that he's getting closer to God as he's getting sadder and more miserable at his uh, sexual repression. Now the New England preacher John Edwards said that the God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as we hold a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. Edwards was saying, as innocent as children seem to us, if they are out of Christ, they are not so in God's sight, but are young vipers, and are infinitely more hateful than vipers, and are in the most miserable condition. And sure enough, this kind of mania and repression coming out in a projected form as sexual degeneracy, criminality, and utter sadism is a well-known uh, motif when we look into the pages of history, whether it's the atrocities of kings or sadist maniacs like Vlad the Impaler and Countess Elizabeth Bathory, or Gilles de Ray or Stalin, or modern maniacs. As Niccolo Machiavelli said, since love and fear can hardly exist together, if we must choose between them, it is far safer to be fear than loved. Well, that's right, everything is on its head now, everything is twisted round now, everything is inside out now. Sure, but where does it all originate? This is what we've been trying to demonstrate in this program. Leonard Schlein in Sex, Time and Power says, When asked, most men will gallantly express their admiration for women in general and profess a profuse love for their mates in particular. Despite these touching personal testimonials, society is rife with misogyny and patriarchy. A cursory glance at the current newspapers or television news reveals a global society in which the majority of men disdain women. While some cultures are more egalitarian than others, men's actions suggest that they, firmly, they believe firmly in their superiority over women. Eric Newman, in his book On the Moon and Matriarchal Consciousness, says any development at any stage that strives towards patriarchal consciousness, towards the sun, looks on the moon spirit as the spirit of regression, as the terrible mother, as a witch. Leonard Schlein in his book, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess, the Babylonians elevated to the supreme position a god who had conquered and then mutilated a goddess. Patriarchy, he says, is the dominant theme in Hammurabi's code. Sons are commanded to obey their fathers, not their mothers. And sure enough, we have the Canaanite god Moloch, to whom the little children are sacrificed. Now in Christianity, we've been seeing that we have a lot of pagan motifs. But one of the most beloved symbols that is in Christianity is of course that of the Christmas tree. But the Christmas tree comes out of the pagan past also. In those days it was known as Yggdrasil, or the world tree. It had its roots in the earth and its branches in the heavens. It was the tree between heaven and earth, or the polar axis. And of course, in religion, we always hear that the mystic or the prophet is near a tree. Lord Buddha, of course, in the famous Bodhi tree. 
we have Jesus and the baptism and the medieval artists are showing the proximity of the tree of life the fig tree and the olives Lord Krishna always used to play his flute uh, with the cowgirls under the tree and Christianity the cross originally had a serpent around it it was the great tree Moses sets up his brazen serpent the tree of life and the serpent a primordial Christian symbol and of course the, cru the crucifix upon which Jesus is crossed was known as the tree of Golgotha and in the tarot cards and all through mythology we see the image of the tree the sacred tree the tree of life is shown in the tarot cards behind the female principle in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings we also see in that book great deal of mention of the elven tree and the tree of Gondor the tree that has lost all its leaves and is dark and ruined while evil is abroad but then that comes to life again as light and truth comes back into the world in the Bible we have the tree of good and evil or the tree of the uh, tree of life which contains the fruit of forbidden knowledge we find that Egypt was called the land of the tree and the serpent by visitors to Egypt in Egypt they had also the tree of the north and the tree of the south or the two trees and they were also known as the Jed pillars because there was a priest archy called the Jedi in Egypt and the Jed pillar was the missing phallus of Osiris but it really represented the Kundalini and the raising of the Kundalini energy that comes down to us in more modern times as the caduceus of Hermes the two opposing serpent forces that you see on the medical monopolies today but the symbol goes back to Nuth who was literally the tree of life so yes we have the tree of life motif but it goes back to the old palmyriums of Egypt and it goes further back so that the body of the female goddess is the tree of life and that's where we get the word nuts when you go and pick nuts berries nuts from the tree that comes from Nuth or Nut the Egyptian goddess who was the tree of life the ovums of her womb are the, are the seeds that give birth to life in Egypt specifically but not only in Egypt do you see the presence of the female goddess in proximity to the tree of life being the tree of life and being the keeper of the ovum and being the keeper of the mystery of being here we see the whole story in an old papyrus where we have the old story of Adam and Eve there's Adam the Pharaoh sitting on the chair in a recumbent and submissive position being instructed in the mysteries by Virgo the virgin with the wheat sheaves on her head and the ovum in her hand and that ovum by the way is the apple in ancient times it was known that the apple from the forbidden tree of life the apple was always known as the ovum of the female and the little wriggling serpent that comes to tempt or to eat the apple or to bite, in, bite into the apple was nothing more than the sperm at a zoon. the male sperm which looks like a little wriggling snake or serpent was in proximity to the ovum so this is conception but magically speaking conception had other meanings it had the meaning of the uniting of the masculine and feminine within the self androgyny not on a genital level but on a spiritual level and the mystery of this process the mystery of these rites and rituals was always in the keeping of the female of the Eves so in the Egyptian papyrus we have the Adam and Eve story of Eve being the priest initiator priestess initiator offering the ovum to the female to the male in the original Eucharist here again we see the uh, interaction that the Pharaoh Adam the male is a little apprehensive there's the tree of life on the right the fourfold tree of life the tree of consciousness the tree of the spine and the tree of the cerebral spinal cortex and the initiation now the lion chair that you see him sitting on is really the Pantera chair the ancient priests used to wear the robes of the jaguar or the panther in fact the Semitic name for Jesus in the Talmud is Yeshua ben Pantera because the panther skin uh, was a symbol of the high priests that was their logo or their emblem now the tree of life represented man's intimate imbilical rapport 
with nature and the universal order. Its forbidden fruit refers to the sustenance by being non-differentiated from nature. What man considers his independent self, his independence, is merely hyper-alienation from himself and from the world. His ability to tolerate such an existential predicament has been increased by the conditioning of false theocracies which have created intricate surrogate pacifiers for the lost reality which he inwardly misses and craves. Man's attachment to these simulacras become the reason for further alienation. The spell is broken only for those whose inner voice is heard over the clamor of lies that besiege the brain and senses from all quarters. So your average serial killer maniac murderer type is the male who's secretly crying out for bonding with the feminine. But he's also got a love-hate relationship, a masculine, a sadomasochistic relationship with the feminine. He both desires it, but he also despises it. So the artists will paint the female picture. The female, the female image is the most prevalent motif in art. So it can be adored, but it can also be slaughtered and murdered because the dichotomy has been set up. We have an ambivalent connection, not only to external females, where those who want to project this crime and violence that comes out on external females, but the violence is already happening morally. The violence is already happening in an interjected way within the self to one's own feminine principle. And psychologists understand this. We can observe this in the ones around us. And we can also examine and notice all the reinforcements, all the ways in which culture and our parents and our peers and our priests and our politicians are emphasizing this and, and engendering this dichotomy within. And if we buy into it, we will be the sucker. We will be the ones who are totally have our own republic uh, torn to shreds. The Son of God, as the sun above us in the heavens, Jordan Maxwell, in Ancient Belief System, says, if one also replaces the word sun, S-O-N, with the word sun, S-U-N, wherever the former is found in the Bible, it will be discovered that every single verse fits the literal sun and not a man. In fact, the verses make better sense. That's right. Every time you see the word son of God or the word Jesus, just in your mind, put there the word S-U-N and think of the Son, and suddenly the Bible will come alive. And every passage not only fits, but makes better sense than if it was a biography. And that is how the mythographers who've painted the image of Jesus are showing you the rays of the Sun, the red cross of the equinox, standing on the clouds, haloed, with the sun and the cross of the zodiac, the light of the world. Behold, he cometh with clouds, says Revelation 1. Yes, the sun does come with clouds. The Christians to this day in the churches raise their arms and the old symbol of the Ka. Open any book on Egyptian mythology and look and you'll see the gods raising their arms. And that is known as the Ka, the K-A, when you raise your arms like that to symbolize the soul. But just on the most primitive level, just observe the artwork. Just look at the imagery that is being shown to you. The Christ haloed with light. Our Father who art in heaven. We end our prayers with Amen which literally meant the Son God. The words of Jesus in Revelation 22, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Jordan Maxwell has pointed out many times that many of the patriarchs also uh, correspond to the Son. Solomon, the name of Solomon is actually made up of three phonemes, three syllables that mean the name of the Son in the three ancient languages of the world. Sol is the Anglo-Saxon for Son. Om is the Hindu. And On is the Egyptian. Now the Egyptians had a city of light in the north called Heliopolis, that the Greeks call Heliopolis, the city of the sun. But before the Greeks got there and changed the name, that city was called in Egypt On, O-N, the city of light. So when we turn a light on, when we say get on with it, get, get a move on, we're saying get light on it. On literally means the, the light. So Solomon is nothing but the sun. There's no biographical character. You're not going to find him. You're not going to dig him up. He doesn't exist. Saul Amon, like Jesus Christ, is the son. 
and everything that you're reading about that Solomon is getting involved in is not a biography of a man, but a mythology of a son. Same thing for Hercules and many of the other gods of the ancient world. Now the name that is given to Jesus Christ at his birth is Emmanuel, but that is the same thing. That comes from Omoniel, Om, On, and El. They don't even hide it. The Renaissance uh, artists drew on this canon. Above the cross of Jesus, you have the sun and the moon, pagan motifs. The INRI that is above his head just represents in Latin, or in Hebrew, by the way, the letters of the elements. I am, Rorik, Ibisha, and uh, one other. These are the four names of the elements, fire, water, air, and earth. The beginning letters are I and R I. Now Jesus is identified with the sun when you see him with a crown of thorns. The ancients understood that the sun had a crown of thorns, and that when you turn the crowns in, the thorns in, you make a crown. Kings would have their crowns. Jesus would have his crown of thorns. The symbolism is enough to put us onto the right track if we become sane and understand what we're seeing here. And again, the origin of a lot of it is Egypt, not just the 18th dynasty of Akhenaton, but many ages before that. Here we have Ra, Horus, the sun god, with a solar disk above his head. Now Mustafa Gadala has shown, the great Egyptian scholar has shown, that Jesus Christ, I mean, we've been saying all along in this show that he is not a historical or biographical character, but an interesting adjunct to this is that Mustafa Gadala, the Egyptian historian, has shown that there is an approximation of Jesus the Christ. He most clearly resembles the Pharaonic uh, dynasty from the 18th dynasty of Egypt. That is Akhenaton and his son, um, the Tutankhamun. If you read this man's magnificent work, you're going to see that even though 3,000 years elapsed, when the Hebrews in Rome were thinking about who to pattern their hero on, they thought of Simon Magus, yes. They thought of uh, Judas Crestus, yes. But they also thought of Akhenaton, the old pharaoh, and his dynasty and the cult of the sun. The, the first monotheistic cult of Egypt is what they patterned their modern Jesus Christ on. Fascinating work. Now in the Vasa, the Vaja, Sanyahi, Samhita, we read that the Brahman, that's their god, Brahman, is the light of the sun. And in Hebrew, they took the Brahman and made it Abraham. Abraham, you just change the letter around, becomes the Brahman. And Brahman's consort was Saraswati. Well, wasn't Abraham's consort Sarah? But remember, they don't exist. Brahman is the sun. In the uh, Atharva Veda, we read a passage that says, The sun set in motion by the gods shines unsurpassed yonder. From it came the Brahma power, the supreme Brahman, all of the gods and what makes them immortal. So the ancient Vedic texts also had personified deities like Krishna and Arjuna and um, Vishnu and Brahma, but they were under no doubt about it that it, they were just personifications of the sun. Just analogies, just simulacras. In the Shatapatha, Brahmana, we read that first was Brahman born in the east. From the horizon, the gracious one appears in splendor. He illumines the forms of this world, the deepest, the highest. He is the cradle of what is and what is not, father of the luminaries, begetter of the treasure, he entered many formed into the spaces of the air. They glorify him with hymns of praise, making the youth that is Brahman increased by Brahman. Brahman brought forth the gods. Brahman created the world. Nothing more than solar cult. In fact, in the Temple of Solomon, the old uh, Jewish uh, rabbis would wait until uh, the spring equinox, they pass over, and then would go to the eastern door to blow their ram's horn. The ram's horn, of course, relates to Aries. They go to the eastern door because they were worshipping the rising of the sun at the east. To this day, the Islamic people will bow towards the east, reverencing Mecca, but really reverencing the eastern horizon, the sunrise. The Manichaeans, a third century Christian sect, we have a statement from them. 
the Christ or the Christ is the glorious intelligence which the Persians called Mithras his residence is the sun Now the word Christ means the anointed anointing was the ancient custom throughout the East by pouring aromatic oils on persons as a token of honor it was also employed in consecrating the priest prophets and kinds and the places and instruments appointed for worship that's the New American Cyclopedia talking about the Christ in ancient Palestine tradition it would seem kings political and military chiefs village heads and in fact any claimants to high office were anointed and thence called the anointed ones some after anointing then became called the Lord very uh, applicable to anyone who held office in the ancient world the Pharaohs were always anointed today you can go to the East and see the lingam of Shiva being anointed with holy oil by the women and also anointed with milk Tony Bushby says Origen, Epiphanius, and Julius, the emperor, all clearly re reveal that the John the Baptist, Judas, and Jesus, his cousin, was the Christ figure, but made no reference to Jesus himself attaining that status. Bishop Theodoret, writing in the 5th century, provided further confirmation that Jesus was not one of the Christ personalities, although many others of his time were. The son of Poseidon, the Medus, was called the Christ, and the priests of Apollo were known as the Christus. In fact, the word Christo and its derivations um, all appeared in every ancient religious system and showed the original Christo concept was believed to be the personal and invisible mediator and guide between God and everything spiritual in man. The Christ concept has been called, has been an ancient religious tradition continually suppressed by the Catholic Church through the centuries. Jordan Maxwell pointed out once that the company Crisca, uh, Crisco, Crisco Oil, why are they calling their product that? Because they know what we don't know is that the old word Christ meant the anointing with oil. It's just as simple as that. Now, according to Bishop Epiphanius, the Christ is the spiritual self within each person. Ah, there finally the truth. Bishop Epiphanius has it down. We understand that the whole thing is an external carnival facsimile simulacra of man's inner religion his own inner God the temple within as Jesus Christ was saying man is his own God man is his own uh, initiator and salvation but you want to take that away from man and make it external now the personality of Jesus Christ as known to modern Christians is based on several messianic rebel figures of the Holy Land but particularly on Simon Magus Judas the Galilean Yeshua ben Panthera, none of whom had anything to do with literally being from God. The Semitic sect, known as the Essenes, anointed their leaders, who were known henceforth as the Star. The older nephew of Jesus, John the Baptist, and his twin brother Judas were anointed rulers of the Essenes. Their particular order was at Bethlehem, where he and they were reported to have been born. And the astrological references in this is, are very clear. But let us turn now to something more sane. What is the message and the myth and the man? We have this incredible story. What can really be gleaned from it? We've understood all its distortions. We've understood something about its origins. But can anything be gleaned from this? Or must the whole thing be cast aside? Are we meant to be atheists and skeptics and just learn how to debunk and rebut? Or perhaps can any fool do that? Perhaps it's easy to take away, but the art is in that we have to replace something of equal beauty or greater beauty and more pristine for that which we take away. That is an act of construction. Deconstruction is very important. In fact, it's an essential part of spiritual growth to be able to deconstruct and let go and have a catabolic action to our development. But then once we've done that, the time comes to salvage and to develop and to plant new seeds and to gain new wisdom. We've understood that the Bible is the story of the Son, S-U-N, and the Son of God who personified it. For good or for bad, or both, the archetype and stereotype have long since become intimately fused. The greatest story ever told has empowered but also disempowered the populace, has enraptured but also perplexed the human mind. The story's ending is not especially happy, but it is not conspicuously sad either. It banishes futility just as easily as it can evoke it. 
We may question the historicity of Jesus, but we cannot question the relevance of the sun and its mythic and symbolic significance. It is not that Christ is the light, but that the light is the Christ. Horus and Set, Christ and Satan, are but the phenomena we call light and dark, expressing themselves physically and psychologically. It is the light that will be with us until the end of the world, and not a man. As we have seen, the Bible is a story about light, and not a man. It therefore constitutes a scientific as well as a religious epic. Now, Christians, for a variety of reasons we do not need to explore here, are likely to remain adamant in their belief in the physical Christ. And, as in the case of Robin Hood or Sherlock Holmes or Santa Claus, there is no reason why they should change their conviction and identification. The loss would be too great for any gain. And too many great truths have been based on this greatest of lies for it to be so roughly uprooted. Whether they realize it or not, the Christian is, even in his ignorance, closer to the ultimate truth than both the scientist, the cynic, or atheist. Because man is light, and light is man. The universe and the human are expressions of the same mystery. Man and world, or man and universe, are one thing being viewed from two perspectives by the ego. The conviction of the Christian believer needs only to be widened to embrace truths which are equally as valid and enlightening to the heart and mind. The story of the man Christ ends at Calvary. A great man betrayed by a friend, arrested and dragged through the streets. He's mocked, he's cursed by society and condemned by the state. He is totally alone. The man who is so maligned receives our empathy. He doesn't have to be a god, he's a man and he receives our empathy because he is us. His story exemplifies the life we all live. It is divine because it is so human. For me, personally, the entire story centers not around all the miracles and thunders and lightnings and all the other uh, paraphernalia. It's at Gethsemane of the healer of the world, the son of God, the embodiment of truth, mercy, harmony and light and love, watching his beloved, his friend, come up the garden path with an army of betrayers and deceivers and betray him with a gentle kiss. For me, that is the center of the myth. That is the message. And it's something that can visit all the teachers of light. In that is the poignancy. In that is the true story. In that is the poignancy. And it seems that so many in their movies and in their analysis seem to bypass that and favor so much of the other metaphysical, supernatural uh, aspects. Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and your children, says Christ in Luke 23. Of course, because you are I. What I go through, you will go through. How can we forget that in the last days of the man's so-called existence, at the Last Supper, he's telling Peter, the man whom he would later give the keys to create what we know as the Catholic Church, the foundation, Petra, the rock upon which my church will stand. But Peter's busy denying him three times later on that same night. Judas, his own cousin, some of the scriptures are saying, for 30 pieces of silver, is betraying the Son of God, betraying his brother, betraying his enlightener. The scene at Calvary, the tragedy of a great man being hung between two thieves in front of his betrayers is so inherently emotive and so patently human in tone that we often forget to understand how our emotional empathy occludes its greater existential meaning. The man whose life brings him to such a seemingly pathetic fate is not in pain at the end. He is neither regretful or alone. He is not suffering the needs no one and needs no one's help. He has arrived at this place because it is the inevitable end of the life he has hitherto been leading. So the mystery of this Christ is that if you want to live as an authentic man, if you want to live a moral way, if you want to be a mediator for the divine to the earth, you better realize you're going to have to deal with aloneness, loneliness, betrayal, and the rest of it. But the difference is the authentic man knows that ahead of time. The authentic man understands that, that the cup he will have to um, have put in front of him. But he's okay with it. He's not in lament. Our emotions should be, quite rightly, horrified by all of this. But he is walking the road that he is meant to walk. 
Now the ending is formidably tragic only for us, the witnesses, the spectators who, for a second, get to see an event which encapsulated the life and existential ardor of an authentic man. And I mean that in the full Germanic philosophical sense. It is we, not he, who balk at the futility and recoil at its insanity. He is present and is as accepting of his fate as were the Cathars of Montsegur, who walked on their own feet into the flames of the bonfires lit by their enemies, as those who rode with crazy horse on the plains of America. In that one minute of life before their death, such men were already living a deeper and greater life than most achieved during the long years allotted to them. When we read Christ saying in Luke 23, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, could we perhaps take the liberty and say that he really meant, Father, forgive them for they know not how they live. When you're not living in an authentic way, you inherit the perdition of the worlds. And in my other work, I talk about the fact that, again, not only does Christ represent the Son, but he also represents the concept of the self-initiator and the fact that we have an inner zodiac, as Carl Jung said. As we all know, science began with the stars and mankind discovered in them the dominance of the unconscious, the gods as well as the curious psychological qualities of the zodiac, a complete projected theory of human character. That's right, an inner zodiac. In divination in the goddess tradition, we go into that thoroughly, that the idea of the Christ with 12 disciples is a whole other dimension to this story, the fact that we are an inner zodiac. We carry that template around with us. We are the walking temple of God. And as we return full circle to the 21st and 22nd century, to the time of solutions, we understand that through the divination arts, through astrology, through the tarot, these are our means of initiating ourselves back into our sovereignhood, back into our own Godhead. As the Egyptians knew, though, the day is coming, says the Shepulis, when the world will know nothing of the faith of the Egyptians. Our land will stand desolate, Tombs and the dead will be its only witnesses. O Egypt, nothing but fables will tell of thy faith and no posterity will believe them. How right he was. We would be in the time when all of these connections would be forgotten. The Egyptians talked of the inner zodiac, that man was his own light unto himself. Richard Tharnas, PhD, says that psychology textbooks of future generations will look back on the modern psychologists working without the aid of astrology as being like the medieval astronomers working without the aid of the telescope. And through the divination sciences, hopefully there will be a sea change and we will understand the importance of working with these divination arts because they were, were they not, the bequeathment from the stellar cult and the lunar cult of old. They're one of the most important oracles that we can use. Once they're used correctly, once they're used appropriately and with love and reverence, once we understand their in, innate uh, laws and work with them properly and sanely, not just to bolster our egos and solve our little domestic disputes, but to understand them also as rites of passage, as barometers and as compass points to help us navigate the seas of time and the sea of karma and the sea of fate. Then we can reinitiate ourselves into what? into what the Egyptians had long ago been teaching us, that man is his own priest and woman her own priestess. When tutored are right, when we understand what our fate and our destiny is, then we understand we need no intermediary. We don't need to look to any edifice and we'll understand what horrors the world has uh, suffered because we have actually done that. We've disassociated ourselves from our own power and we've reaped the wind as a result. When man realizes that he was, as the humanists and the Renaissance masters understood, Adam Kaamon, Adam Kadmon, the Anthropos, the center of the universe, when he is in harmony, when he works on himself and balances his own republic, when his own city state of intellect and emotions and biology, his inner house, his inner temple is in harmony, then perhaps at that point, we can have, like the Druids of old and the Arthurian Knights of old, we can have the perfect political state, the perfect unison 
socially. But mystics, Gnostics, I would be amiss if I sat here and said that social cohesion and political harmony could ever come into being in this world at any time if the inner state of man was in chaos. This is simply not the case. In Acts 7 we read, the Most High dwells not in temples made with hands. In 1 Corinthians, you are the temple of God, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. In John 14, the works I do, you can do, and greater. Well, why are we not being told this by the clergy who are meant to represent this Christ, this force? If he is telling his disciples, what I can do, you can do also, and more. How come we then are kept on our knees in front of church and in front of state? How come we're not being instructed in our own power, our own independence, our own individuality? In this program, we hope to have shown you some of the reasons why and also what to do about it. As Plato said, perhaps there is a pattern set up in the heavens for one who desires to see it and having seen it, to find one in himself. We have seen this new millennia open as so many before with war and bloodshed, mass fear, confusion and needless mortality. As long as we tolerate psychotics and megalomaniacs to govern a herd of sheep-like automatons and ride roughshod over our sovereign rights, we can hardly expect anything else. As our materialistic and hyper-driven technocratic age rises to its critical mass, and as the nightmares of Orwell, Kafka and the Marquis de Sade combined to become realities in the policies of despotic presidents and leaders, we may find it beneficial to pay attention to what the competent prophets and seers of today are saying. For though they may have their heads in the clouds, their heads are safer and saner than those in the mud. As Oscar Wilde said, we are all in the gutter, but some are staring up at the stars. Some that stare for long enough do not see the gutter any longer, only the miracles and beauty that permeate all creation. The fragrance of a rose is special, and so is the fragrance of truth. But the greatest fragrance exudes from the greatest of roses, that of freedom. This bouquet, like that of humanity, has been lost to us for quite some time now. The garden in which the roses of freedom once grew has long been overgrown with the rank weeds of oppression injustice, impoverishment, and psychic incarceration. As the end date of 2012 approaches, our chances may look bleak for most, for those who only see the gutter that they inhabit. But the future is what one makes it. The future is in our hands, as too will be the deathless rose of freedom, once we understand that it is not going to be planted, grown, or given by anyone or anything other than ourselves. 
the rose of freedom grows in the soil of intelligence and is brought forth with patience, attention, and love. Its fragrance is all the more precious because we know that it is the gift that we have given to ourselves. As Oscar Wilde implied, we can, from the gutters we inhabit, keep in alignment with the stars, those exalted embodiments of freedom and wisdom, those magical white cities and the perfumed wilderness of the night, those jewels in the shimmering sable vestment of the sky queen Nuth, those who have from this earth observatory really paid attention to the miracles above their heads and to those all about them, know that the men and women who crave and abuse wealth, beauty, sexuality, intelligence or power are not truly powerful and know nothing of the true magic of life. Such observers eventually realize that true magic is not even the action or operation of a hyperactive mind over inert matter, but quite the reverse. For the fact is that though every glass of water we drink is changed by our drinking, we are also, in that same instant, changed forever by that simple act. As I mentioned in the introduction of this program, it is presumptuous and wholly erroneous for us to imagine that the humanism that was the reality in the previous golden ages is in effect in our times. Though it certainly exists as a vivid reality within certain exceptional individuals, it is the most definitely not in evidence in the collective ambiance. However, the philosopher's cardinal purpose is to make the world ready for that rebirthing of the great and sublime humanism. Though it may not be now, the time will come for it to return, to come again from the dark place to which it was banished, back into the light of men's hearts and minds, back into the streets of the world. Despite all the resistance, manipulation, and malign artifice, and despite the cold vigilance of the all-seeing eye of the adversary, its countenance will, one day, shine amongst us again. The rebirth of humanity will be more resplendent than the rising of the sun itself on the equinox of the world. And when we finally gaze again upon its bright visage and bathe in its warmth, it will be time to remember those masters who labored like Hephaestus in the deep lightless places, seeking to free us from the dark satanic mills which now flourish. It will be time to wonder at the labors of such beings, those endowed with a humanism which would shame Prometheus himself. Though in their time, their endowments may sometimes seem more like a curse than a blessing to them, they will ultimately prove their own reward. Their work of sparking in us remembrance and curiosity will one day become the conflagration of joy in the eyes of each as they stand and witness the triumphant return of a mighty, majestic, and everlasting humanity. Though the life of today's every man is defined by forgetfulness of being and obliviousness of the miracle of existence, the time will inevitably become again for the alternative kind of life, one in which man and nature are again blissfully wedded. The ancient Egyptians symbolized this by the figurative love embrace between their sky goddess Nuth and her consort, the earth god Jeb, and the Hindu sages with the image of Shiva and Shakti in ecstatic unification. The alchemists of later ages also pursued the state of final biunity that they named the Hieros Gamos, or chemical wedding. This strange, inexplicable state of nucleated consciousness is the ultimate goal of all religion, magic, yoga, and science. The great Gnostics, alchemists, and magicians knew, however, that such a state would remain elusive to any seeker until he or she had first experienced what might be described as a chemical divorce, that is, a separation from all that is fallacious and unsustainable, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. This divorce is commensurate with the death of ignorance, and if an entity should be fortunate enough to survive its vagaries, they may be deemed ready to move on to their final transcendence. Humanity is presently experiencing such a period of chemical divorce and going through what the Maya shamans described as the time of reckoning or of revealing, and which the Bible refers to as an apocalypse. 
If humanity survives the subsequent vagaries of this phase, it may go on forth to its own chemical wedding. The death of personal and collective ignorance may indeed lead to the creation of a new Eden, a new Jerusalem. Should such a day come, or should we each personally experience our own true chemical wedding, our guests will be none other than the sun, the moon, and the evening star. There, at our own marriage feast of Cana, will be the twelve disciples and the seventy-two apostles, the lion and the unicorn, the centaur with his bow, the lady with the scales, the hermit with his lantern, and the blessed virgin herself. Yes, there they will all be, in radiant procession, bestowing upon us their ancient music and ethereal blessings.